like 15% or that sort of thing. The, the Greens are right behind them on that. The um, opposition Christian Democrats have um, are, are on 30%, so more than double the Social Democrat total. The opposition so, uh, Christian Democrats, if an election were held um, tomorrow, might get as many you know, as votes as the three current currently ruling parties put together. That's quite um, that, that that's quite. Uh, something. Um, and we may be seeing um, an SPD that thinks, um, well, this worked for us before, uh, maybe it will again, uh, maybe the easy solution of freezing the conflict will um, uh, bring us back to the possibility of uh, sort of our economic and trade model as it was before and, you know, we can lower cost of living and we can be this party of peace and all of that. All, all of this, of course, is ridiculous. Um, to anyone who looks at the way that Putin behaves at all. I mean, right on the very same day as uh, Mr. Mützenich made that speech uh, in the German Bundestag saying, um, accusing allies of using the war for their own interests, whatever that means, and I find that rather rich coming from the same party that championed Nord Stream 2 for all of these years in the middle of an active war um, in Ukraine and in, in the East since 2014, of course. Um, uh, but, I mean, it, it, was, it was really just a, a, an absolute gobsmacking uh, thing uh, to hear him uh, say. I'm still sort of processing it um, uh, myself. But on the very same day that he gave that speech, we saw Dmitry Medvedev um, release uh, his demands for what negotiation should look like. And the, the Russian demands are basically, uh, you know, complete annexation of all of Ukraine, uh, saying that Ukraine must be denazified, uh, saying that the UN should basically bless um, a, essentially a total complete Russian takeover of Ukraine, that the current Ukrainian government, democratically elected government, should be liquidated. How do you negotiate with a Russian regime that has that, that says this? And then you have like the discussion, will the delivery of like 20 or 50 or 100 Taurus missiles be a red line for Russia and then we'll start something terrible? They already announced they want to start it as, as long as we allow that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we have seen in Germany last uh, month this debate, um, will Russia be ready to attack? Germany and NATO and it seemed to be like some sort of a change like a like slight change uh, two years ago three years ago nobody would seriously have a German political discussion or a talk show or an article in a serious magazine or a newspaper discussing the very topic yes Russia attacking NATO now it seems to be uh, a topic which is um, absolutely normal and standard so do we see some sort of decoupling of those who know the situation on the ground and those who really are empowered to take decisions? Um, yeah, I think we do. I mean, uh, Germany has, uh, is a country that for uh, years um, has been surrounded by all of its friends. I mean, think about it. It's, it's um, eight of Germany's neighbors are in the European Union. The ninth is, and, and NATO, the ninth is Switzerland, of course. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, we have um, had an entire generation uh, where we are just used to safety and security, and we have an elite uh, that is used to safety and security, and I think probably is suffering from a certain amount of complacency that uh, the situation can, um, you know, is always going uh, to stay that way. The reality is, is that on the ground, and certainly to anyone who watches Putin, um, weakness in and of itself is escalatory. We have certain theories that have sounded good for years um, in German public debate about trying to avoid escalation. Um, Putin doesn't respect that. I mean, it sounds all nice in, 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 in an academic sense in Germany, but it's, it does not um, correspond to the reality of the ground. I mean, right now, um, you know, Schultz uh, simply says, I will not deliver Taurus, so that's a red line for me. Putin says, oh great, I've got this wonderful shipment of Iranian cruise missiles that's coming into me. I mean, like, he doesn't care. 
You know, he doesn't care about our red lines. Well, he cares, but uh, yeah. quite in the opposite way. He's, yeah, he's happy that we demonstrate our oh, yeah. weakness. Yeah, we've told him that we've told him that he can just do what he wants, and he's going to bring in his, his own cruise missiles. Partly because we will not deliver uh, our own. I mean, weakness is escalatory. So I find that ra rather interesting that um, Olaf Scholz is, says he's trying to prevent escalation by not delivering Taurus, but being weak on the topic uh, is inviting the exact same escalation that he is hoping to prevent. So, um, and, and, and let's be clear, if Ukraine um, falls, we suddenly have a much more tense uh, situation um, in, in Europe, where um, I think that we could see Putin basically say, um, let's try for Lithuania, let's try for Estonia. Why not? I mean, they let us do Ukraine, so why not? This is the way he thinks. And although we might not see, for example, in a scenario like that, ground troops that would um, come directly into Germany, I do think that we can't rule out the possibility of, in a situation like that, that Putin might lob a couple of cruise missiles at us, at Cologne or at Berlin or Munich, basically as a way to scare us. Absolutely, um, right? and uh, we know that uh, Article 5 or uh, NATO uh, doesn't uh, like store it automatically. Uh, it's yeah. not the case that the missile hits the territory of a country, then all countries automatically send their armies to protect. No, your government needs to ask for that, and then other yes. countries need to decide how much they can help, what is yeah. possible. So uh, it can be possible if, if uh, Schultz is uh, or his uh, ministers are afraid of escalation, they'll say, okay, like one, one missile is bad enough. We don't want to have another 10. We don't want uh, Cologne to turn to Mariupol. We don't uh, want to have it. We, we, need, we need to discuss. We need to, to give Putin something. It's better to give Ukraine because Ukraine is not yours. It's always good to trade what is not yours. Precisely. But uh, what I also wanted to, to, to ask you here, we have seen that this uh, rhetoric of Chancellor Scholz uh, starts to lose in support among the opposition, uh, not opposition, I'm sorry, among his also coalition, his, uh, his own coalition, the Greens and the Liberals. They yeah. are more and more, allow more and more critical tones against mm -hmm. Scholz. Mm -hmm. And he gets support uh, also on social networks uh, by the leaders of the far right party the alternative for yeah. Germany and the far left mm -hmm. uh, block of Sarah Wagenknecht. Yeah. And that looks scary when you are a chancellor who gets applause from the far right and far left wings. And what is your policy? How, how can it be uh, transformed? How can it transform the German political landscape? I mean, that's certainly a question, I think, for Olaf Scholz and not me. I mean, it's, it beats me. I mean, that's, that's just inexplicable how you can, you know, uh, realize that the other democratic parties of Germany are absolutely against you and the only ones that seem to be supporting uh, your policy are the fringe elements. I don't know how you are a chancellor who, you know, thinks that he's doing his job correctly um, if that happens. But there's one thing I wanted to, I, I wanted to um, say about something that you just said because I really want to emphasize um, this point. It's very important. Um, when we... Uh, here, uh, especially social democrat uh, rhetoric um, or German rhetoric in general about freezing the conflict. As you've said, um, it's always easier to give something that isn't yours to give, right? Um, and so we give them Ukraine because, you know, it's not us or why not, that sort of thing. And I, uh, this point is really important because it is so rare to see any discussion of what the Ukrainians themselves want in a uh, German debate about exactly this. We seem to pretend as if this is a decision that we can somehow make for the Ukrainians. And regularly, even when you see this discussed on German talk shows, and certainly uh, when you uh, see people like uh, Mr. Mutzenich make that horrible speech before the Bundestag yesterday. Um, nowhere in there is there any discussion about what the Ukrainians themselves actually want. And, and this really needs to change in the German debate, for sure. Absolutely. And that is why we ask you to um, send your donations. You can find the donation links in the description to this uh, video, to this live stream. You can see the donation link and donation QR code on your screen now. We are in constant contact with the Ukrainian units. We ask them what they need and we deliver it to them because it is what they need. It's not what we believe they need most or they 
have to meet or accept. And now we have uh, another, now we have another um, part of our program. And in particular, it is a speech of uh, US President Joe Biden, who has delivered to the nation recently. And I ask the uh, studio to show it to you, because I think that there can be some interesting details we need to discuss. Madam Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, in January 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation, and he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas at the very same time. <clears throat> overseas, Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not. But Ukraine, Ukraine can stop Putin. Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that it needs to defend itself. So you have seen that speech uh, that U.S. President Joe Biden has given uh, a couple of days ago as addressed to the nation. And he was very hawkish. And it was the very beginning of his, uh, of his speech. It uh, was not something that he said at the end. It was the first address, the first idea he wanted to deliver to the audience. And uh, he was clearly pointing out that Putin wants to win this war and destroy Ukraine. And only Ukraine, if Ukraine wins that war, can guarantee security and stability in Europe. Uh, how much does it talk about Biden's uh, real politics? His rhetoric has been stark, strong all the time. But uh, the U.S. doesn't sell shells since uh, weeks and months. Mm -hmm. uh, Republicans say to block it, but President Biden sits on a special fund of six billion U.S. dollar, which he can give to Ukraine just by his signature, and it doesn't happen. Is Biden, in fact, uh, the same uh, person, more or less, as Scholz, thinking that escalation management is what needed for this war, but delivering Ukraine the arms Ukraine needs to defeat Russia? would make the situation worse. Yeah, actually, I think that's a, a big variable that we're seeing. I th um, if we think of um, uh, throughout this entire war, Washington and Berlin have been in quite a bit of alignment on exactly these kinds of questions, managing um, escalation, uh, those sorts of things. And they've had uh, an assessment of the, es the risk of ex escalation that has absolutely just not served us very well um, in this conflict at all. It's not serving our security very well. Um, we did see a, a Washington that did um, eventually uh, sort of reluct reluctantly agree to send uh, Abrams tanks in order to sort of free up the, the leopards. And um, as I said before in the show, I don't know that we are necessarily going to see um, Taurus uh, missile, cruise missile systems get sent from Germany to Ukraine unless we see um, attackums um, that come from the US. Uh, Schultz uh, very much um, when he says keine Alleingänge, we don't go it alone, he, he doesn't actually mean um, we don't go it alone. He means we don't go it alone without the U.S. I mean, uh, Olaf Schultz could have gone uh, ahead um, with certain 
uh, deliveries uh, when the French and the, and the Brits did, for example. Um, when they delivered Storm Shadow missiles, Olaf Scholz could have said, okay, I've got some allies here that are already um, delivering some missiles. I can basically use this as cover. He's waiting for the U.S. And Biden so far is uh, not uh, delivering um, all of the weaponry that he possibly could. Um, and as you said, there is, a, there is that special fund that is there. Now, it is not uh, nearly as large as the amount of money that is currently tied up in U.S. Congress um, that, could, uh, that Republicans are tying up that could actually be a major a difference to Ukraine. So we do have to note that U.S. Congress does have a responsibility to act here, uh, that you know, it doesn't all come down to Biden. But um, as strong as Biden's rhetoric is, and it's impressive, um, it does need to be backed up by uh, proper action. And the only action here, I think, that's acceptable is that we do absolutely everything possible to help Ukraine win this conflict. And the only way to do that is to send everything we possibly can send. And that would include long-range cruise missiles from the U.S. as well as uh, in Germany. And I think that if we were to see the U.S. move on this question, that that would be maybe the one thing that could get, for example, Chancellor um, Olaf Scholz to move. Indeed, and uh, we have also a function of comments uh, on the, both videos on the European Resilience Initiative Center live stream and on Silicon Curtain live stream. Feel free to ask your questions, to leave your comments, and uh, we will try to address as many comments and questions as we can. I already see a comment uh, by Leonard Schneider from Germany, and that is actually the, the example for me of this uh, of this distance between the position of the Germans and the position of yes. the chancellorship, because he writes, well, I remember Andrei Malnik, who was not happy with the German politicians and uh, demanded public support uh, for Ukraine and Germany. And I could understand why Malnik so aggressively, urgently demanded help. And indeed, uh, Ambassador Malnik, who I value a lot, he was very undiplomatic. But the reason was that it was the only way to get help. Otherwise, it would end in endless commissions and yeah. would end into nothing. And that is exactly what we observe now. And I want to return to my question. What kind of pressure can be done? Is there any country which could lead now in Europe or in the West to support Ukraine? We have seen South Korea, we have seen Japan, we now see France. We have the United Kingdom, which is supportive. Uh, is it enough to lead the coalition of, uh, of the good nations? Mm. Well, I think it depends on the issue that you're talking about. Um, first of all, I think that uh, if France and the UK want to lead this coalition, they do have to put up more. Um, we saw a very, very, very impressive start um, at the beginning of this conflict, especially by uh, the United Kingdom, at delivering um, the kinds of weapons that Ukraine needed even before Putin invaded. And I mean, thank God they did, because we don't know what the situation would have necessarily been like had they not done so. This was at the same time, as I said before, that 75% of Germans were against delivering any weapons at all, and the, the German government was very much um, of that line that, you know, never again from Germany war, we'll send 5,000 helmets instead at a time when the that UK... That was yeah. the, the advertising before the yeah. election in 2021, mm -hmm. the advertising mm -hmm. of the Green Party, no weapons deliveries to yeah. uh, crisis areas. Mm -hmm. um, they have had to, to change completely yes. their stance yes. to that problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we, you know, I mean, the UK showed impressive leadership at the beginning. We've seen that really peter out. Um, whether Fra um, France under Macron right now is serious, he is, of course, in Berlin today meeting uh, with both Donald Tusk, the Polish um, Prime Minister, and um, uh, and Olaf Scholz, um, would require him, I think, to put a lot more money and skin in the game than France has done currently. Um, it's uh, contributed way below its capacity. Um, so that really is the big question. Could Germany lead? I mean, perhaps under different leadership it could. If Germany wanted to lead, it, it, it could. The question is one of political will. It certainly has the capacity. And I think that's part of the, the tragic bit of this entire um, of this entire thing is that um, you know all of Germany's allies know and Ukraine knows what a fully 
um, committed Germany would actually mean and be able to achieve. So that's a big question. We do, I think, still need to see some leadership, um, U.S. leadership. We do need to see Biden step up with uh, more deliveries um, of the very key weapons, including attackums, to really claim the leadership position. And I'll say one last thing very briefly, because I know that later on in uh, the show, we're going to be talking a bit more about this particular topic. Uh, my home country, where I come from, Canada, right now has an opportunity to lead on one particular file. Um, it does not have the capacity, particularly militarily, to send the kinds of kit um, that would make a real difference. But it does have the opportunity um, to lead on legislation to seize Russian state assets, central bank reserves uh, that were frozen at the beginning of the war that the Russians cannot currently touch, uh, but they're not doing anything. It could help uh, get things going, help seize these assets, give them to the Ukrainians either for uh, liberation, so purchasing of weapons, or for ongoing reconstruction, which we know is needed. Canada right now is one of only two countries, and it's the only one in the G7 that actually has draft legislation allowing um, for this, and we see that there's big hesitation in places like France and Germany to commit to this kind of um, action. Um, and right now, um, I'm, I'm writing an article that's coming out in a couple of days about this. Right now, Canada just seems to want to follow along. It wants to wait for the rest of its G7 partners um, before it actually uses this law. And I think that's wrong-headed, in my view. Like. I think that Canada has a, a, a chance to lead and say, we're going to do this and, um, you know, we're going to shame the rest of you into following along because we have this law, we're in front, we're going to go ahead. And I think that that's the, the, that's the kind of attitude that we need to see from everybody, um, whether it's on weapons in general, whether it's on leading in the conflict in general, whether it's on one specific file like seizing Russian assets. We need to see, I think, more of this attitude of taking initiative being bold and going ahead and sometimes making others follow us. Indeed, there is a huge demand for the leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. We see it uh, since the story of the full-scale invasion. We remember how the Poles said to the Germans, which was absolutely unexpected, send the tanks, send the tanks. Yeah. And the Ukrainians said, yeah, we are ready to accept German leadership in the military mm -hmm. domain, which the Germans said, oh, no, no, please, we don't want yeah, to be yeah, uh, yeah. war leaders. It's not what... And the whole Central Europe countries, they said, we want Germany to be that, but Germany spoiled the chance, obviously. Now there is a need, either France or Italy or Canada, the United States stay in front of a huge challenge. Uh, November uh, this year will be the, the elections and uh, who knows how the outcome would be. We have now a guest who is about to join us live in the studio. It is Eugenia Garber, who is a professor at George C. Marshall Center in garmisch partenkirchen and she's joining us live from uh, Garmisch Partenkirchen. Um, hello, Evgenia. Hi, hello. Thank you for uh, having me. Thank you for having uh, having arrived to uh, to this to this show. And uh, you have probably heard what we discussed before: the question of leadership, uh, the question of uh, what which, which weapons can be delivered, should be delivered, will be delivered. What is the role of the United States? What is the role of international institutions here in uh, this war? Uh, the whole support for Ukraine military character is more or less uh, bilateral with certain countries. Uh, what is the role of institutions like NATO? Well, uh, the role of institutions, as well as uh, uh, in the case of the national governments, it's all about the leadership, which you mentioned. And uh, I think this is really important to understand that we need to change the patterns of our behavior. So in many cases, including uh, with NATO, uh, of course, uh, we have a certain level of support. Of course, we uh, have very important statements by the Secretary General. But on the other hand, uh, I still don't see this uh, urgency. I still don't see very often this uh, feeling that timing matters. Because as we are speaking now and as we are discussing these uh, matters, I keep getting notifications from the uh, hometown, Odessa, about another attack, uh, Russian attack on the residential areas. And uh, this is how the Ukrainians uh, are living uh, these days, uh, now for, for the third year, actually. So um, the role of the institutions, I think, in the current setting, in the current environment, uh, has to be reviewed. Because if we speak broadly, not only about, 
about NATO, but about the United Nations, for example, about the Red Cross, about many other institutions, we still see this reluctance to take a leadership, to take some uh, active steps, uh, proper steps. And this is something uh, about this cognitive Titan wonder, mental Titan wonder that we are uh, lacking in the discussion. Uh, though, of course, Ukraine appreciates the support that it has uh, been getting from NATO and other institutions, including the European Union, by the way, and the peace facility, which is doomed by the EU. Have all the presidential elections this year in the United States, and we don't know what will be the outcome. Uh, what can be uh, the consequence if uh, someone like Donald Trump enters the White House? How are the European nations ready to deliver what the U.S. will obviously not be ready to deliver? Uh, well, that's a great question. And I think the uh, changes uh, in uh, Europe that we've seen recently, including efforts to step up military production, uh, including new initiatives, uh, these uh, are all uh, steps uh, taken uh, to become more self-sufficient in case uh, President Trump wins these elections. I don't uh, believe in catastrophic scenarios because I still trust in the institutions in the United States, but uh, it's not about the U.S. Uh, withdrawing from NATO, for example, the whole rhetoric about the possibility of withdrawing from NATO. Uh, that undermines trust, that undermines credibility, and this is exactly what Putin wants. Because one of the uh, main goals in this war, uh, not only on Ukraine, uh, as we finally mentioned, but uh, Russia's war on the West, is to actually break this unit and undermine uh, this credibility of the political West as a, a credible partner. So, uh, of course, all these conversations about uh, Putin uh, shall feel free to attack any country which is not delivering to the 2% of their GDP to defense, and then the possibility of the uh, U.S. decreasing role in NATO, and then uh, uh, the some kind of uh, illusion about the possibility to end this war in one day or in two days, uh, unless uh, Russians withdraw their troops from the territory of Ukraine unilaterally. Um, that all does not uh, help to build this unit and to build this trust. So uh, if there is a, a silver lining in the whole situation, I think this is a chance for Europe to actually step in and say we can and we will defend ourselves no matter what. Uh, we do not want to uh, depend in the, on the situation in Washington DC as it has been the case so far. And it's not about any kind of strategic competition or strategic autonomy seen as decoupling of Europe from the US. It's rather about the burden sharing and it's rather about actually living up to the expectations of uh, contributing to, to the European defense. So here, uh, as you mentioned, the role of the Central European countries, of the Nordic Baltic countries is also crucial because these are the leaders in pushing for more, in bringing the sense of sight and wonder and urgency to the European debate. But uh, still at this point of time, I cannot say that Europe is ready to act um, with this resolve uh, unilaterally, not looking back at DC be it uh, Erekhams and uh, uh, Taurus, which uh, has been mentioned uh, today, or even uh, a debate on Ukraine's membership in NATO, because we are now ahead of the Washington summit and speaking about the role of institutions. I still do not see a political will or uh, leadership, uh, neither in Berlin nor in DC, to uh, at least uh, uh, extend invitation to Ukraine, uh, not to mention, of course, the membership itself, because all of this is still about looking who will take the lead so that the others would follow. And while you are uh, providing, this, uh, providing us with this insight, we are receiving comments on uh, both YouTube channels, European Resilience Initiative Center and Silicon Curtain. And a lot of people agree with you. They write, it is not about who will lead, just step up and take a lead, just act. Or the others write that the leaders in the West do not understand the urgency of this situation and like sleepwalking into this delusional reluctancy and don't want to to do what is needed. So a lot of comments who support your point of view. But, uh, when we look at uh, the EU and NATO in Europe, we also see the countries which uh, looked like uh, weak parts of the chain, 
Hungary, now Slovakia. Uh, from certain perspective, uh, surprisingly, the blockades from some, not the Polish state, of course, but some actors in Poland who block the um, grain deliveries from Russia, uh, from, from Ukraine, of course, but do not block uh, grain deliveries from Russia uh, via Belarus. This all undermines the unity and creates additional tensions in our response. How dangerous is this situation? Can it get worse? Or have we reached now the bottom line? Well, the problem is that we are now in this super election year, and uh, this does not help at all uh, to Ukraine, because in most cases, Ukraine is a hostage of the domestic politics in many countries. Uh, the second issue is uh, Russian uh, operations of influence, uh, Russians uh, agents uh, of influence uh, who are all over Europe in uh, different domains, starting from academia, think tanks, universities, and going to the political parties, uh, members of parliament, uh, even intelligence services, as we can now see. And I believe you will have another panel on that today. Uh, so I would really recommend uh, to those who, who want to, to listen to that. Uh, because uh, this is also about how uh, the perception is created that Poland is not supporting Ukraine, for example, because there is this blockade on the border. And then uh, when you look, uh, when you dig deeper into the situation and when you look how those farmers who are protesting on the borders are actually uh, affiliated or connected to, to the uh, Russian partners and sponsors, that can uh, shed a bit of light to this whole situation. It's not limited to that. It's also part of the domestic politics in uh, Poland and uh, relations between Warsaw and Brussels, uh, for sure. But then there is also this uh, dimension of uh, Russian operations of influence and reflexive control. When we wanted to not we have to react what to what is happening rather than be proactive in um, setting the stage and shaping the whole uh, debate and discussion so i don't think that uh, we are in a, a dire situation there i think that ukraine still feels the support from the european and the western partners partners in the united states but again because there are uh, elections uh, not only on the national level but also in uh, to the european parliament and we now see how russia is stepping up its efforts to actually drag its uh, either pro-russian or russian sponsor the russian bright uh, candidate sometimes to rather high levels i think this is the threat because we will be facing a totally different uh, environment a totally different setting by the end of this year and this is the threat that I see, because I do uh, believe that uh, the level of support is still high in many European countries. But on the other hand, I uh, think that the threat perception uh, is not adequate. And there is this gap between the situation on the ground in Ukraine and in many European countries, uh, which are quite far from the front line. Uh, yesterday in Germany, there was this uh, alert just to see whether the system or emergency system is working. And I saw the reaction of many friends here in Germany, how uh, they were feeling uncomfortable, to, to say the least, if not panicking, those who did not know about that before. In Ukraine, people hear these kind of air raid alerts, which are not for the purpose of training, but for the purpose of saving their lives and going to shelters when you are under attack of the Russian missiles every single day, five times, six times sometimes. It's more than 1,000 air raid alerts uh, by now. So this uh, threat perception uh, in such countries, maybe as Hungary or that you mentioned, or uh, some countries which are far from the front line, it also does not uh, let us tap into the potential of this defense cooperation and actually going all in to support Ukraine, not only uh, as long as it takes, but also to deliver whatever it takes to, uh, to uh, ensure Ukraine's victory. Um, so briefly, like to wrap up this long answer, probably if uh, I see this uh, threat to, to undermine the unit of the European Union from inside, yes, I do see it. But I also think that this is a good chance for the European Union to review uh, its internal procedures, voting procedures from going from unanimity to uh, maybe a qualified majority on some issues, to talk about the defense union within the European Union that would actually 
allowed to be more consistent and coherent in defense policies. So this is also a time of opportunities to have a real tight in and not only for uh, separate countries, but also for the institutions like NATO and the EU as well. But here you have mentioned uh, the uh, sign of hope uh, that not all countries are being used by Russia as uh, their uh, agents or assets. But we have also leadership uh, within the European Union and NATO. And I would like to name the uh, Czech leader, General Pavel, who has led the action to find enough ammunition for the Ukrainian army. And he found the like 800,000 uh, shells or even more. And uh, now he's looking for funds. And I think that some funds are being guaranteed. Um, and combined with the Estonian initiative of creating a joint uh, shells production for uh, the European Union, which was not that successful until now, but we have hopes that uh, the production capacities will be expanded uh, under the end, uh, until the end of this year. Do you see some hope in leadership of uh, these countries who have much more experience with the Russian threats? Yes, exactly. That's uh, that's exactly the, the the point that I was making before. That it's about uh, the leadership. It's about particular personalities who can take this lead. But that's also about the threat perception and experience of living either close to Russia or under the Russian occupation. Because such countries as Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia. Uh, Poland, Czech Republic, uh, they are the countries most exposed to the uh, Russian threat and Russian influence for years, for decades. And I remember even after the uh, occupation of uh, part of Georgia uh, back in 2008 by Russia, when voices from these countries, including from Ukraine, but also from the Baltic states, were raising, saying that, hey, this is the threat we have to face. There is no time for self-deterrence. There is no time for uh, de-escalation by not reacting. If we want to de-escalate and prevent further aggression, we have to react in a very strong way. These countries, uh, or certain experts or political leaders, were seen as uh, paranoids who are just afraid of Russia and who have this psychological trauma from the past. And this is uh, not something possible in the 21st century. And now we actually see how these countries are uh, at the front line of deterring Russia, also defending the rest of Europe from the Russian aggression. So uh, indeed, it's just uh, because we have knowledge of Russia, we know how it is to live with Russia here in the region, um, which brings us to the uh, conclusion that there is no way we can negotiate with Russia when uh, it has an upper hand on the battlefield and when we uh, feel ourselves deterred by Russia. If we want to de-escalate, then we need to be strong. And this unity and strong reaction and being proactive rather than uh, on defense and rather than reactive to Russian um, acts of aggression, this is what would be the most de-escalatory uh, policy in the region. So I do believe that these countries in the uh, Central and Eastern Europe they are both uh, morally leading the whole discussion, but also uh, bringing very important sense of urgency and the uh, presence of this threat, not only to Ukraine, but to the rest of Europe as well, uh, should Ukraine fail. This leadership has been uh, produced, like is this, if this leadership is available, if this leadership is on the table, do the European countries have enough uh, technological expertise and capacities to produce, let me say, enough shells, enough tanks, enough other types of ammunition and equipment? Well, that's exactly what we are seeing now, how uh, slowly but gradually, but uh, in a coherent way, we see new and new initiatives to step up military production. One of the best examples probably would be the Rhine Metal, uh, which builds new ammunition plants now. Um, we are discussing also joint production uh, uh, in Ukraine, uh, though it's not easy during the war. We need uh, additional air defense to defend those facilities. But that is exactly the debate we should have been witnessing for two years now, at least. Uh, it's uh, a bit belated, but still it's a positive sign uh, that Europe is trying also to uh, step up uh, military production and uh, come up with these new initiatives to 
um, increase uh, its own uh, capacities uh, because it's it's not there now. Uh, as uh, has been mentioned today several times, uh, there have been these decades of peace in Europe. And this, of course, influences not only the perception and mentality, but also the situation on the ground with the production of ammos. And now we're back to the uh, beginning of the 20th century, probably, in terms of, of this threat. And artillery uh, still matters. This is not a war only of drones and uh, cutting edge technologies which are an important part of this war. But that's also about basic things like uh, artillery shells, which we uh, lack in Europe and uh, which we lack in Ukraine, of course. So we are not yet there where we want to be, but I think that uh, the positive dynamics in this domain is definitely there. Thank you. It was uh, an amazing, uh, full of insights, uh, comment by Professor Evgenia Garber, who teaches at uh, the uh, makes her research at the George C. Marshall Center in Garmisch Partenkirchen. And uh, thank you for having joined us today. And we are coming back to our live broadcasting with uh, Aaron Gasparnet, who is a security analyst and uh, expert uh, Canadian living in Berlin, a co-host of a podcast uh, Berlin Side Out, yes. uh, which he runs together with Dr. Benjamin Tallis from the DGAP, yeah. uh, German Council on Foreign Relations. And um, what Professor Garber has said, uh, that there is not enough political will, but there are like technological competence. And I need to add, there is economy for that. Like we have a GDP many times yes. larger than Russia. If we have invested a slightly piece of this GDP in defense, we would have already won. Um, can we still hope that this reluctancy and this denial that this war is not something that happens to others, that it can be overcome? We had Bucha, uh, eyes opening moment. Mm -hmm. We had Mariupol, eyes opening moment. Yes. But now, like many people say, just, okay, let's just forget it because we are too tired of that. Um, I think, well, first of all, um, on the subject of Ukraine fatigue, which is um, a term that has been used in Germany lately, um, I, I'd re like to be very careful about using it, simply because I think that, um, I, I remember this one tweet, for example, by the Ukrainian ambassador to Germany, who did a fast motion, motion video of the line in, to get into Cafe Kiev a few weeks ago and how it was a, a one to two hour wait to get in. I mean, you know, and then he said, ah, yes, the famous Ukraine fatigue, yeah, that, this sort of thing. Um, we have been there at yeah. the Cafe Kiev with yeah. our Crimea panel. And yes. it started after 9 p.m. and we had full, full house. Full house. Yeah. We had full house. People were staying in mm -hmm. the L, and I thought, okay, uh, yeah. if we have at 9 p.m. that Crimea liberation panel, then what kind of Ukraine fatigue we're talking yeah. about? Yeah, so I think we have to be a little bit careful with using Ukraine fatigue because I think that, I, I think that there are some vested interests in perpetuating um, this kind of fatigue. Um, you know, the, and certainly there are, are political leaders who are very keen to get back to their domestic agendas, um, who have things that they want to focus on. And I mean, but this is the, the function of effective government. You should be able to walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. <laughs> you know, you should be able to handle these security issues and you should also be um, able to uh, handle domestic issues at the same time. And indeed, it is very necessary that that happens. Um, you know, uh, Ben and I, uh, my co-host, of course, Ben Talis, who we, we mentioned, who sadly could not be with us today, but we talk about uh, this in relation to new idealism, of which um, Ukraine um, is absolutely um, the shining light of at the moment. It is, you know, a democracy which has been attacked, which has decided it's going to defend itself. Um, you know, but part of that, uh, part of defending democracy is also making sure your society remains um, worth defending. And so it is important for us to be able to handle security and domestic issues at the exact same time. But it does require us to have um, really frank discussions with uh, the public. And that is a discussion that um, some, uh, I think, you know, members of the, 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 the German political elite are willing to have and have started having. Uh, but we're certainly not seeing that from, from Chancellor Olaf Scholz, uh, for example. Um, I, I think that 
you know, the, Ukraine is obviously a problem that um, problem. Um, they see it as a problem. Um, and that, the problem caused yeah. by Ukraine in yeah, their eyes, yeah. not by Vladimir Putin and Russia. Yeah. I mean, you know, why doesn't Ukraine just, you know, stop defending itself and then it will all go away? This is literally logic that we see, which is, of course, ridiculous. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, this is, this is um, something that, that we see that I think is motivating some of, the, of their decisions. Um, uh, the reality is, is that um, it, it won't go away and we do, we can't go back to business as usual, although I do think that there is a sizable um, uh, section of Western political elites who somehow think that's possible. We are always going to have to spend more on defense than we have, than we have been uh, because, of course, the U.S. security guarantee um, is in question. We cannot... Um, whether even if Trump loses this election, we don't necessarily, Trumpism isn't necessarily going to die. We do see a, secure, um, a Republican Party that is less invested in um, European security in general, and that isn't going to go away uh, just because uh, Trump goes away, for example. We can't, and we can't, you know, sort of cross our fingers and hope that the Democrats win the, the White House for the next 20 years. That is not viable. Um, so we do have to step up. We have to have the necessary um, economic um, and industrial uh, policy production uh, to put our economy on a war footing if necessary. And by the way, I want to get back to your point about GDP because this is something we can do. Um, you know, uh, if we get into the whole subject of narratives, we've bought into this narrative of Russia being somehow this, I mean, yes, it has nuclear weapons, we know that, but of being somehow this, you know, huge, um, you know, strong uh, enemy. And of course, we have to take it seriously. It is, um, its economy is on a war footing. And because it's an authoritarian state, uh, it can put its entire economy on a war footing and not really be overly concerned about the welfare of its people. But that all said, Canada has a larger economy than Russia, um, for example, um, you know, and that's just, and, and that's a relatively small com economy compared to the UK or France or Germany uh, or the US or Japan, all, all of which are, are larger. Italy has a larger economy uh, than Russia. So if we want to uh, put our economy on the necessary footing to ensure our own defense, we absolutely can. It just takes will. Absolutely, and we'll certainly come back now to the question of economy. But before we do this, uh, don't forget to go into the uh, description of this live uh, video. Uh, first of all, you will see the time schedule and can plan your time, what panels you want definitely to attend. You don't want to miss them, and believe me, there will be stellar guests there. And also you can find uh, links for donation for the Ukrainian army. You can also see the link on your screen uh, with the QR code and with the donation link. Uh, and if you donate, your money will go directly to support of Ukrainian units and we will buy them the equipment they need. They told us to buy them and we are in contact with them since uh, over a year regularly delivering them things which can save lives and which are saving lives. Thank you to your uh, donations. But we have this discussion on how can we creatively approach to the challenge of defeating Russia mm -hmm. and protecting not only Ukraine, but us all, because Russia with all their threats threatens us all. And we have already discussed the question of confiscation of Russian sovereign assets. Yep. We have for that a video which we have recorded uh, before this interview, before this live, and I uh, want to introduce you this video we have recorded with Olena Halushka, who is a co-founder of uh, the International Center for Ukrainian, uh, for Ukrainian Victory. So we are actually talking about the reserves of the Russian Central Bank. Uh, in total, their reserves before at the beginning of the full-scale war were around almost um, $600 billion. Um, a little less than half of this money were held in uh, G7 countries and other um, democracies like Australia, for example, and um, or Switzerland. Uh, and um, around $300 billion uh, dollars 
assets were frozen in those G7 countries. Uh, these are actually um, uh, bonds, securities um, and cash that are held either in depositories or in uh, banks or other financial institutions of the Western countries. Most of this money, around $200 billion, are held in one depository, um, Belgian agency Euroclear. And that's why we are currently advocating for the establishment of G7 plus Belgium confiscation coalition because G7 decision would be a very important political step and Belgian participation would have a very practical implication because that's the country where most of this money is currently held and where it has to be um, confiscated from. Currently, there are actually two tracks of discussion. One is within G7, and uh, there they try to discuss full confiscation. Uh, we have um, the, how the debates are going on there. We have the US, Canada, and UK that are in favor of full confiscation. And we have European part of G7 countries, France, Germany, and Italy, and Japan, who are um, more cautious with regards to how this has to be done. Simultaneously, we have parallel track, which is European Union, and it is focused on the windfall profits. They uh, passed the decision in February to put aside on a separate account all windfall profits. By windfall profits, I mean actually interests on the frozen assets. Why they are called windfall? Because they would never appear if there was no um, Russian full-scale aggression and if there were no sanctions related to the Russian full-scale aggression, meaning that this money um, in the normal circumstances would not be uh, generated. Uh, so th there is the decision of the European Council that those windfall profits would be put on a separate account from 2024 and further on. We are talking about four up to five maximum billion uh, euros uh, per year. So it, it's not that this money, you know, would be seriously life-saving, but it's much better, of course, to have them than not to have. And here it is also very important to mention that to get this money finally sent to Ukraine, European Union has to make additional decision that this money would not only be set apart, but actually transferred to Ukraine. Why this decision wasn't made uh, kind of together with the previous one, I have no idea. Because for me, it goes without saying, if you put the profits on the frozen money aside, of course, the, the, those profits need to be transferred to Ukraine. But very important thing that it regards only the profits from 2024 and further. And we still have profits for 2022 and 2023. And here we speak about um, a little bit more than 5 billion euro. So uh, in the light of Ukraine desperately needing money already today, this money is kept by Euroclear, this Belgian depository, with the decision of the Belgian government uh, as the reserve for some hypothetical future risks. And we are talking to Belgian authorities, we are talking to the uh, governance, to, to, to the Euro Commission, to the European Council, EU member states, that uh, why should 5 billion euros stay within Belgian euro clear when Ukrainians are dying already now. Just two days ago, Russia killed 12 people in Odessa, including five kids, including, you know, two babies, one toddler and two a bit uh, older kids. I mean, Ukraine desperately needs every 
every dollar and every euro already today. And we have this 5 billion um, uh, euro, which will stay with Belgium for some hy hypothetical risks. What if Russia goes to courts? What if Russia attacks, you know, does some cyber attacks against Euroclear? Whatever else. But they do not say, you know, what are their risk assessment? And, uh, you know, lawyers for 5 billion euro, I mean, you can basically hire all of the lawyers of this planet. And if we speak about the trials, Euroclear is very scared of trials in Russia. But, you know, the court, the, 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 Russia is not about rule of law. Russia is not about trials. Russian courts are about issuing the rulings of whatever Kremlin wants them. Uh, to, to rule, meaning that what is the point of spending money on the trials in Russia if the decision would anyway be whatever Kremlin wants. So this sounds ridiculous from our perspective, and we will continue demanding that this 5 billion euros winful profits made for 2022 and 2023 should be sent to Ukraine as soon as possible to protect Ukrainians. Well, maybe some part of this money should indeed stay with Belgium. That's true, but definitely not 5 billion. So there are basically three main blocks of arguments against confiscation. First one is legal. Uh, as you've said, you know that there were no precedents uh, before that this money is protected by the sovereign immunity, so we cannot simply take them uh, from Russia and transfer to Ukraine. The second big block is um, financial arguments and the trust uh, in dollar and euro as the reserve currencies, and that after confiscation is done, uh, the reserves uh, of the third countries will simply flock away from the Western financial system and undermine them. And the third important pillar is uh, so-called retaliation fears that Russia is blackmailing, that they will start confiscating Western businesses uh, or their assets that are located in Russia. From the legal perspective, there's absolutely no difference between the freezing and the confiscation. And if we speak about the legal arguments, um, international lawyers prove that the confiscation can be done as the countermeasure. Countermeasure, that's um, the um, actions uh, of either uh, the, the victims or the third parties who are also um, um, felt some damages uh, from the illegal activities of an aggressor that are aimed at motivating uh, the, the aggressor to stop uh, their illegal actions and violations of the international law. So this freezing of the $300 billion in the first days of the full-scale war, it was countermeasure back then. And it was a relatively proportionate countermeasure because Russia hasn't um, inflicted um, very high losses back then like they are having now. According to the latest uh, assessment of the World Bank, um, the damages of the two years of the full-scale war, and we are talking only about the full-scale war. We are not talking about the 10 years of the Russian aggression since 2014. So two years of the full-scale war inflicted at Ukraine 486 billion dollars damages, meaning that it's absolutely logical when everybody is demanding that the countermeasure should be toughened. And the next step after freezing, of course, would be um, to confiscate this money and send it to Ukraine. You're also absolutely right that the message and the signal for the third countries was already sent two years ago. And those who wished to get their assets and transfer them into other um, more safe places, they had plenty of time to do this. But the problem, which is very often um, um, not um, um, said, explained, discussed, 
um, by the uh, opponents of the confiscation is that in case if confiscation is done by G7 countries and European Union jointly, there are simply not many destinations for the assets to flock away. Because Chinese Yuan is not a sufficient reserve currency because it is not fully convertible, plus Chinese investment market is actually not safe. They have plenty of cases of interference of the government in the investment markets. Where else can these assets go? Into Indian rupee. I mean, it's not convertible uh, also. Into some Middle East currencies, well, they do not have, you know, the capacity to absorb uh, as much of the assets, plus they also have this uh, convertibility issues. Somebody speaks about the potential currency of BRICS, Union. But do you really think that, let's say, China and India can come up with, with one joint currency when they are having very different geopolitical goals? Of course, no. So in case if the uh, confiscation is done jointly, there is simply not many options at all for the currencies to flock away, meaning that the fears are very often largely overinflated. Welcome back to our live broadcasting from Berlin at TV Marathon today, eight hours long in support for Ukraine. Don't forget to send your donations to support the Ukrainian army. You can see the link for the donation in uh, the description of this live video and also on your screen now you see the uh, QR code and the donation link. We will send the goods we buy for the Ukrainian army directly to the units or personally bring them to the front, which we normally do and we are talking today with Aaron Barnett, who is a security expert uh, living in Berlin, a Canadian person, also co-host of uh, a podcast Berlin Side Out, which he runs together with Dr. Benjamin Tallis from the DGAP, the German uh, Council on Foreign Relations. Benjamin is unfortunately not with us today. Uh, what do you think about the feasibility of confiscating of Russian sovereign assets? It's not simply feasible, it's necessary, in my view. Um, so we can do this, we absolutely um, are able to do this, and we absolutely should. I mean, the, the title um, of this event today is War on All Fronts, and we have to remember that um, this means that every possible measure that we can take to help ensure Ukrainian victory, we have to take. There is, of course, military dimensions to that. Um, there's political and diplomatic dimensions, but there are financial dimensions. And that's part of why we're even having this, is also the financial dimension, raising, uh, helping to raise the money uh, to um, get the things that Ukraine needs. So, of course, you know, and I encourage you to, 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 to donate as well, you know, remember uh, the links that Sergei has uh, provided for you there. But when it comes to the financial uh, aspect of this war, um, there is a financial aspect of this war, and this is absolutely part of it. I mean, um, <clears throat> These assets have been sitting on the sidelines for two years, and originally, uh, originally we saw that the freezing of Russian central bank assets, which is held um, in uh, Western bank accounts, was absolutely um, an, an extremely effective measure at the beginning of the war. I mean, the ruble was absolutely hammered over a period of a couple of days, and it seems as if uh, this is something that Putin and the uh, Russian regime was not actually expecting that um, we the, the West really would uh, take this step and um, help to paralyze uh, Russia's ability to be able uh, to wage this war. But that period is uh, long, long, long past, um, and it's time to actually confiscate these, uh, give them to Ukraine. Um, and there's two various ways, of course, that those confiscated assets could be used. Number one is, of course, for uh, reconstructing Ukraine. Um, uh, that is certainly something that has to not simply be done at the end, but ongoing. I mean, infrastructure is constantly being 
uh, a bombed in Ukraine and must constantly be repaired. So that is an ongoing cost. I mean, when we say reconstruction, people often think that that's something that happens at the beginning of the war, but this is something that is consistently happening, uh, which is one of the reasons that um, these assets need to be confiscated now uh, to help alleviate some of those financial pressures. But also they could be used for uh, Ukrainian liberation, which is to help Ukraine to buy equipment, to buy weapons, uh, to buy the things that it actually needs uh, to be able uh, to win this war. Feasibility is a tricky question. Um, the reality is, is most countries do not yet have uh, the legislation in place to seize these assets. But this is a technical issue. And this is a technical issue that, as with all technical issues, can be solved if there is simply uh, the political will to do so. My home country is demonstrating legislative leadership on that, as I said earlier in the show. There is a Canadian law um, that is going through that allows for this. Um, originally, uh, Canada was one of the first countries to pass a law allowing for the confiscation of private assets. These are assets that are held by Russian oligarchs uh, in Western countries like Canada. Uh, Canada, for example, um, seized um, a, a plane. It seized um, assets, I think 26 million, uh, that was sitting in a holding company um, believed to be owned by Roman Abramovich, for example. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that pales in comparison, for example, to state assets. In Canada alone, um, there are an estimated $19 billion Canadian of Russian central bank state assets that are sitting either in Canadian accounts or in um, accounts associated with Euroclear, which Canada has um, can claim the legal right to seize. Uh, when, as Elena was saying there, the amount of assets are vast, over 300 billion US. Most of those, by the way, are located in Europe. Um, so over 200 billion of that, over two thirds. As we talked uh, at the interview mm -hmm. with uh, Lena, she yeah. said uh, before this live, uh, she said that uh, they like a huge line port are in Belgium. Mm -hmm. like, you can just like take them and mm -hmm. use them, or like at least you can use the uh, uh, the income which is being yeah. generated by mm -hmm. by uh, the um, mm -hmm. availability of these assets. So mm -hmm. you just like need to have political will to do it. And there are, as you mentioned, the fears that it is like illegal according to international law because it violates Russia's right. We have a war. We have genocide in Europe. Of course, you need to violate someone's rights, like property rights of the Russian army on their tanks, or property rights of Russian oil companies on their refineries which have been hit by the yeah. Ukrainian army but to avoid your that your property being damaged don't start the wars yeah well and this is precisely it I mean we have um, there are uh, still some people who are skeptical about seizing Russian assets partly because uh, they think that it would uh, violate international law as Olena's um, uh, foundation has been our uh, center has been arguing uh, no this isn't a current in accordance with international law um, because um, we are um, exercising um, enforcement or countermeasure of a obligation under international law that Russia has which is to not invade your neighbors and not you know uh, perpetrate mass killing uh, of them, which obviously is, uh, I think, um, the more important principle of international law. But this is within, this is absolutely within uh, international law as I see it. And there are um, legal scholars that are making this exact same argument um, that it is feasible under international law because the original question was on feasibility. Um, under domestic law, we also hear legal arguments that it is feasible under domestic law because uh, Russia does not enjoy as a state um, the, the kinds of protections that the Canadian Charts of, Charter of Rights and Freedoms or the German Grundgesetz uh, would offer, uh, for example, as a state, it doesn't enjoy those. Um, in terms of feasibility, Canada is proving, and in actually Switzerland recently, of all places, is proving that it is legal, legally feasible. We can pass these laws. It can be technically challenging because under um, domestic law in many countries, um, there is a, st the um, states themselves are uh, enjoy exception or immunity under currently existing sanctions law um, to have their assets seized, but with some political will, you can change that. And that's precisely what we are already seeing 
in, in my own home country, in Switzerland. And that's precisely what we need to be seeing um, in more countries. We need a shift of thinking on this. We have, while we are talking now, uh, we have some comments uh, which uh, our audience uh, posts under the video. And I encourage you to ask your questions and um, leave your comments under the video or share this video to uh, encourage other people to do this. We have three comments which I, in particular, find very interesting. First one, uh, there could be no matter what you took from Russia and gave to Ukraine, uh, you will never compensate anything what Ukraine has suffered, like a bit of that. No. Because the, the, the damage is vast, like it is not only hundreds of billions of euros, it's human lives, it's yes. strategy, it's stolen years and years, ages of human life yes. combined. I totally agree here. But here we have like two other questions. One thing is the role of businesses, and the businesses seem to be unhappy with what is going. And another question is, didn't Putin just sign off that uh, leased airlines in Russia as theirs? So uh, there is a fear that if we confiscate Russia's sovereign assets, Russia confiscates property of our companies. <laughs> how much, how much of, 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 of... I am honestly so sick of these arguments because Russia will do whatever it wants. It's already demonstrating that, right? Fear of, um, you know, saying that you're not going to do something because you fear Russian retaliation it, it, they, they never pay attention to this. I mean, we're talking about this with Taurus, for example, where, oh, let's not send Taurus. Well, that's not going to prevent them from getting Iranian-made uh, cruise missiles of their own. They don't care. And in fact, they're like, oh, great. You know, you won't send missiles. We'll send of our own. We have battlefield advantage. Um, Russia is already uh, retaliating against um, Russian comp uh, or uh, Western companies. I read already. this comment today in a discussion about the destiny of a Russian house uh, representation office of Russia, a propaganda agency mm -hmm. here in Berlin. Uh, don't confiscate it because if you do it, Russia will confiscate property of Goethe Institute, a cultural institute in Moscow. So I don't care, like, okay, they will confiscate the property. First, I'm not sure that Goethe Institute owns any property, but even if they do, you will not be able to teach Russians German language. What a huge loss, but you will undercut the Russian propaganda in the heart of our city where they sell like all their books and yeah. uh, held all the all the speeches etc mm -hmm. so uh, if we think about confiscating can several countries without waiting for international community to do it can like the netherlands or uh, canada say okay we do it alone and we lead and actually, um, I think that uh, I make an argument um, in an article that I actually have coming out in a couple of days that that is precisely what my own home country, Canada, should do. Um, that it should uh, not wait, um, that it shouldn't wait for G7 agreement. It has the necessary legislative framework in place. Um, it needs to set an example and it needs to go ahead. Um, because we often see also on Ukraine is that when countries do that, um, you know, other people do follow. It, it does uh, build a certain amount of consensus. And I think that that is precisely uh, what is necessary. It's just time to act. Um, and especially because um, every single day that passes in Ukraine, as you say, is um, a time when, you know, we lose more uh, precious human lives there. As you said, the U Ukraine has already um, lost far more than what we can compensate them for. Um, Ne nevertheless, it's important that we do this, um, partly because um, Russia is never going to pay reparations. I mean, anyone who's expecting Russia to pay reparations after the war is over or Russia anything like that. Russia never pays voluntarily I, for what, or what yeah. they have damaged. But mm -hmm. we need to uh, close this panel now as the time is coming for us to go into a break. Don't switch off, or if you do this, oh, then don't forget to enter into the panel again. And to look at the time schedule in the description in this video, we'll see again. But now, look, the interviews were recorded extra for this panel. the word the global south is usually used for uh, these regions because th that is definitely quite a diverse uh, community of the countries and because of these uh, many of them had different experience different alliances and partnership different political uh, preferences as for now so we have an extremely diverse picture 
What we definitely know that Russia been actively working for the last 30 years in all these countries, doesn't matter, right, left, democratic or more autocratic, Russia been working because they had the uh, diplomatic presence. What Ukraine didn't have in many of these countries and didn't have the enough capacity and money to be present in terms of the uh, uh, political, in terms of the visits, in terms of the contacts, in terms of the soft power and public diplomacy. Uh, so now we are de facto trying to catch up with what we've been neglecting for many years. At the same time, we have countries that clearly immediately realized what is happening and took the strong position, like Japan. Here, no questions. What is interesting, Guatemala suddenly became one of the leaders in the Latin American region uh, who understood joint Crimean platform and we had our friends. With other countries, the problem was originally that we thought uh, um, they just understand what does mean the rules-based order, human rights, and how important that is. We underestimated that Russia played perfectly on uh, the anti-Americanism and anti-Westernism in many of these countries, and also presenting is as anti-imperialism, so all that Soviet narrative that worked well, meaning that Russia is against empires, not Russia is empire. And uh, uh, the question when we started to speak that Ukraine being a colony of Russia for uh, centuries, and we even received the uh, uh, su surprise, like, you know, eyebrows in Africa, you are white, you cannot be a colony. So on the certain moment, we needed to reframe our narratives and studying, uh, explaining, we just realized that first of all, many of these countries are not supporting Ukraine just because they don't know what is happening. Because they are perfectly living at the certain information bubbles, many of the information agencies are just reposting Russian information agencies because they're free of charge compared to Reuters, for example. Yep. So it's just came naturally and we need to break this uh, wall. And for this, what we really need to do is to go there and to speak directly with these people. Because sometimes we don't feel nuances, what touch people, what don't touch. A big surprise for me was, for example, that India being a nuclear uh, country, doesn't want to speak about nuclear security. They are not interested in this topic. That's not the topic that really touches them. But at the same time, they were absolutely uh, open to speak about food security. Even that we thought originally, I mean, yeah, our assumption that food security is probably more the question for the African countries. Then you came with some, I mean, that's really uh, so many nuances and details that without coming to the region, without speaking directly with these people, you would not be able to, uh, um, to feel uh, the moods and to understand uh, the needs and what are the common topics. We suddenly received a very interesting support from Singapore who was very interested in disinformation and in maritime security. Small country, but they understand that because of their ethnic composition, because of their neighbors, because where they are, there is two spheres where maybe they don't care what is happening in Ukraine, but they care about experience of Ukraine. So we can speak uh, from how we can be useful for you by sharing our lessons learned and experience. It's not that we need to share the threat, because when you come to many countries, they openly say, but do you understand that you are not a global conflict for us? You're a regional conflict. So explain us why we should care about you. Yeah, morally, we understand that that is bad, that you have refugees, you have destruction, everything. Yeah, Russia is bad, but why should we care? And that's to find these nuances, why they should care, what are those interesting elements, uh, and what are the transnational or even transcontinental effects. That's how we are getting these countries, because with many Southeast Asian countries, for example, we started to explain that we understand that China is bigger threat for you than Russia. You the fact don't care about Russia. Uh, but uh, look, China is now learning the lessons from Russia, both in terms of tactics, how war can be conducted, but also in terms of the international reaction. So they are looking, okay, sanctions are not effective, or what mechanisms we can prevent and mechanisms to implement, so your sanctions would not be effective to us. Or, okay, we understand that West would not go after this. Yeah, that is their limit in terms of actions. Why not to try? Let us try to do this, this, or this. So, you know, all of these, and suddenly they start opening like, okay, so you think that China can go, let's say, attacking, yeah, it can be hybrid actions or direct, 
if Russia is winning because they understand that the West is weak and are not capable of uh, uh, like uh, facing this, we said, yes, we already see the indicators and you have like, you know, a switch. Oh, that's interesting. Let's talk now. Maybe we can help. So that is probably now we are in this period of, you know, uh, search of experiencing, of trying, of learning. Uh, uh, but not only telling, and that is the huge difference between probably our uh, activities before 2022 and now, because originally we were coming just advocating. Now we are coming to learn, so to understand how we can be useful and interesting to each other. South Korea is not openly supplying us with any ammunition yet. Uh, that's what we are working on. Uh, uh, they try to do it uh, through the third countries because according to their legislation, they cannot do it to the country in war. Uh, and even in South Korea, where we've been in December, uh, I cannot say that the position is so strict. Uh, and uh, uh, on the one hand, they are absolutely recognizing Russian aggression and uh, that Ukraine is a victim and Ukraine needed to, to be supported. But at the same time, they are not imposing a lot of sanctions against the Russian Federation. Or they are looking at the situation as, uh, okay, but we can continue trading and doing some of other stuff. So they are still trying to balance. Uh, also, partially because of China and because of North Korea, they're trying uh, not to spoil relations with Russia that much that Russia would destabilize situation in their region. And that is the fear of a lot of countries, uh, uh, in especially in Southeast uh, Asia. With Japan, that's a little bit easier because uh, let's not forget that uh, Japan is still, from the legal point of view, uh, in the state of war with Russia after the Second World War. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, they don't have the armed forces. So there are also limits to what they can supply to us. What still uh, can be done uh, from the region? Uh, there are not so many countries that can supply us with what Ukraine needs. Uh, because we don't have so many uh, uh, Asian countries that are producing weapons. They've been usually the uh, buyers of even Ukrainian weapons. Uh, but there, some of them are important trade partners, and you understand that we need the economic activity. We need their voices in the United Nations and other organizations. That's very important. What is much more important, we need them to join sanctions because Russia is using a lot of, of these countries uh, to bypass sanctions of the European Union and uh, the US. They are using these countries for the gray export and they are using these countries for the supply of the uh, uh, technologies that are important for, uh, for the weapons production, uh, such as microchips, for example. And uh, the uh, uh, last uh, but not the least, many of these countries bought in the past the Soviet ammunition and equipment. So now Russia is trying to buy it back. And sometimes even very, very old equipment like you uh, last year, it was the contract that they bought in Cambodia, the weapons that de facto been produced in 1950s. But who cares if it is the tank, this tank is driving so it can be used at the battlefield. There is no limit for Ukraine uh, to go on with not only Euro-Atlantic reform agenda, but also continuing to will to be a NATO member. Uh, but we have to talk about specific uh, member states inside the NATO and the political willingness of the NATO to accept Ukraine. That's, I believe, it's something that you are asking, um, and we as Ukrainians are asking ourselves. So when, how, under which uh, perspectives. Of course, uh, everyone uh, from Ukraine, uh, civil society in particular, looks uh, uh, on the July agenda. July is the time for uh, annual, uh, but this time very memorial, 75th uh, NATO Washington summit. And uh, we were thinking, so apart from writing the security assurances with uh, Ukraine, um, US could uh, make a much more of a message 
not only NATO member states, but united with the member states to other parts of the world, saying that not only Ukraine will be a member, but Ukraine will be a member of NATO when and how. That's uh, the precision framework. So when, how, it means by which conditions. Yeah, that's something that we are very much expecting and working on um, intensively with our partners yeah, as a civil society organization, think tank, in other countries, with the organization, for example, but with other, uh, uh, others from the NATO member states, in order to make sure that we elaborate um, this understanding and the timely concern that we already talked about. Because, yes, we already have a Vilnius uh, communique or Vilnius declaration last year when the NATO annual NATO uh, summit was taken on with the perspective of Ukraine somehow when we don't know to become a NATO member state but we want to make sure that it happens already and there are already not only economic but also political preconditions to that. Of course our eyes uh, look more to uh, what we say Atlantic partner of NATO United States in particular, where the concerns are that um, Ukraine is not ready and it might be ready to join NATO only after or when Ukraine wins and have a full victory. And this precision to have a full victory itself and to win, uh, that's something that we as Ukrainians see as a, uh, already being a precondition of being a member state of NATO. So it should happen in the parallel tracks. Um, I want to maybe foresee some of the questions that Sergei you might think or your audience who will be listening to this podcast in particular might see. Um, well, there is a kind of a stereotype, or it, at least it used to be a stereotype before that the expansion of NATO was the precondition why the Russian Federation attacked Ukraine, right? So it was a very common knowledge uh, for a lot of communities in 2022, but also in 2023. As a picture now in 2024, I might say two arguments that are against that. Firstly, in Finland. Uh, uh, already became a partner or actually a member, to be precisely, of NATO. So expanding its uh, uh, borders and uh, NATO literally being on the borders with the Russian Federation, but Sweden as well. Uh, did something happen to them? Not at all. And so it means that uh, this uh, uh, idea uh, that sometimes politically blocks or sometimes some expert societies blocks to the vision to have a full victory for Ukraine, at least to help Ukraine in order to gain this full victory. Um, we say that um, these arguments that the expansion of NATO was uh, used as something uh, why the Russian Federation attacked uh, shouldn't be the argument as well in 2024. The argument should be or why Ukraine is not still winning with all together. So what it makes sure, or how to make sure that Ukraine not only wins, but have a full victory. These, I believe, are the key questions that we should ask our Western partners. But we, as Ukrainian experts, make sure that we are providing necessary, not only questions, but answers to that. We are definitely ready to uh, uh, both receive the military aid and support and supply of all uh, possible ammo, but also uh, far launch missiles, uh, in particular that you mentioned. Uh, your country, in Germany, is making a intensive debates whether to exchange uh, the Taurus to the British storms and to then to, in such a way, uh, to overcome, uh, let's say, the political shape and political discussions or dilemmas for some of uh, the representatives still to support Ukraine on time. Because uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Serhi, it's very important that we do that on time and as soon as possible. And, uh, and it's not about as long as it takes formula, it's now. And uh, as you know, when we are talking about military uh, cooperation in particular and planning uh, and delivery on time is a kind of a very essential thing to support uh, not only the militaries but also civilians in Ukraine, which are uh, literally making sure that uh, um, each and every drone attack or a missile attack is not hitting their homes uh, for, for a moment. And that's why a you know, political dimension of the discussions, so which uh, ammunition, but also in particular which military aid 
to provide to Ukraine. It's something that has been long uh, debated, and that's why the length of this discussion sometimes is immeasurable. In Ukrainian framework, you know, time is a very different uh, concern, and uh, we make sure that uh, our response is uh, uh, is making it as quick as possible. Of course, we definitely understand the partners in the West that will take much more time politically to um, negotiate and discuss these matters in particular. I only mentioned Germany, but it's not only the one country that we are, have or have to talk about. Of course, UK, we have to talk uh, then a priority for, let's say, creative approach sometimes that uh, even the Minister of Foreign Affairs, David Cameron, was making it sure that uh, talking to her vis-a-vis Analia Barbok, you know, making sure that this request for the exchange of the missiles was never something done before. So it's a very creative approach, you know, the partners thinking about the future of Ukraine and also their future to some extent. Of course, here is the talks about France and uh, his again announcement in the upcoming weeks to still visit uh, Kyiv. As you know, uh, the visit was planned um, to be in February, but then was cancelled. Still, after the um, talks with Volodymyr Zelensky himself with President Macron, make sure that uh, President Macron will um, make it happen. So we will literally think that this visit is not only political momentum, of when uh, France and Ukraine signed the security assurances, but it's a kind of a concrete what we say, how these security assurances are making sure they are transformed into the action plan. Action plan with concrete deadlines, con uh, concrete, uh, let's say, uh, indicators, you know, and a concrete cooperation in this sense. Uh, we know that uh, our partners from the Baltic states and Poland are making uh, their efforts to do so as well. And uh, it's not a secret that the Baltic states' representatives, in particular Estonia is now, where Yusuf Kit is coming from, uh, is uh, um, elaborating the framework for the security assurances with Ukraine. So something that we expect more countries uh, in a nutshell in March, April and May to sign uh, with Ukraine the security assurances, which are sometimes politically said as security guarantees, but to make sure that it's not some, somehow the same thing uh, that we are talking about. And um, we have to mention also one more partner, which is um, definitely from the Scandinavian and Sweden and Finland and Norway, <clears throat> so three uh, countries from the, um, let's say, Scandinavian profile, which important to mention not only Finland, but uh, now Sweden, uh, Sweden is a member of the NATO, so we do have um, uh, the Baltic states uh, being protected by what we say NATO lake. Uh, so the cooperation with this country intensifies with Ukraine, also with security assurances, but also military aid that these countries are providing. But on the south side from uh, what we say the old members of the EU, Italy is one of the very interesting partner now trying to liberate its framework, uh, not only politically, but also, as we understand, economically, how to boost presence uh, of uh, its efforts. Uh, uh, and um, just on another side, um, very important question here to answer is not only the military aid, but how Ukraine will be able to economically recover. When we're talking about the procurement uh, system and, of course, uh, the um, how the uh, ammo, if we talk about the ammo, let's say, uh, um, should be produced and then supplied to Ukraine, it takes definitely time. And the preparation for that should have been started, which is the case. But it's true that uh, uh, those, uh, um, let's say, uh, ammos that already been delivered to Ukraine, they were in stock of the countries that were providing them and they vacated their stock, that's for sure. That's why uh, EU is thinking about uh, enhancing their industrial defense capacity, as we know. And there is also the strategy to do that, and uh, there is also an idea to have a special commission on that, an open office in Kyiv. Uh, what stops that? Well, interest, definitely, as we say, sometimes political interest, uh, because uh, it provokes also the questions simultaneously to many European communities who, as we know, also go on elections, apart from uh, not only uh, United States, potentially UK as well, we don't know, we will know in the upcoming weeks, uh, uh, to explain the question of sub uh, conscription, because if we uh, expand the defense uh, capabilities and 
uh, productions and potentially politicians are not sometimes ready to answer the questions of conscription, for example. So the boosting the uh, production, is it only for Ukraine or is it how, how the, uh, it potentially might be used and for what? Um, the societies uh, are in Europe, I'll be talking in Europe in general, it's on, not only EU, uh, they are very much accommodated with the democracy and sometimes democracy makes it so comfortable, which we definitely understand and that's what Ukrainians truly want. But uh, um, in order to be potentially uh, safeguard this democracy, we need uh, these capabilities to be present. And it also involves training of personnel, uh, because capabilities without personnel and uh, are thinking about logistical chains, uh, uh, how they're going to be uh, supported and supplied, um, uh, that's something that uh, doesn't uh, should be considered as well. Uh, war is mathematics as well, so it's definitely about numbers, how much of what and when. So the time concern, the uh, the volume concern, but also the uh, the times when the production lines can be elaborated. That's something that is on our agenda as well. Um, and to make this very, maybe my uh, vague answer to you, but at the same time with some concrete messages, uh, uh, Ukrainians are very open and we do believe that military production in Ukraine is one of the solutions. But we also need the transition solutions as of now, because in order to win as soon as possible, we need already the solutions uh, to be elaborated and uh, being implemented now. And this term now, it's not as soon as it takes, but it's now already definitely as a very something concrete. So that's why my prospects for 2024, which might be, it is a challenging year for sure, is that when the political leaders are coming to Ukraine and making their discussions, as they are, we are discussing a very concrete action plans in these concerns and in these domains in particular. It's important to remember that the war started 10 years ago, not two years ago, so we actually are into the 11th year of conflict. And after 11 years, with Russia having every advantage, they still only control 20%. Their Air Force and Navy have failed in all of their critical tasks, and half a million Russian soldiers have been killed. So don't, I would not focus so much on yet last year's counteroffensive, but step back from the map and think about where we are. And this was done without a strong, decisive commitment from the United States to help Ukraine win. So I actually am quite optimistic. I think that, you know, Russia is actually in deep trouble. Now, three things. Number one, we have to make it clear that we want them to win, that it is our strategic objective that Ukraine wins. Germany has to do the same thing, make it very clear, and then provide the support that's needed for them to win. Number two, uh, Ukraine needs long-range precision strike capabilities uh, that will enable them to make Crimea untenable and that will neutralize Russia's advantage of mass. That means the capability to destroy artillery, headquarters, logistics, at long range. That's a capability that we should provide them. And then the third thing, Ukraine is going to have to fix their personnel system. They've got enough people, but they don't have enough soldiers. And so this is going to require uh, political decisions, political fixes, changing laws, and then for the government in Kyiv to explain to Ukrainians why they have to get more people to expand the size of the army so that they can have enough units to rotate. First of all, we should recognize that these are threats, muster, and it's a part of the Russian repertoire uh, or their arsenal, just like artillery, just like rockets, is disinformation, constantly threatening people. Um, and I think we in the West should quit overreacting to all of these threats, be firm in our resolve, be clear in our objective, and then push back on it. The Russians will complain every time we do, but they actually only respect strength. When we are, when we cower or we're like, oh, we don't want to provoke, <laughs> that just makes them want to do more. And I don't understand why we still have a hard time uh, 
acting with confidence and decisiveness instead of always worrying that we might provoke them. And we're going to pick up where Ben Hodges left off and we're going to start talking about escalation management, which seems to be a feature of this war, at least amongst some of the allies that are supposedly supporting Ukraine, but not giving Ukraine everything it needs to win. We're going to look at this strategy, what it's founded on, what is restraining the actions of the allies, and how Russian propaganda is potentially manipulating, coercing the allies into not doing what they should. It's an element of fear, there's nuclear terrorism, but we also have to examine what is Putin prepared to do? What is he not prepared to do? Does he in fact have any red lines at all? Sergei, it's great to have this conversation. Uh, it's great to be in Berlin to talk about this. And of course, Germany is one of those countries where it gets a lot of bashing because of tourists and certain systems that aren't supplied. But at the same time, Germany has come on a, an incredible journey over the last two years from initially providing a handful of helmets to now providing some serious uh, hardware and, of course, a very, very large, in volume terms, amount of military support. Well, first, um, where to talk about it? Uh, not in Berlin. Berlin is a symbol, a quintessence of Russian attempts to intimidate, to distract, to distort, to disinform and to subjugate Europe and um, Russian agents, uh, maybe only in Vienna, feel as good as they do in Berlin. Um, and I don't agree that it is Germany bashing, it's more Germany encouraging. We already discussed on the later uh, panel with um, Aaron, uh, with Aaron Bernard that um, after this war has been unleashed, the full-scale war, of course, the war started uh, 10 years ago, but the full-scale invasion has been unleashed by Russia, by Vladimir Putin himself, uh, a lot of countries in the central part of Europe, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, Ukraine, told Germany, said to Germany, send your tanks. Uh, a Polish uh, foreign minister said that uh, the only thing he is afraid more than uh, a strong German army is a weak German army. The Ukrainians who had uh, a terrible experience with German army on their soil, because like our army, Wehrmacht and SS, have killed millions of Ukrainians. 16% of Ukrainian population have been killed during uh, World War II. Uh, the whole territory of Ukraine has been occupied. Uh, like hundreds of uh, towns completely destroyed. The largest massacre on Jews uh, in a single town took place in Kyiv in two days uh, in uh, October uh, 1941. Over 30,000 of Kyiv Jews have been killed. The, the largest destruction of uh, the largest destruction of one city in, uh, in the history of World War II by, uh, by uh, like, uh, soldiers took, in Ukraine, took place in Ukraine, and, and, and. and these people told to, to German chancellor, send the tanks. Send, we want German tanks see rolling towards our, our, our countries because uh, we want us to be protected. And I remember how uh, the Ukrainian Jews, uh, Association of Jewish Communities in Ukraine, published an open letter to Olaf Scholz uh, a couple of weeks before the full-scale invasion and they urged the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and said we are the uh, grandsons and granddaughters of those Jews who survived the Holocaust and we are afraid that we will be killed now in this war and some of them were killed and we ask you German Chancellor to send arms to Ukraine please do not let us be killed and you know what German Chancellor has never answered. And that was the terrifying, absolutely terrifying sign of how Germany did not understand what is going on. So, of course, as you said, a lot of progress has been done. And Germany has no problem now with sending um, artillery, tanks, or 
missiles, like air defense missiles, is the best uh, compromise because it doesn't kill Russian soldiers, but it protects Ukrainian lives. But we still have a lot of problem with sending missiles which can change the, uh, change the situation in this war and bring Russian troops, which are still outnumbered, the Ukrainians, uh, bring the Russian troops in the situation where they cannot bring reserves. Because as you know, the best thing when you hit your enemy is not when the enemy has arrived at the front line and uh, uh, constructed all defensive lines and is in trenches, but when this enemy is on the train or in the road, that is when you need to hit. And that is what Germany is still, okay, German Chancellor, not Germany, he's quite a different man, uh, has not understand or understands, but is not willing to do. That's why no bashing, but encouraging. Let's deconstruct some of the, not just Russian narratives, because that does play a part. Let's deconstruct some of the reasons of why there is reluctance. And this isn't just Berlin. There is, I think, deep reluctance in Washington to give Ukraine everything it needs, um, not just to uh, hold the line. I think, I think there's a, a, a common agreement that holding the line uh, is, is a good thing, um, but to actually retake territory. I think there's a, a reluctance to do that. One, of course, one can say is the fear of escalation. And this is one we need to unpack. And this is really down to fear. This is where Russian narratives are really playing and working, especially the nuclear fear. And we need to unpack that one because I think that that is especially taken seriously in Washington and Berlin, the two capitals that really you know, pay attention to that. For some reason in Britain and, and, and possibly France, I'm not so sure about France, but in Britain we seem to be a little less concerned. We see that as a kind of terroristic threat, which we're not going to be intimidated by. But let's unpack, because I think it's more significant what Berlin and Washington believe. Then you have, and it's the elephant in the room, there's business interests. There is potentially a hope that business will return to normal and that the companies that are either left or are semi-operating or fully operating in Russia will be able to resume their operations and here we go, let's, let's carry on making money. That has to be uh, analyzed there. And then you've just touched upon the third one, which is some misplaced war guilt, but also perhaps a misplaced sense that Putin is the main problem, that Russian is a, you know, Russia is a, a, a deeply humanist country, uh, there are good Russians, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that if only we can give them a chance, th their behavior will change. If they could just get rid of Putin, everything would be fine. Ukrainians have obviously a very different point of view on this. Uh, I'd love to know your point of view. Are these the three main blockers to us supporting Ukraine? Are there other things we need to be considering as well? Well, you have um, touched a lot of topics and uh, we can... I'm happy that we have this eight hours marathon and we can uh, dive deeper in every discussion because it, it really it needs to be discussed in a very academic, if you want, manner with a lot of details and nuances. Um, I would say that, uh, of course, uh, there is this uh, dream in Germany of uh, greater Russia, better Russia, uh, sacred Russia. Um, for many generations of the Germans, there was no such country uh, as Ukraine or, I don't know, Belarus or other, uh, other nations because it was all Russian Empire. And if you look into the, um, into the um, uh, albums uh, with uh, photographs, which German soldiers and German army was most equipped with uh, portable cameras, photo cameras, that's why we know that much about uh, German war crimes because they, they, they made pictures of every war crime they did because they were proud of doing that. And uh, when they... Uh, Not so different from now. I mean, a lot of the Russian war criminals are being uh, found because they're posting on social media. Absolutely, they're... and that is, uh, that is what we see in, in parallels. We see that Putin uses, uh, to large extent, rhetorics of Adolf Hitler with the Lebensraum, with the um, gathering ethnic nationals, with denying right of countries to exist because they allegedly threaten Russia and 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 all these talks about world plutocracy and Washington and they even uh, touch the topic of anti-semitism uh, they attack Zelensky President Zelensky of Ukraine clearly with anti-semitic rhetoric and we know they can touch it later but uh, what is important is that the German soldiers who were in Ukraine during the World War II they normally read that they are in Russia and if we read for example the the diaries of uh, Heinrich Böll, who turned into a pacifist and Nobel Prize, 
uh, winner. Uh, but that time he was a German soldier, and when he was traveling from uh, Chernobyl to Vinnytsia in Ukraine, he uh, read with huge letters in his diary, Russia, and uh, he puts five or six exclamation signs. So for them it was Russia, and uh, the guilt is towards Russia. So, and Ukrainians, who are Ukrainians? Yeah, they are maybe collaborationists, like pro-Nazis, and that fits perfectly into the Russian narrative. So now I want to touch another thing, because there is no aggression caused by Russia which has not been prepared equivocally, very, in a very s sustainable and well-elaborated way for months, if not years. The Russians, before they attack a country, the Russians try to demoralize the possible, uh, not only the, the, the potential victim, but most and foremost, the potential allies. They try to explain that, A, the victim is uh, a danger for Russia. It's a NATO expansion or um, like uh, some anti-Russian Russophobic policy. We don't want to do it, but the Russians are being oppressed. There, Russian language, Russian schools, you name it. Then they want to demonstrate that this country is actually a Nazi country. And the Russians tested it with the Baltic countries already in 27, 28, and all the Balts were Nazis. The Ukrainians are Nazis, all the Nazis. Uh, Zelensky is the Obel Nazi, and uh, that is what they say. But then they try to explain the resistance is meaningless, like it will not help you. We are so strong, that's why all these propaganda uh, videos about the might of the Russian army, we know now it's not true. I actually I ask myself if the might of the Chinese army of the same quality, because we don't know, like the Russians, they had wars without stop. Uh, Transnistria, Georgia 93, Chechnya 94, 2000, Syria, Ukraine 2014. Like they have the whole generation of officers who are fighting and they are still incapable. Russian army didn't fight a war, but that is just a side topic. There's but the famous incident, isn't there? Where uh, US special forces in Syria came up against a, a battalion of Wagnerites uh, and the Russian high command disowned them and said, no, we have no one in the field. And then uh, the US soldiers proceeded to absolutely obliterate them with no equipment and troop losses on the US side. Exactly, that is what happens when uh, the Russian army meets real army. If it is the US army or the Ukrainian army, like they just got obliterated if uh, um, the uh, uh, the opponent has enough weapons, like the Ukrainians with 20 HIMARS, uh, the West provided them, they have stopped the Russian uh, offensive and started the counteroffensive. But uh, if we talk about the pre-war situation, the Russians target our elites and try to spread fears, discord and false hopes. Fears about escalation and consequences, uh, discord uh, smearing the potential victim, and a false hope that you may sign a deal with Russia. That this is not about the whole Ukraine. This is only about Crimea. And Crimea is not that Ukraine, it's Russia, and it's not about Donbass, it's only about parts of Donbass, and we can sign a deal. It's not about the whole Ukraine, it's only Kyiv. It's not about uh, NATO, it's only about Ukraine. And they are using this salami tactic, slicing uh, the, the, uh, uh, slicing the, the victim, so the potential allies think, okay, should we risk a nuclear escalation for Luhansk? Do you know where is Luhansk? Have you ever been there? Why, why risking nuclear bombs falling in, uh, on Berlin or London? When we can just agree that Putin takes that and he's happy. He's not happy. He's never happy. And that is the topic of nuclear escalation. I'm really happy you touched the topic because uh, later in our program I just revealed the secret. We have a special interview on that, uh, German fear and nuclear escalation. But they know that we, especially in Germany, we are absolutely afraid of that. The whole German anti-NATO and anti-US movement in the 1970s, deeply infiltrated by Russian KGB agents, deeply used as assets like absolutely used and infiltrated. But it was based on the idea, uh, better red than dead. We can accept to be slaves, but we don't want to be grilled. And that brings to the idea, yeah, and who is interested in fighting Russia? 
who will be a winner? Maybe they are Americans, they will fight a war on German territory, so we just ask them politely to remove their nukes and they will be neutral and Russia will not attack. No, exactly in that moment Russia attacks, because now I wrap up, Ukraine in 2014 when Russia attacked was the most pro-Russian country among all in Central Europe. Uh, 94% of Ukrainians said that they positively look on Russia. Only 2% say that they think that Russia is an enemy state. Now it's quite the opposite. Ukraine uh, definitely was against NATO membership. Now it's the opposite. And Ukrainian constitution was a ban on any foreign troops stationed on Ukrainian territory, with one exception, Russian troops in Crimea. So if you look at the legal and public legal state and public opinion, Russia would say, why to attack? Like, this country is practically our best ally. But the Russians promote because they were hungry. They wanted to get more. And they started to promote narrative about danger from Ukraine, uh, occupation of Russian lands, uh, oppression of Russian speaking population. And the West bought this. But Russians use it all the time. They use it in 1920s against Poland, in 1940s against the Baltic countries, in uh, 1996 against Chechnya, and now they use it against Ukraine. And Finland, we remember. And this is an interesting example because, of course, um, depends who you speak to. Finland either lost its war against Russia or, or, it, or it won. I mean, uh, and, and people will say, well, obviously it lost a lot of land. It lost its third largest city. The Karelia uh, Peninsula was lost. It was a fantastic area of uh, ecological beauty. Russia gained a lot. But at the same time, Finland was able to demonstrate that you're going to get punched in the face. You come here, we're, we're not going to just sort of let you get away with this. You're going to be punched in the face and you're going to get a bleeding nose. And Stalin accepted that. And that, that, that idea that your adversary can hit you back with force um, seems to be the only thing that, um, this is going to sound crude, that the, the Russia understands. It understands the power of force and then it will negotiate. It, it will try to exact a high price, but it will negotiate with you as a genuine partner rather than trying to bypass you. And at the moment, it's clearly trying to bypass Ukraine. It doesn't want to be seen to be negotiating with it because it does not want to consider it as an entity with agency. It sees potentially, it genuinely sees Ukraine as a US puppet. In fact, it may well see all European countries as a puppet of the US. We're in Berlin and it sort of struck me as we crossed the city this morning, why did Russia not carry on advancing after the Second World War? And that's because we show determination not to let West Berlin fall to Russian threats. Once they realized that we had the will, determination, and the force to back it up, they accepted that reality and then moved on to try and fight somewhere else. Do you see an analogy in this? Because this talks very much to this idea of escalation management. Uh, history tends to show that actually it's more about projecting your will, projecting force and creating a physical barrier to Russian aggression. That's the only thing that works. The aggression doesn't stop, it just tries to find a weak area rather than the strength you've projected. Absolutely, and what you uh, mentioned with Finland, it's a classic like porcupine tactic, like you cannot win a fight against a tiger, but you may grow so much needles that it will at a certain moment stop trying to attack you because like he's full of the, his face is uh, full and his uh, tongue is full of uh, your needles and you also get scared and you get probably can get even injured, but you survive. And uh, that is the only thing that Russia um, understands since uh, decades when um, the opponent fights back and Russia uh, tries either to find other tactics. If they don't work, they just look for the next weak opponent. It is what Lenin uh, wrote, um, and from this point of view, I, I urge everyone to read Lenin because he exposed the whole nature of Russian foreign policy. He was the, the creator of it to a certain extent. He said, we shall check their readiness with bayonets. If the bayonets hits the steel, we retreat. If the bayonets hits the, 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 uh, the grass, we advance. Mm -hmm. And that is what they did with Poland. They got hit in Poland. Uh, they, they disappeared in like, 1920. They disappeared for like almost 20 years. 
There was no Russian attacks on Poland, of course, after that, when they agreed with uh, Hitler and when there was the, this Russia-Nazi-Germany pact and they combined uh, jointly attack uh, Poland. Uh, it was quite another situation, but they grew up muscles and they found other dictatorships as alliances. That is their tactics. And we need to understand that um, the, the Western approach to Russia and when we, as we in Berlin, we talk about the German approach. It was this uh, Wandel durch Handel, change through trade. And the basic idea was that nations which have trade, they got closer, they have contacts, they understand each other better, they don't attack. And the change really happened, but not on the side of Russia, as we hoped. The change happened here in Germany. And it is understandable, because when you have your business active in a dictatorship, you're a democracy and you're dependent on what your people think about you. And if your businesses who have their interest, and not everyone is interested in politics, they say, okay, we can earn like 5%, 15% a year uh, if we have good relations, but if we have bad relations, we maybe not earn anything and even have losses. So I will pressure my government to have good relations with that guy. I don't care about democracy. I don't care about strategic peace, etc. I want my money. And, in, uh, and your government accepts that uh, because they have elections. But in Russia, in a dictatorship, and we do now the same mistake with China, in a dictatorship, they can order their businesses to keep quiet. They can tell them, okay, you have losses. It's what your job is to have. I am a sovereign, I am a monarch. I run the business. And if I want all of your property to fund it, I will take it. And you just shut up. And that is what Russia did. They, of course, the economy is fallen. Of course, the whole industries are being destructed. Their planes cannot fly. Their uh, citizens get so much overcredited now because they cannot pay their debts. But it's calm in the country because it's a dictatorship. And we believe that if we buy Russian gas, Russia is as interested in, in our money as we in their gas. No. They used it as a weapon. They just cut the delivery of gas and they destroyed their own pipeline just to provoke unrest here in Germany. For Putin, like a couple of billion euro was not interesting enough compared to political destruction of Germany. And they hope that we have here public unrest, burning streets, scores, like maybe if like some ethnic riots appear, it's even better because you can broadcast it on the whole world and say, look, the German society is falling. Russia is a bastion of stability. And that is what the German politicians never understood. They believe that Putin is as shot a person like a department chief from a provincial city. Yes, he was once in Petersburg, but he's much more than that. He's a ruthless criminal, manipulator and psychopath. And this exposes, I think, some, some fundamental misconceptions uh, about how Russia operates and a fundamental view of the world. So we're projecting onto them the idea that they are as economically rational as we are. And I see this a lot in some of the arguments people make about why Russia invaded Ukraine in the first place. And people still insist, ah, oh, this is all about resources. The you know, US is only interested because there's gas deposits, mineral deposits, blah, blah, blah. Russia's only really interested because, and then they list all the wealth and assets that Ukraine has that Russia uh, can take, ignoring the idea that Russia is purposefully destroying the entire industrial base. It has got a scorched earth policy. It, it doesn't care if anything's left standing. It doesn't seem to care if the territory is economically productive or workable. And this is gonna be controversial. When Germany took territories in the Second World War, they did not raise everything to the ground unless there was strong resistance. And we know in Warsaw they did eventually, but generally they wanted to try and keep the industrial base intact because they wanted to use it. They wanted to extract wealth from it to power their war machine. Russia doesn't seem to work on the same economic rationality, but we act as if they do. Well, um, I would not agree here with you. I'd say the Russians do the same. Um, they also extremely interested in making their wars profitable. Or just look during the first eight years of uh, Russia-Ukraine war, uh, the Russians dismantled and deported to Russia almost every single factory in Donbas. And they even made 
are TV stories on state TV about that, how they evacuate the factories. By the way, they exactly the same way they made protocols of their crimes on deportation of Ukrainian children. And Putin himself delivered a testimony on TV talking to Maria Lvova Belova, his chief kidnapper. Uh, and Putin gave her an order to kidnap Ukrainian children and deport them. That's why Putin got a warrant, uh, an arrest warrant from the International Criminal Court. But uh, back to the economy, uh, of course they try to exploit territories, of course they, they, they want to steal everything. They uh, have stolen uh, every piece of cultural heritage of Ukraine, uh, from Mariupol, the whole museum of uh, painters, world-class paintings like Quinji was just uh, brought to Moscow and Petersburg to Hermitage. And I, I really cannot understand how uh, European museums still can cooperate with Hermitage, saying culture is uh, above the politics. No, it's like you are cooperating with a Nazi a museum director who just uh, taken all the Jewish property or Polish property, etc. No, he's a war criminal. And exactly the Russians tried to get access to Crimean gold, which was an exhibition in the Netherlands, a Scythian gold, and uh, thanks God, after two years of, of uh, court uh, process of court uh, decision was that this uh, gold must return not to Crimea occupied by Russia, but to uh, Ukrainian territory. Uh, so they try to do it, but what you write, absolutely, and I cannot repeat it enough, uh, the Russians have another economic rationality than we. They are ready because they think in the uh, concept of value of violence and ability to cause pain. Because they think that only ability to cause you pain and in, on the maximum, the top, to kill you, painfully, uh, is the best way to control you. So that's why they are willing to play even a negative sum game than zero sum game or positive sum game when they see that their opponent suffers more. Um, so a German politician would say, okay, I can have an outcome like you get uh, 10 euro after this round and I get like 2 euro and another outcome is you get like 0, I uh, get 1 and maybe it's better for me to get 2 because 2 is better than 1. So I will be in the first uh, outcome, I will have less money than you, but in the second outcome I will have more money than you, but I will have less money than they could have got. The Russians say, in the first outcome, I suffer minus one, you suffer minus two. In the second outcome, I suffer minus ten, but you suffer minus hundred. I take the second one. Because it will make you so weak that next turn I come and just take all what you have. And that is what they do. Of course, they wanted to occupy Ukraine within three days. Of course, they wanted to fully integrate the Ukrainian economy. And they they need Ukrainian technologies, they need Ukrainian missile production, uh, rocket engine production, helicopters production. Remember how they, they tried to, to put, and Chinese tried also to put under control, the Zaporizhia uh, helicopter engine plant. Uh, of course they need it all. Ukraine has a lot of population, and Russians wanted to re-educate them and use them as cannon fodder. But as soon as they see we cannot take it, we better destroy it, they say because it doesn't, it may not get into hands of the enemy. And enemy is everyone who is not Russia. And you know, we see them, uh, coming back to your point earlier, they label everyone as Nazis who shows any willingness to resist. To an extent, if they also, well, they clearly miscalculated on the reaction of the Ukrainian people as a whole. They miscalculated uh, what the people in the so-called Russian-speaking areas would react. They expected to be embraced, uh, to have people coming out on the streets and welcome them. None of that happened in any areas really where they occupied. Um, didn't their perception potentially go from seeing um, some Ukrainians as potential material they could work with to increasingly seeing Ukrainians as something to be feared and destroyed, and we, we start to see that behavior in Irpin, Butcher, and others, it seems to go beyond just the envy uh, and cruelty of individual soldiers to a realization that, that we're never going to control these people, we're never going to control this land, it's going to cause us endless pain. We kind of miscalculate, right, well, let's just, let's just destroy anybody who uh, is going to be resisting us. Well, um, once again, excellent question. And 
of course, uh, the Ukrainian society has demonstrated incredible level of resistance. And uh, from this perspective, I can only repeat uh, the popular saying of a Ukrainian soldier. Uh, it's, uh, like, it's very good for us. We're lucky that the Russians are so stupid. Uh, so the Russians did that. They, 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 they went, uh, the first days, they went into Ukraine with, without any proper protection, uh, with all the columns of trucks, uh, without armor. Uh, they, they, they brought a musical orchestra with them because they believed that in two days there will be a celebration on Kreshatik in Kyiv. Uh, they, they brought tanks uh, without camouflage, but in a parade with parade stickers with the St. Georg's band. Because they, they, they thought we just, okay, we go this 100 kilometer, uh, everyone salutes us, and, and we have taken the city. They even called the, the Kiev restaurants in front of that, and they have been that call. They, they called Kiev restaurants to book uh, tables in a restaurant for celebration. Um, and that didn't happen. But do not underestimate the ability of cruel dictatorships and of totalitarian societies. And Russia is a totalitarian society, it's not a dictatorship, it's a totalitarian society the abilities of these societies to digest and absorb people. If you take, they, they, they have all the means for that. There is in the West the idea that uh, a guerrilla war cannot be won because you cannot fight the population. Of course you cannot fight the population if you're a democracy. Like you burn like several villages and uh, it causes that much damage to your credibility that, and for right, you just arrest the soldiers, you put them to, you court martial them, and the, 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 your public opinion says just go away of that. But dictatorships, they don't have that problem. And if you give them enough time, they will digest any nation. They will torture them, they will kill deliberately people who, who resist or who think differently, they will reeducate children, they will take children from family, and, and, and. And don't forget, Despite all the resistance which existed in Ukrainian society up to 1990s against the Soviet occupation, most of Ukrainians were integrated into the Soviet army, into the Soviet structures. Of course they were not happy, they were not the best Soviets. But the Soviets used them to occupy Afghanistan, to occupy Czechoslovakia, to do other things. And Russia wants to have it. That's why they kidnap children, they bring them to the military camp and they re-educate them because they know that on the long run you have one generation, you have two generations and you win because you're cruel, you're reckless. And that is what they did in Chechnya, in Ichkeria. Chechnya, Ichkeria won the first war against Moscow with incredible costs and without any Western support, only with light arms, with firearms and RPGs. But then Russians regained. They signed even the peace treaty with Masada. They promised autonomy. In two years they violated it. They entered again with new army, with new troops, highly motivated troops. They occupied the country. They imposed incredible level of violence with organized rape, with organized kidnapping, with organized torture, with execution of the whole families, and and and. And now what we see, some Chechens in exile are against Kadyrov, some are for Kadyrov and many Chechens are fighting in Ukraine for Putin. You can re-educate people, even the bravest one, and dictatorships want to re-educate the bravest and the cleverest and the most clever ones, because they know they need capable soldiers. And the best soldiers in the Soviet army were Ukrainian soldiers. And that's what Putin wants, that is the resource he wants to get. And we forget that this strategy has been tried over and over and over again. Uh, Hungary wasn't just beaten by uh, Russian troops. They used the uh, other countries' populations against it. Even more so in Czechoslovakia in 1968, uh, it was attacked by the combined forces of the Warsaw Pact. Again, not just Russian soldiers. So this is a tactic that has worked for Russia over and over again. Absolutely. And look, when um, I, I, I really like, I, I, I really sick and tired listening in Germany to some guys, sometimes girls, who are, who think that they are over smart. Mm -hmm. And they think, look, we have a creative idea. Like the moment when, when a German politician do, does know, doesn't understand what is going around, he comes up with a creative idea. And it says, why don't we just like sign some sort of treaty with Russia? And once again, it's very good to trade what is not yours. 
sign some treaty with Russia, we accept this um, front line, it's frozen, and we don't recognize the sovereignty of Russia over that regions, which Russia occupies, uh, as we did with the Baltic states in 1940. But then we'll pump a lot of money into Ukraine, and the people on the occupied territories will see that uh, Ukraine is flourishing, and one day, in two generations, they will join it like Germany united. Like Germany in 1990, fall of the Berlin Wall, close to the studio, and we'll be happy. Okay, uh, nothing can demonstrate the arrogance and the ignorance of the German politicians more than that. First, they ignore the reason why Germany was portioned. Like there was some tiny little thing like World War II and genocide and death camps and, and uh, everything. So Germany was portioned actually as a result of World War II, as a, partly as a punishment, partly as a guarantee that there will be no war anymore from German land. That's why Germany was occupied. Like, what did Ukraine do to, to let Ukraine be occupied? But the second thing is, okay, like, putting aside the uh, topic of guilt, is it realistic to keep peace with that sort of deal? No. First, there is no guarantee that Putin will not start the war in two years, when he gets more missiles from Iran, from North Korea, maybe from China. He builds new tanks, he conscripts new people, he trains new troops, he buys more European politicians, he organized some, some sabotage acts in, uh, in Ukraine, and here he comes again. And what will happen to the population? Despite all the cru cruelty of the Soviet regime on the Eastern German territory, and despite all the cruelty of the communist regime in the GDR, there was no plan of the Soviets, even under Stalin, to genocidally erase the German nation. They wanted to re-educate them, they wanted to have us as um, loyal citizens of that country, as slaves, as vassals, you name it, but they didn't want to eradicate us. They didn't want us to be Russians. And the Russians want Ukrainians to cease to exist. So you practically punish Ukraine in this plan for what Ukraine has never done and without any feasible, realistic perspective of stable peace. So maybe you just like go back to your uh, Hamburg tax office where Scholz belongs, and it didn't went well, we know it, uh, and, and, and stop talking about world politics because you clearly don't understand. But of course, the German politician always knows how to fix any country in the world. And let's take a step back because there is this unfortunate assumption that seems to be built into a lot of the calculus uh, in many Western countries that first Putin will be satisfied with Crimea, then he'll be satisfied with Donbass. Okay, maybe he's not satisfied with those. He'll be satisfied with Ukraine as a whole. That's the limit of his ambitions. And what we're essentially placing on is not just the limit on his ambitions, but a limit on the methods he's prepared to use, the escalatory ladder he's prepared to go on to achieve his aims. And this is where it gets a little bit speculative, but we see absolute chaos in the Middle East. Now, whether Russia is or isn't behind it, whether they knew the date, the time, the scale or not, is highly debatable. What is not is that the world's focus on the Middle East, on the chaos happening there, and now the Houthis, um, uh, sabotaging you know trade routes and so on what's quite clear is that benefits Russia because it takes the focus off Ukraine and it takes the focus on what their Wagnerite forces are doing in Africa and the many other arenas around the world where Russia is quite clearly directly trying to sow chaos or where chaos is beneficial to Moscow's interests well, I, I agree with you again, and of course, uh, that is the part of Russia's strategy. They want you to believe, as a Western politician, that the, there is something terrible in the room which can happen, what can happen. And you can prevent it by accepting a much lesser evil, and even evil on costs of a country which is not a real one and which is a bad one, a Nazi country, bad, corrupt, Nazi country. And that's actually another one narrative the Russians spread about Ukraine, the corruption. 
like those people who purchased our chancellor, uh, who purchased uh, Austrian foreign minister, French foreign minister, they are talking about corruption in Ukraine. So the Russians come with a more or less a proposition to you. Uh, it comes, they, they combine their force because it's dictatorship. They uh, come in a coordinated way, but you as a democracy think that it is just the public opinion because the academ academia comes to you, foreign minister comes to you, uh, their experts come to you, your businessmen come to you, and they all say, you, they, uh, you have actually two choices. Uh, you can face a global war, or you can accept that Russia takes a tiny little part of a country which you don't even know where it is and it will be over. And then it goes further and further and further, of course. And that is a trick which actually every street criminal knows. Every street criminal knows. There are like two ways of street criminals attacking. First one, they need to create a pretext for attack. Like they, they come across the, uh, like uh, in, in front of you and provoke some collision. And then they start to attack you, like blaming you for the collision. As a polite man, you try to explain, no, I didn't want to do it, sorry. But they don't need your apologies. They need to create the situation when you are already in a weak position. And then they rob you or they maybe steal something from you because while you're arguing with them, a complete steals your money back. But it is a faked escalation. They want, they want to, they know they want to escalate and they know you will try to find a compromise, but they're not interested in compromise. But they're also testing you. Because if at that point you don't apologize, Absolutely. but you say, what the hell are you doing? Get out of my face. That for them is a signal. Then they disappear. You know? Then they disappear. Yeah. And, the, and the, the second strategy is typical for fraudsters. They never start with you a talk with like, transfer me $1 million to die to an, like some account. No, they say, we have a great deal and you can get like five million or I have a great uh, delivery of goods, but I need like to pay a fee and could you transfer me like 200 euro, 300 euro? And they say, oh, sorry, there is like another delay, like the custom officers needs to be bribed and could you transfer me like another 500 euro? And say, wow, like the, the profit is that big and I have already sent like 300 euro. What makes a difference if I send another 50 euro, 200 euro? It makes no difference. And at the end, you see it. Uh, on a deal which never was intended to be, you have paid like 5,000 or 20,000 euro bills. And we know a case when people paid millions like that, millions, and you get nothing. Because it is the fallacy of sunk costs, because you know I have already invested that much and I will invest one more. And that is what Putin is doing. He is saying uh, to us, look, uh, the uh, Dilemma is very simple. A little bit of Ukraine or a huge thermonuclear war. What do you choose? But it's a false, it's a false choice. And you need to answer him, you know what I choose? I choose delivery of terrorist missiles to Ukraine and every single year oil refinery is being hit. And then we look what happens next. And we're not playing, we're not playing their game. Um, you know, um, they'll do these things. I got a faulty earpiece there. I'm just going to let that fall down here. Um, so we also have to do things in the open. We have to be seen as democracies and sometimes we overshare what we're about to do uh, and what we intend to do, what we don't intend to do. We've seen Biden right from the start of this war sort of spelling out what they're not going to do but not spelling out what they are going to do. The only exception to that of course was to send a uh, attack them, limited quantity, but send them and not say anything about it. Give them a chance to kind of work. Now, if we were going to tackle the propagandistic threats, we would adopt some of their techniques, which is to say maybe, no, we're not going to do this, but then do it anyway. And just create that uncertainty on their side about what we will and what we won't do. But we have this extraordinary transparency for some reason, we think that's how you should work on the international stage. In some ways, we are still positioning, or ask you the question as a question, are we still positioning Russia and thinking of it as a country that operates, you know, foreign policy diplomacy in the way that it's operated and international relations in the way it's operated in the West. And yet what we're dealing with is a gopnik, to use wow. your phrase. Um, look, let me put it that way. Uh, when Russia, and I come back to my, to my favorite topic, when Russia starts to 
uh, prepare to the next war. They want to delegitimize de de the opponent. And that's why all the Putin's um, saying about like Ukraine is not a country, never existed, Lenin created it, uh, like the, the territory is not legally uh, realistic. Um, then he created the narrative that the Ukrainian state doesn't exist anymore because Yanukovych left the country and that means that the Ukrainian statehood is not existent anymore. That means that no treaty with Ukraine um, uh, needs to be respected and, and, and. So they try to create some false discussions with false narratives, uh, trying to put them in a quasi-legalistic way. So we start saying, oh, interesting, what was the year Ukraine was created? Oh, does, it, does it say that uh, Ukraine may be attacked by an older country? What says Professor uh, this one and Professor this one? Let's make a TV show about it. At the same time, the Russians, they create um, a mythology of own greatness and own ancient character. And from this perspective, everything what happened somehow being related to Moscow or Petersburg is being called Russia. Ukrainian artists who created their art during the Soviet occupation or tsarist occupation, they are Russian artists. But Ukrainian nationalists who allegedly cooperated with Hitler are, of course, Ukrainian. And then Russia says, yeah, we have like 1,000 years of history. Now, the, superior, the Supreme Council of the Soviet Union stated in their document on 31st December 1990 that the Soviet Union, as a subject of international law, has ceased to exist. Not transited to Russian Federation. Ceased to exist. And Russian Federation was proclaimed as a new state, new entity. Yes, they claim that they have all the rights of the Soviet Union, but it's not the same legal entity. Only um, after that. Now they say, no, it was all the Russian history with the Tsars, with Katharina II, with Peter I, and even further to Kiev at times, uh, before Moscow was founded. And like the word Russia was invented in 17 something by Peter the First as he uh, used the Greek term. Ignoring that Novgorod was a separate republic. Yeah, it was, it was, republic, it was, not even a monarchy it was at that time. Hanseatic yes. state, Hanseatic, mm -hmm. together with uh, Gdansk, together with, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Szczecin, together with, uh, with Hamburg and Bremen. So then they say, yeah, like uh, Moscow was founded in uh, 1147, uh, but Kiev, uh, which had adopted Christianity on the whole country in uh, 988, it is still Russia. And they are all Russian. That's why they, they are so obsessed of stealing cultural artifacts. When the Soviets destroyed the St. Michael's Cathedral in uh, Kiev, so-called Golden Dome Cathedral, what they did as the first, they have stolen mosaics. They have stolen the mosaics from the Byzantine time and brought them to Moscow. Uh, the same they, they do everywhere. They just took it and bring it to, to Moscow and then explain it, declare it as Russia. And what is interesting, the so-called good Russians, the liberal Russians, the Russians who oppose Putin, do the same. We have now, in these days, in France, a film exhibition uh, celebrating, or not celebrating, like honoring the memory of Alexei Navalny who was a brave person, who was an opponent of Putin, who was brutally tortured and murdered, yes, and that is terrible and illegal, but who was Russian, I'm not saying imperialist, but a person who wanted to see Russia great and other countries around as brotherly nations, if not subjugated, and at least slightly guarded by Russia and guided by Russia. So what they do? They took the most important Ukrainian movie, from the 70s, the shadows of forgotten ancestors, created in taught in, not even in Ukrainian language, in a Carpathian dialect of Ukrainian language, which not every Ukrainian understands, created by a Georgian-born Armenian director who identified himself partly as a Ukrainian, who lived in Ukraine, who was arrested by the Soviets for Ukrainian nationalism, and finally died because of the oppression and everything and his film was banned because of Ukrainian nationalism. So what do the good Russians do now, these Navalny Russians? They take this movie which is the quintessence of an amazing movie. If someone hasn't seen it, I recommend it. It's an amazing movie. 
uh, they take it, they translate it into Russian. And they present it as a Russian culture which opposes Putin. No, it's not Russian culture. It's Ukrainian culture, if you want. It's Armenian, Georgian, Ukrainian culture. It was opposing Russia. And Parajanov, who was uh, the, the director of this movie, who was arrested by the Soviets for Ukrainian nationalism and was humiliated, he was never being a Russian. And this movie, you, you have stolen this movie for your purpose and you have appropriated it in the worst colonialist manner. And you try to fool the West and it is the sign of that fact that you are the same imperialists as Putin. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's that centerpiece of theft, appropriation, which comes from a position of envy. And this is interesting where you have, um, you know, geopolitical schools of thought. You have people trying to look at it in terms of these big geopolitical rational ideas. But I think the idea of envy, theft, uh, violence, these are much better explainers of what's going on. Power, control, coercion, these are far more sort of primitive um, attributes of the state. And you have to go back, I think, way before, not just you know, Middle Ages, you have to go back far further to something far more um, atavistic based on the figure of the Tsar, who is the ultimate, not just the ultimate power, but the ultimate owner of everything. Absolutely. The Nikolai II, the second Rush, last Russian emperor, um, when uh, they organized some census in, in Russia, and one of the questions was, uh, like, what is your job? And the question was asked the Tsar himself and said, like, I am a owner of Russian land. So he was like the owner. And but what is uh, really interesting in the, from, this, from this perspective, how uh, Russia tries to appropriate everything including food, including music. When you look at Russian official uh, concerts, uh, militarist propaganda concerts, it's not the single case. They took, for every of these concerts since years, they took Ukrainian music, the music from Maidan, the music of military, military songs. They just write Russian songs, uh, Russian letters, uh, Russian, Russian texts, sorry, but they use the songs like uh, a Pliva Kacha, an amazing song honoring fallen Ukrainian soldiers, was appropriated by that. And it's not only Putin, once again, if you see, after Alexei Navalny was brutally killed by Putin, uh, the, the most important Russian liberal, allegedly, a TV channel, TV Rain, TV Dost, uh, posted a banner with Navalny's uh, photo and with a slogan, Heroes Never Die. But heroes never die is a slogan, heroi never marae, is a slogan which is being used by the Ukrainians from the time of Maidan when the first Ukrainian uh, patriot and Armenian ethnically, Sergei Nigoyan, was killed by a sniper on Maidan. And that slogan, the heroes never die, accompanies almost every remembering um, event of the fallen Ukrainian soldiers. So they just took the slogan and they claim it, it's their own. Uh, and they, they, they sell it to the West. When you look at the Russian, the Russians have created the whole propaganda pages. Like they had like all these English speaking pages, not only Russia Today, but a lot of them. And they just posted the uh, allegedly uh, innocent things like uh, 10 dishes you need to taste in Russia. And then like when you go through that, you say, okay, uh, there's no Russian dish there. It's the Ukrainian borscht or Georgian um, hinkali or Tatar's manti or Bashkiran Tatar chak chak sweet, etc. But they say, look, we have that rich culture. Everything what is good is Russian. The, the nations should be happy that we have occupied them. And now we come to a very interesting moment because I love very much um, a German uh, Kazakh uh, professor and sociologist and historian. Uh, Bota Koska Sambekova, uh, who teaches, I think, in uh, University of Basel or Bern, I'm not sure here. And she wrote a lot of articles on Russian colonialism, how it works. And they say the West doesn't see Russian colonialism because we know the British colonialism. We know, like, the German colonialism, okay, we, we try to hide it. We never speak about, like, uh, Namibia and stuff. But we had it, like, overseas colonialism. And the idea was you come to the country, you establish a rule, you use resources, including manpower, and you separate from the locals. You don't want to be identified with them. You want to be uh, like a supervisor, a lord there. 
And that is the colonialism, you know, like first people of different skin color or different appearance and you separate from them, but you exploit them. The Russians do it opposite. They occupy the country, they eradicate the elites, they eradicate writers, uh, they eradicate some type of religion and they want to integrate the rest, erase the nation, erase the language, erase the culture, rename the cities. They always rename the cities. They destroy cemeteries, they destroy like uh, churches, mosques, and then they claim the land as their own. Like, you have never lived here. That's why it's hard for, for, for the West to understand Russian colonialists. They say, yeah, it's not colonialists because Russians marry Tatars, Russians are like live there, Russians uh, eat their food, etc. Uh, there are no Tatars as a nation, like it's a part of Russian nation. No, it's a nation which has been colonized, partly destroyed, partly eliminated, and then uh, the Russians try to integrate them. With Tatars and Bashkirs, the bigger nations, they're not as successful as much, but some nations like Erzia or Moksha or, or, or others, Akomi, uh, they are almost not existent anymore. And that is how Russian colonialism works. And it's extraordinary, isn't it? Because I remember my time in um, the 90s where there is a certain amount of, I'd call it, sentimentality, not placing Ukrainian culture, humor, etc., on the same level as Russian, but on a folk level, you can have a certain amount of sentimentality towards it. You can look at it as a, as a sort of little, little brotherly nation, etc. That changes, though, doesn't it? As long as those people are subservient and acquiescent, you can, you can have fond feelings for them as long as it's kind of measured and limited. The minute they try to take their culture back, take their resources back and resist that, we flip into they're all Nazis mode. And this is where Ukraine is at the moment, regaining its agency, regaining its history. Um, that is a process you get the impression of when you speak to any Ukrainian and the personal journeys they've been on uh, whether it be perhaps sort of, you know, starting to use the Russian language less and use Ukrainian more, discovering Ukrainian literature the first time, discovering their family history, you get this sense of Maidan being a, a spark of political awareness, but it goes in parallel with the rediscovery of language, culture, history, and so on. How threatening is that process to Russia? It's absolutely, it's a death sentence to Russian imperialism. And I agree that for many Ukrainians, uh, even 10 years ago, or five years ago, it wasn't obvious for many of them, not for all, but for many. And I personally know people who serve in the Ukrainian army and came as volunteers, who said to me, look, I, I volunteered like in early 22, but before that, I didn't understand what is the difference. Okay, we can use Russian language, we can consume Russian uh, culture products like movies, uh, TV series, uh, books, etc. What is the difference? And now they say, I understand how it works. Because first the Russians, like, they, they substitute your product with the Russian one, and then they start to sell you the Russian narratives. And then the Ukrainian writers from Ukraine have no chance to publish their books because there is no market for it, because market has been consumed by the, the, the Russian published analysis, and it comes step to step. And sometimes in one movie, you have like the only bad person who is Ukrainian. It's nothing against Ukrainians, but it happens that the only negative person in the movie is a Ukrainian. And in another one, like there are saints about like Russian history, military history in Odessa or Kherson, and it is the only thing which is being put on the front of that movie. And that like, that is the level of intoxication. And uh, of course, uh, not every Ukrainian saw that because you need to have a special, you need to have education, you need to study, you need to have time, you need to have a privilege of think about it. But now it's very obvious because the Russians came to Ukraine with their body armors where it was written, speak Russian or die. And that's a pretty straight into your face sentence. So. Having seen this take place, and I think there's a huge, and we're going to talk about disinformation later, there's a huge gap between the reality, the most documented war in history, the most documented genocidal behavior, perhaps in history as well, and Western policymakers who are, in my view, not fully talking about and recognizing that depth of disgusting behavior and the full depth of the aggression and where it might lead. We are still limiting it to, well, they've done this and this, but that's okay. That's it. Let's just bring a sort of stasis into this situation. They're not thinking forward into, well, what next? What are they prepared to do? How far will this go? 
My view is Putin will do almost anything, not just to win, but to survive. You know, like I always I already quoted Lenin in this talk. I now want to quote Marx, which is not very typical for me. And uh, Karl Marx um, wrote a lot of articles on a Crimean War in 1850s. And on the other quotes which I love from Marx, he says that the Russian bear is capable for everything as long as he knows that other nations are capable of nothing. And in this sentence, I'm a Marxist, because that is exactly what we see in Russian behavior since Decades, and that's what, what what Putin is doing. Like, of course, they want to sell narratives that Bucha was an excess, and it was like it were not even Russians; it were Buryats, like all the Buryats of Dagestani, not the Russians, or like that it will never, uh, like Mariupol never happened. We rebuilt it, we reconstruct. Look what beautiful is now the car station in Mariupol. They have stolen pictures of some German car station, like bus station, and posted it as new Mariupol bus station. Uh, that's what they do. And of course, there are many people in Germany who say, yeah, because like Russians cannot be that bad because it is we Germans who were bad and no other nations can be that bad. But look, the, the banality of evil is, as Hannah Orin said, that actually everyone is capable for evil as long as it is being encouraged. And the Russian um, cultural, political, so social narrative encourage people extensively to do evil things. And that's why it's not enough to just change Putin for anyone who's good. Putin was actually very good in his speeches in the first years. He spoke for press freedom, elections, free elections, cooperation with the West, and, and, and. But was it what he really thought about? I don't believe so. That's why it's important to completely reorganize the Russian society or Deter it if we don't want to intervene. Deter it with all means. Because just saying, okay, Putin will go and another one come, who will come? Medvedev. We have seen what he tweets. He's not a guy with an iPhone and deep purple music. He's a genocidal psychopath. And that is what the Russian system demands from the people to keep this country as a one piece. Well, we see what we want to see, and in 2001 it suited us to see Russia as an ally because of the war on terror, because of our own wishful thinking, but already in 2001, 2003, it was quite clear that Putin was dismantling the independent media, uh, piece by piece, uh, using one oligarch against another, one network against another, and you know, it's the same salami slicing, divide and conquer tactics. They are already fully in evidence at the time. Not many voices pointing it out, but that was already happening there. So they controlled the narrative. They controlled how we were reacting to Russia and hiding their intentions. They're not hiding their intentions now, but they are still seeking to coerce and control our actions. Let's look at some of the areas where Russian narratives, Russian manipulation is preventing the supply of weapons and finance. Let's tackle in particular the F-16s, which never seem to arrive. The attackums, long-range attackums, which are crucial. We've talked about Taurus already. But there's also the issue of Russian central bank assets. And I know you touched on this earlier, but they're still seeding narratives that if you take those funds, you will destroy your credibility as a financial system. You'll do this, you'll do that. This coming from a state that is already confiscating foreign assets, has already put a legislation in place that will allow them to confiscate the assets of their own citizens. Uh, essentially, there's, there was no rule of law, but now that lawlessness is enshrined in law, if that makes sense. Well, um, I agree. Um, and what we um, witnesses to during the Putin's um, development and his evolution as a dictator, of course, the West ignored it. Uh, and here in Germany, I can say about uh, Germany, we have seen the case of uh, like anti-Americanism, which played a huge role. Like, look what the Americans did in Iraq. It's much worse than the Russians did in Chechnya. Look at the free media, Snowden, Assange, like blame the US, Russians are good people. And uh, the Russians use it, of course. But regarding the wellness, we still have, I think I need to wrap it up, uh, we still have a lot of people in Germany 
on the politician level who made their career preaching understanding of Russia and anti-Americanism and anti-NATO and anti-capitalism. It's actually weird that they see Putin as a champion of anti-capitalistic force, the arch-capitalistic leader. And they need to preach to their core and to, 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 to continue to evolve. And they don't want to get, uh, to get wiped out of the uh, historical books as losers. They want to say after Ukraine is consumed by Russia, look, we were right. Russia has reached its borders and we don't care about Ukraine. That is the hugest danger, the biggest danger. Well, we're going to have to wrap this uh, panel up. Um, deeply fascinating topics. We're going to carry on talking about propaganda and its effect on coercing and controlling our actions in a later panel. Do please submit questions. Look at the topics coming up in the panel. Please submit your questions ahead of time. We would love to be able to call those out and use those as the basis of our discussion later. Do get involved and thank you for staying with us. There is nothing the United States has done since the Vietnam War ended that is anything remotely close to Ukraine. I often describe where my field of battle in Ukraine, which was in Kharkiv province uh, during the counteroffensive and the, you know, the months leading up to it, was closer to the Ardennes forest of you know, Belgium and France in 1944. Only in winter, when we had fog and no air power. So it was men with rifles, tanks, and artillery. And that's all the resources you get, right? And drones are the equivalent of those little Piper Cub observation aircraft that could fly just, you know, a few hundred feet in the air and look for them. So we stepped back in history but we're fighting the war that we really prepared for in the 1970s and 80s. And here's a little clue that's going, to, that's going to be very interesting. We are now beating, when I say we, this is the Ukrainians. I was a legionnaire. I am still a legionnaire. I, my battalion commander wants me to come back right now, today. Um, we are fighting the Russians who have their most advanced equipment, whatever they think is their best with equipment and technology from the 1970s. And that's the war we would have fought had we had a fight with the Soviet Union. It would have been a massacre, just as it's a massacre right now. It's just, we could use bigger and better weapons. Let me tell you how and why the Russians adapted, because the news media really got this wrong, certainly last summer with the counteroffensive. Um, they, they say, oh, the Russians spent this spring and the few months before the counteroffensive preparing defenses. That's not what happened. Um, the first wave of the Russian war, Russia got utterly beat almost everywhere along the line, particularly in the north. Just destroyed. Three armies eliminated until they withdrew. So these are the guys who got surprised. Most of their professional soldiers died. Then came what we call the head-on-anvil strategies that the Ukrainians allowed the Russians to do. By June, you were seeing operations in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. The Russians would send a mass of soldiers into a Ukrainian anvil. And the Ukrainians would prepare heavy defenses and allow them to hammer their head against these cities until they lost 10, 20,000 soldiers at a time. And then, as, as President Zelensky says, when you've completed that defense and we've lost 10,000 soldiers, we'll give you that village of 5,000 people and move back five, uh, two kilometers. And then you'll do it against Lysychansk. And then you'll lose 5,000 soldiers. And we'll give you that little dirt village or that small town. And as President Zelensky said, oh, we're going to get it back. Now. Your soldiers are dead. This is what we call the head against anvil strategy. Russia would just bash its brains out. That happened in June, July. 
But by August, Ukraine had been preparing its own counteroffensive. And the Russians had pretty much dug in along the line and were still in the same posture that they were in in March, April, and May, right? Still thinking they could do these offensives. The Ukrainians had no combat capacity. And that's when the September counteroffensive occurred in Kharkiv province. Um, and that was, to me, that was amazing because, and it will be the last time it ever happens. <laughs> it, Ukraine caught the Russians off guard due to good reconnaissance, good due to good strategic intelligence sharing with the United States. And what I thought was a very tough line shattered in a matter of hours. And in fact, I made a video as a joke because uh, we were the special purpose brigade. We were very far out with the joint terror, uh, the joint uh, special operations task force at the tip. But within three hours, the Russian line had fallen so fast, artillery was coming up behind me. I was like, they're supposed to be 20 kilometers behind me. The Russians ran, ran everywhere. Uh, you know, you know where we were, Ivanivka, uh, Izum, uh, and the Western approaches to Kupiansk. When they told us we were going to take Kupiansk in 72 hours, I was like, this is going to be a tough fight. We're all going to be shooting all day, all night. But the Russians shattered like broken glass because they didn't think Ukraine had the offensive capability. But some things, you know, you know, the Russians, they fell back almost all the way to the Russian border in many of those areas. Now, come November 2022, this is where Russia really put the posture that they're in right now. They spent all winter digging in tank traps, millions of landmines, and those lines were very tough. When I met Minister Reznikov earlier this in spring of 2023, first time he ever met a legionnaire. That's a little surprising, right? <laughs> you know, hundreds and hundreds of us, you know, I mean, he, he met me in a, in, a, in, a dip, in a diplomatic briefing. I was with some VIPs. And he said, this counteroffensive will not be what you had happened in 2022. It won't be easy. It's going to be tough. We're going to push all along the Russian line and see what breaks. Right. So the Russians changed their strategy to do defense in depth. And that worked. It worked for them. OK. But what else also worked was Mobniks bringing out hundreds of thousands of disposable men. And then they started the same head against anvil strategy on Bahmut. <laughs> right? Head against anvil. Let's just lose thousands and thousands of guys. But it became so clear Russia had adopted this, and they didn't care what the people were. They had fantasies in their head that if they take Bahmut, they could break through the Kramatorsk, and they would be in Dnipro in hours. And everybody was like, are they crazy? No, they would just rather lose 10, 20,000 men. Same thing occurred this fall in Avdivka. Okay, Avdivka should have fallen in 2014. <laughs> I have no I was there. It was heavily fortified, but it really was 10 years past its due date. And for the Russians to now do head against Anvil again in Avdivka for one small town, they're just slaughtering their own forces and their own armor. So say what you will. Yes, Ukraine is suffering. Um, all of our forces are fighting, men are being rotated through these combat zones and are taking losses, but Russia thinks they can sustain these deaths, and they can't if America gives Ukraine the resources we need at the levels we are asking for. Here's the level, unlimited. Okay, if they were to have given us not 100 ATACMS missiles or 10 ATACMS missiles or whatever it was, 100. But the U.S. is about to destroy 1,000 ATACMS missiles. We're going to have to pay like a billion dollars to get rid of them. Just say, hey, all the inventory goes to Ukraine. Bye. Right? We're building brand new missiles that are even better than the ATACMS missile. But we saw on day one, rocket one, Ukraine destroy an entire Russian helicopter base. Right? With these missiles. 
for the coming year, um, I think that the Ukrainians might be more open with General Sierski, um to sitting down with NATO and actually developing a Ukrainian-based offensive strategy. When we hit Kupiansk, we had every tank in northern Ukraine assigned to us. One night I was there, I thought it was like D-Day. Just tanks started coming in at four in the afternoon and seven the next morning. They were still rolling nonstop all night. And we hit the Russians so hard with mass power. We also need to understand, and we, under, we, we comprehended last year, that engineering, sappers, right, going through, being able to breach assault lines, knowing the Russians just have to sit there and shoot at you, okay? Um, General uh, Zelushny uh, had a strategy last year that started in June about counter-battery fire, neutralizing every Russian artillery battery. If we had 5,000 more uh, um, Kimars missiles and 200 more launchers, we could own Russian artillery. Um, the United States has that many launchers waiting in to be repaired, or the, the National Guard, if I'm not mistaken, has like 350 launchers. They're used on weekends only. <laughs> weekends only, and they don't even shoot, right? <laughs> they just sit there and get painted and cleaned and all that stuff. I think a strategic effort, the incrementalism of Washington needs to end. I have said that to people on the National Security Council, look them right in the eye. And I was like, you need to stop this. Well, we're going to give you this one thing, and maybe that will help you. Um, why the United States is, you know, why President Biden hasn't embraced what I would call a 100 F-16 initiative. I would. I'd make a big announcement. He should have made that announcement last night at the State of the Union. All stops are out for America. The abject, total, absolute, utter defeat of Russia is now America's strategic priority. We're going to give you the hammer, Ukraine, start hammering. But he has people on his National Security Council staff who worry more about Russia. There's nothing, there's only one thing Russia hasn't done, and that's used a nuclear weapon. It's the only weapon they have not used in their arsenal. And the way they're getting beat, they're not going to. Because one, the radiation just goes back into Russia. We saw that at Chernobyl. But we have to stop thinking we can manage through sniper shots of little pieces of equipment like 24 F-16s here and 12, you know, HEMARS in this batch. Mm -mm -mm. Empty. The old reserve. Did you know we were giving um, Morocco 500 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles? The, the Bradley, if you're... Viewers don't know. It's a murder machine. Okay? The Ukrainians, if you saw that one video of the Bradley going against the T-90, the most absolute brand new vehicle in its inventory, and the Bradley runs out and hoses it down and ducks back, and the Russian tank starts burning, and he comes out, and he just hammers it and hammers it and hammers it. That was one Bradley. <laughs> you know? Uh, it's a murder machine. And why the United States didn't go to Morocco, who does not need it, doesn't need it. I've been to Morocco. I've, I've seen their army. And just say, hey, we're going to cancel that order. We'll get you something in the future. And say, all of these Bradleys onto ships right to Ukraine right now. Go through every, every armored Humvee that is going to be turned over to another army needed to have gone to Ukraine. Right? They didn't even use Lend-Lease. Uh, but that's because there are individuals who are more afraid of Donald Trump talking bad about them than saving Ukraine. So go figure. Uh, Ukraine is without all question the single most experienced army in the world. And here's why. Because when this war is over, the threat is not over to Ukraine. Everyone's going to be a reservist this war. Okay, Zelensky says he has half a million men in uniform. 
uh, virtually everyone has stayed there for two years, men and women, men and women. This and these old hands, right? These gray beards like me, they're going to be training um, these young kids who were 18. And one thing I have to say about General uh, Sierski, a lot of people don't like him. He rotated literally every brigade into major combat in like Bahmut, Avdivka, to get that experience of, you know, if they didn't have it before, we sat in Kharkiv, we were like, yay, we broke glass and went up and took Kupiansk. That's nothing. That's not Bahmut, baby. Okay, that was not Andivka or Avdivka or any illicit chance. That was none of the hard places. Everyone got rotated to the hard spot so that they would know what real fighting was like. And we lost a bunch of really great guys, guys in my platoon. But everyone in Ukraine uh, has some measure of combat experience. And if you've never been bombarded for 72 hours nonstop, okay, then you haven't been in a war. <laughs> it's just that simple. You've been in a police action, a counterterrorism action, a counterinsurgency. This is full-scale, wholesale you know, war fighting. And Ukraine is now the global dominant. Russia, by the way, they won't survive this war. Whoever gets out of this war will never look at Ukraine twice. Before 2022, uh, unfortunately, um, there were no clear perspective of uh, bringing Crimea back to Ukraine. People were under occupation, under oppression, of, under the threat of their lives, and they didn't see the possibility for the next 10 years, for example, for, for Crimea to come back. The full-scale invasion completely changed the situation. I mean, that first of all, uh, everyone saw that Ukraine not only is able to resist, to make a resilience, but also is, uh, is able to release the territories, that the army is strong, that there is like a, there are all the limitations on non-military means usage or something like that, because we do remember that it's always where all discussion about only diplomatic means toward Crimea, and all our partners were insisting on such a wording in all the official documents. So all these limitations gone. I mean, that everyone understands that this is war, this is military means, military operations, that Russia has no intention to live by their goodwill. They uh, can leave the Crimea and other occupied territory only in result of military uh, operations. And uh, people saw that these operations are possible and they are feasible, that the releasing of Crimea is some kind of feasible perspective. All the military uh, experts whom I'm talking to, they say that the liberation of Crimea from the military point of view is a much easier task than uh, liberation of the uh, so-called mainland territories like Donbass and Lugansk regions. Um, because the Crimea is a peninsula and geographically and uh, it's like a quite an isolated area and um, we see that within this war Ukraine Ukrainian army was using this tactic when we cut off logistic routes, when we cut off supplies, and afterwards the army of enemy army of Russia became much weaker, and actually the offensive became much easier. With Crimea, these tactics works can work like uh, even better because uh, we have quite a limited supply chains. Uh, so the, as soon as we approach uh, the uh, peninsula itself, like a, this is like a small bridge to the peninsula, and cut off the carriage bridge, cut off the uh, land supplies, the liberation of Crimea would be just a matter of like a time, a few months, is when the army to be exhausted. And what we see in, from now that we see that Ukraine already is substantially limited capabilities of supplies, of connection uh, of Russia through the sea. Uh, so with like a, this quite an active operation of Ukraine on the sea uh, domain, Russia is not so active and not so flexible. So I would say that this looks like a shaping operation already. But of course, we're highly dependent on the supplies of the um, 
long-range missiles, for example, to disconnect the carriage bridge. But technically, this operation is highly possible, and I think that we will see uh, some kind of increasing of this shape in activities quite soon. If you cut the supplies, you give just like a few months, and most of the army won't have all that kind of food, ammunition, and all the other uh, parts of which we consider it will be like uh, evacuated by itself from Crimea, yes, using the different opportunities. So I don't think that we will even face in some kind of like a heavy land operations. However, the military experts would know this better. But um, as we discussed before with you also, the historical Crimea was always uh, like a, um, occupied or deoccupied by the military power, yes, by military operations. It never like a, was uh, like a passing from one side to another in some kind of diplomatic ways. Yes, it was always a military pressure, which looks like uh, already started with this like a disconnection. As I said, the, Russia relocated uh, most of the ships uh, from, from Crimea to Novorossiysk uh, port facilities. And uh, so they, they trying to hide as much as possible capabilities from Crimea, relocate to some other parts because Ukraine is already reaching Crimea, reaching quite actively. Uh, again, uh, we are limited with missiles capabilities, but we actively use drones. And the more Ukraine developed the long-range drones, the worse situation with uh, Russia presence in Crimea is, because before they were like quite inactively using uh, these uh, sea platforms, for example, for shelling Ukraine or uh, air, airports uh, for uh, locating their fighter jets, which is not so already now. So we, we like a, uh, observe now substantial decrease of the land, uh, sea launches of the missiles on the, uh, from the Russian ships to Ukraine. And we uh, observe that many airports were evacuated uh, so we, we see how Russia already squeezing its capabilities from Crimea because they feel unsafe. Well, the problem is that the bridge is like a construction which needs to be destroyed with some like a massive explosives and no one of drones can just like a bear such an explosives and no one, no, no any drones for now can just like a hit the those points which are crucial for uh, like a strength of the construction. And that is why we're speaking about necessity to guard the uh, uh, possible types of the uh, long-range missiles. If we speak about Germany, this is Taurus, and this is one, one of the principal capabilities we need to destroy it effectively. Um, there, is, there could be not only Taurus, but some like other uh, missiles with some proper characteristics. But I would say that Taurus is, is the most reachable uh, for us, uh, yes, now, for now. Unfortunately, as we see, the uh, still we have some kind of excuses from Germany, from Scholz, whatever, like, um, whatever happens, we have a different uh, type of excuses. And all these excuses are actually not very trusted because we saw that some of them like are using arguments which are not applicable to the situation and we also all of us heard this discussion of the uh, German military personnel which was like a discussion that it's only about 10-15 missiles what needed to to broke up the bridge actually so I hope that uh, like uh, with all the efforts, with collective efforts, we will uh, reach the purpose and we will just somehow to ensure uh, Mr. Scholz that we need them for not only for Ukraine, yes, but for establishing the security uh, situation in the Black Sea, uh, like uh, decreasing substantially the capabilities of Russia, which is required now and which is all the uh, European leaders are speaking about now. And I would like also to explain that the longer we, I don't know, don't make some critical moves, the longer uh, the war will continue and the more expenses will, bear, will be bared by Ukraine, of course, but also by the European countries, because finally I think that most of the leaders declare that they do understand that uh, this is the war not only of Ukraine, 
but this is the war which threatens, directly threatens, physically threatens to the most of European countries, including Germany. Ukraine's maritime strategy in this war, it's actually something which was declared as a necessary strategy uh, for the future and for the current one, fortunately. It means that we need to use the very asymmetrical approach, very innovative, because we can never compare our Ukrainian capab potential capabilities with Russian. I mean that we always will have less people, less weapons, uh, less munition, because just because of the size, just because of the level of preparation. Uh, so we cannot just uh, like overcome them with standard capabilities like you know, it was used in the Second World War or in other wars. So we need to invent something more innovative. We need to invent something more flexible and very asymmetric. Uh, the uh, sea drones, it's like a very, very good example of uh, how it can happen. Yes, you're absolutely right that it's already around 30% of the like uh, actual um, numbers but this means not only 30% of decreasing of capability, it means much, much more in capabilities because um, this is like a, you, you cannot just apply this number of capabilities. The capabilities actually, I would say, decreased like a more than a half because, first of all, they lost one of the biggest situational awareness uh, ship. Um, I'm, I'm telling about the Moscow, Moskva, yes, when, when, which was used for covering the like a situational awareness purposes and covering the protection, like defense uh, purposes. They lost a lot of maneuver ships, like a small maneuver ships. They lost uh, a lot of those which were used for transportation. And they actually almost lost the capabilities of deploying the troops, amphibious operations, because like a many, uh, many ships of these vessels of this type were eliminated. So. We're speaking about much more serious capabilities loss than only 30%. And as I said also, they relocated some ships from uh, Crimea to Novorossiysk, but Novorossiysk port is not applicable for keeping up such a high um, like a readiness fleet. And that makes them a trouble. That's why Russians try now to use the Georgian waters and Georgian ports for um, like a... Um, uh, placement of some kind of their fleet, but still it just decreases their ability to react. It just decreases their ability to uh, make the strikes and operations on the Black Sea. And you see that we use it now for making our own grain corridor, which we don't need to, you know, coordinate with someone, which we don't, uh, we are not dependent on someone's decision and negotiations. And the corridor is working quite well. We um, just increased transportation of goods from Ukraine to the level already uh, like before the invasion. And that's, I think, that, that's a great uh, achievement and that's great like a proof that these asymmetric methods are working. We need more and more of these like a big military uh, drones, which are more precise, which are long range, which can bear a lot of like uh, destruction power on board. And uh, so we see here uh, private initiatives, we see here like a, um, a public-private partnership when the government cooperates with the private companies. We see efforts of our um, partners who also promise to supply or supply some drones like a, or UAV, like a, quite a big one. So this is like a, some kind of massive operation now. Uh, we don't obviously don't have overcapacity, so we still need a lot of them. We still need a lot of them also because we need to compensate lack of ammunition, lack of long-range missiles, lack of other capabilities which, which Ukraine doesn't obtain. Uh, but uh, even should we have an ideal situation with the ammunition, with the artillery, with uh, like the long-range missiles, still drones uh, would be heavily used in this war because they are still cheaper, they are uh, less obvious for observations, they are like a more flexible weapon which, which give us a weapon or a tool which give us some kind of possibility to use it massively and therefore uh, spread attention of our enemy. And what else we should say that 
Speaking about drones, we should understand that the cycle of this uh, operation yes, is quite fast. So we have, um, if you try something new, you have like a two, three months as maximum before Russian will understand how to deal with it and will try to copy the technology. And so even having like established production, you need constantly develop and redevelop and redevelop uh, your equipment, your um, drones, whatever you use there to protect it better from electronic warfare, to protect it better from the like uh, vision, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the vision technologies. So it's like a constant development which is required. And I believe that uh, within this war, drones and UAVs demonstrated that actually we have a combination of very classical approach with very innovative approach, and it will continue. We see that uh, how like uh, Iran, for example, actively uh, developed these, uh, these uh, technologies just because they are cheaper, just because they can be used. And I think that many other countries are now looking at this war. They started to develop, this, uh, develop these technologies and we will face with more and more drones operation in small wars, in uh, some kind of local um, wars. So that's, that's something which we are already in.
artillery. <laughs>
Um, thank you, Mikola. Um, Gustav, my next question goes to you. Um, what went wrong? Why those two years were not enough and why Ukraine needs to wait for one more year? Um, how those processes within, within those three years were developed that Ukraine still requires time? Well, the main problem was that most Western governments, not only Europeans, but Washington is to blame to, to quite a large extent as well, thought that the war would not last very long. Uh, is it the same as the Russian idea of the three days? Uh, yeah, we, we, it was not three days, but uh, sort of in 2022, of course, at the beginning of 2022, people thought that Ukraine would not uh, last long, not three days, but three months, and then the war would transition into guerrilla warfare. Uh, once they came to the idea, and that was basically April 2022, that that was not the case, and they started to think, okay, um, on existing footage, when, when will the Russians have exhausted uh, their potential? And then they thought the war would probably end. But Russia mobilized, mobilized the defense industry, mo partial mobilization, and they carried on. Uh, 2023, I heard a lot of voices that, yeah, after the counteroffensive, the Russians will seek negotiations, and then the war will be frozen, and it's going to be end. This is going to be the end. Well, it's not. Uh, and the problem is all these kind of illusions on a quick uh, end, they deferred the starting point of saying, okay, now we have to produce like mad. Um, there was a lot of decisions, like when I started to discuss this in defense industrial support, refurbishment of uh, 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 secondary stockpile, etc. Uh, and for example, in, in 2022, I uh, asked people about, look, these martyrs, they are all these Libor 2 in this storage side, in this storage cell, they're old, but, you know, we can renovate them and, and, and train and bring them. It lasts one year. They're, they're so old. It will last one year. One year the, in one year, the war will be over. Well, in 2023, the war wasn't over. Uh, the problem is all these measures for secondhand equipment to renovate them, it lasts, depending on how, in what state the, the vehicle is, from like four months to one year. Uh, if you only take the ones that take four months, that's roughly what was being donated to Ukraine. Um, uh, but the one-year vehicles, a lot of a lot of countries just shy away from it because it takes too long. The same with the ammunition. Um, a newly produced shot takes six to nine months to materialize. Uh, even for such a, a stupid quote-unquote uh, product like artillery ammunition, uh, not because it's so complicated, but uh, the, the propellant charge, the powder, it needs a time to stabilize. So again, nine months, if uh, defense industry said, yeah, you can order, but you'll get your shot in nine months, a lot of governments said, ah, that's too long. Uh, uh, then, of course, there was a lot of politics. The EU Commission actually started to, to float the idea of this one, one million round initiative in November 2022. Uh, and first they were told, no, that's none of your business. Uh, then it was, okay, you can do that, but it's still the prerogative of the national states uh, that should do that. Um, and, and you can just make some framework contracts and laws, but we'll do that. Uh, then I sort of found a compromise. They found the subsidies for the defense industries to actually be able to increase their production to do that. And then they made the contracts and then the nation states said, yeah, but we're not going to sign that because your contracts are wrong and we want to negotiate better contracts. And so they started again negotiating and the contingencies for the uh, artillery ammunition that should have been booked by September were not booked by a lot of member states. I thought, yeah, in next year, the Americans will cover this. They were told by Washington that, don't worry, we'll cover this. Um, uh, then came the tussle in, in, in Congress and suddenly they said, oops. Uh, and now, of course, they're running behind time. And the problem is, artillery munition, we are running behind time, but actually we do as well with tanks, with infantry fighting vehicles. Um, on artillery, at least the French have their initiative, and there is the Danish Nordic initiative to buy checkmate howitzers. Um, there's a, a little bit of production going on, but for a lot of other fighting vehicles, we're basically waiting for Ukraine to produce this stuff on their own, but there is no, no plan B. If the Russians... Uh, uh, managed to hit these factories. Um, there's nothing from the West that's coming forward because we, again, we were told a new tank, three years, the war won't last three years. Now we're in the third year. Uh, infantry fighting vehicles, usually two years from, from order to delivery. We were told the, the war won't last so long. 
the war is over two years old. Uh, the full-scale invasion of war is 10 years old. But yeah, that's, and, and, and it's, it's, it's this mindset that prevents people from, uh, from scaling up defense industry. Um, at least in France, it's changing. Um, in, actually, in Poland, in Bulgaria, in the Czech Republic, it changed quite quickly. Uh, but in other countries, in the Nordic countries, it changed. Um, but in other countries, um, change is gradual, slow, partial, uncomprehensive. Um, yeah, and that's, that's, that's the issue. So if we look at like March 2024, can we say that there are at least a couple of countries that are running in full speed and that will be able to help Ukraine starting from January 2025? Or is it going to be another year of uh, political promises? Um, well, it depends on what kind of ammunition and what kind of defense goods we're talking about. Um, so yes, the artillery ammunition in 2025 will be less of an issue because now we ramp up production. Um, we, we will next year be at least able to sustain Ukraine on the defensive minimum and together with the Americans, if they then are on board, depending on their presidential election, it might actually uh, lead to a situation where we can deliver stuff to Ukraine to enable them to have at least localized fire superiority. Uh, so this is getting better. Uh, problematic, for example, is air defense. Um, here, actually, the Germans are not so too, too bad. They ramped up production, for example, for Iris T. Uh, the problem is Iris T alone is still too few. Uh, and the, the critical bottleneck with, with Russia buying North Korean and Iranian ballistic missiles are Patriots. Uh, because unfortunately, also in France, SMPT interceptor, so the, the Aster 30, which has roughly the same capabilities as Patriot, is produced in much too slow numbers. Uh, it, uh, there is no big batch order for this missile up today, although the, the launches were delivered at the beginning of last year. Uh, but there's no ramping up of ammunition production. And it's um, as this missile has a much narrower usual customer base, let me say so. It's also for them industry-wise harder to, uh, unless they're big orders from the few countries that operate the missiles, to really ramp up production because they, if for such an expensive weapons platform, you really need to have a 10-year procurement plan uh, in order to justify an increase in production. Uh, and that hasn't come, neither from the Italians, nor from the French, nor from the British, which are the three main, main operators of this thing. Um, yeah, so Patriots will be the bottleneck. Uh, and here the, the Americans are indispensable. They produce it. German Patriots will roll off the assembly line in 2030. Contracts were conducted last no November that finalized it, but you know, it takes time. Um, Japan also produces Patriots, uh, but of course they have very restrictive export laws. Now the Americans are the central buffer. They buy Japanese Patriots to free up American Patriots to go to Ukraine. But if the central buffer that really sort of allows all these swap deals uh, would cease to exist uh, with, with under President Trump, then we are in big trouble. Uh, and that could make a lot of things. And again, you know, for tanks, for infantry fighting vehicles, we are only resting on Ukraine's own production because there is basically nothing else. Uh, if the Patriot plan falls apart, then the other things fall apart as well because the Russians will more freely attack these sites that produce them. Uh, so this has, this can have tragic follow-on consequences, uh, and that's what I'm I'm really worried about. Mr. Kizuveta, um can we blame everything on these political competitions inside Germany, inside the EU, between the European Commission and individual member states in the U.S. between the two parties? Is those uh, political difficulties uh, in reaching a joint solution or a common solution in one country? Is that the main? explanation why um, the person aid to Ukraine been so, well, uh, had so many short comics. It's not only a political question, but very brief greetings to Mikola uh, and thank you for your recent uh, visit to Berlin. I believe it's a question of mindset, as Gustav said. It's a question of strategic culture and a lack of political willingness to coordinate European efforts amongst EU member states, amongst NATO member states, and the reaction of, from the European Union member states was, at least in Sweden and Finland, to become a member of NATO. So we only have left Ireland and Austria being no members, as EU members, no members of NATO. And the strategic culture was deterrence. 
And Sweden and Finland and the Baltic states have very well understood. And I believe that we see today we are faced with a split in the European attitude. What do I mean with that? Look to Macron, his speech yesterday, and Medvedev's answer, if you so wish. So Medvedev is clear saying the negotiation position is Ukraine to become part of Russia, dismantling itself. And Macron is saying no red lines. And to be very clear, Macron has now understood that the new Europe will be more Eastern, more Northern, more deterrent, more defensive, more innovative, and less influenced by Paris and Berlin. And Macron now sees, if Trump is elected, that there is a lack of European leadership because Germany is not fulfilling its hinge, fu hinge function regarding Eastern concerns and Southern concerns, which are very different in Europe. So Macron sees the lack and sees also the hunger for leadership and coordination. So it is very helpful. Today there is the meeting of uh, Poland, of France and Germany in Berlin, the Weimarian Triangle. I believe it's a dual meeting of Poland and France um, trying to convince Germany not to pursue the way of a stalemate of a frozen conflict. But this is the big difference between Germany and others. The question is what is the war, the end of the war? And Germany, at least the Chancellor is saying Ukraine must not lose and Russia must not win. And if you ask the Chancellor why don't you say to regain its borders of 91, as it is laid down in the security agreement between Germany and Ukraine. He's saying, you have listened to me correctly. So he is not believing in Ukraine regaining its borders. And it's a question of strategic culture and the consequences of Russian deterrence. It's self-deterrence. It's the hope of the old German romanticism that Russia and Germany, Germany's engineers art and Russian resources might be a, a, a second pillar between China and the United States. And this is the old German view. The countries in between are not seen on the same level. And this is the consequence as of today, as we experienced it yesterday in our parliament. And therefore, as a convinced member of the German parliament, I see we have due to our parliamentary law, too little influence on the Chancellor who is, who is not only formulating, he is uh, setting the political guidelines into practice. And therefore, we need also international colleagues exerting uh, pressure on Germany to understand that the largest economy in Europe has to start much earlier with production, with standardization, with interoperability. And the key mistake is that we in Germany, you mentioned it, believe that the war will last some weeks and then there is Minsk III. And now they believe, listening to the German population, that in the course of the next year, when we have federal elections, the Chancellor might go public and say, I have prevented Ukraine from a nuclear assault and Ukraine must be grateful to that, so they could give in and say, okay, we give up some territory. And we do not understand in Germany that this is combined with war crimes, with atrocities, with mass migration, with a loose of perspectives. And therefore, the evil is not only the orientation of Germany towards only the United States instead of coordinating Europe, the evil is a lack of mindset and strategic culture inside this country. William, since the word nuclear has been brought up, I, my next question must come to you. Um, so did Scholz succeed in preventing a nuclear assault on Ukraine? No, I don't think he did at all. I think uh, the reason that Vladimir Putin has not employed nuclear weapons in Ukraine is a combination of a lack of military utility. What target would he hit? Number two, the political costs of introducing nuclear weapons into the conflict. Uh, this would be, you know, a, a further horrific violation of Russia's international obligations. Um, and as you heard, th there was a point in the crisis when even President Xi of China and Modi of India said they didn't want to see nuclear weapons introduced into this conflict. Now, of course, there was no Western threat of introduction of weapons. There was no Ukrainian threat of... So that was a message to Putin himself. I don't think he expected that. I think that actually forced him to moderate his rhetoric and to leave it to his 
you know, attack dog Medvedev and the television pundits to say irresponsible things. Um, since then, Putin has said things that are more consistent with our understanding of Russia's nuclear deterrence policy and its doctrine. Um, so I, I, I think the idea that Schultz somehow did something, all he's done is emboldened Russia to attack further by self-deterring, by saying sending propelled artillery would be an escalation, saying battle tanks would be an escalation, sending aircraft. Would be. By doing that, Putin realizes that nuclear coercion and nuclear intimidation has worked on Schultz. To, for Schultz to try to reverse that and say he's prevented a nuclear attack, is that, that takes some special kind of mindset to, to believe that because the bully hasn't beaten someone else up that you intervened. It's just, it's disappointing. But um, I do think that Putin is still inhibited from using equipments, not only because of the political cost that China and India threatened, but also because the US, the UK and France would undoubtedly unleash at least conventional weapons on Russia if it were to introduce uh, nuclear weapons into this conflict. Um, we have strong evidence that the US has privately conveyed this directly to, uh, from Blinken to Petrushev, um, and not just at that level, that the price for Russia would be immense. And you can imagine, you know, the United States firing uh, hundreds, if not more than a thousand uh, jasms uh, into uh, just Russian-held Ukrainian territory would leave Russian forces in Ukraine open to you know, massive attack from Ukrainian forces. Uh, and also it's Putin's worst nightmare that the West would get directly involved in this crisis. And if we retaliated at the conventional level, leave it to Russia then to further escalate. This further isolates them, presents Putin with very bad options. And again, you, you notice Schultz doesn't play a role in any of that. But to this idea that uh, Russia wouldn't violate this international obligation of not firing, of not using mm -hmm. nuclear weapons. Nothing stopped, has stopped Russia before from violating international obligations. What's, what's the difference this time? Because I think countries like China and India would actually make it pay a price. So far, you're absolutely correct. I mean, few if any countries around the world, uh, especially in the global south, have made Russia pay a price for illegally seizing Crimea. For instance, in, uh, on several continents, that's seen as a sign of strength. Even Russia in this war not achieving its aims, there are country that, countries that see Russia as being strong. I do think the introduction of nuclear weapons in this conflict would be a bridge too far for many countries who would then be willing to do something, who are currently sitting on the fence. And I think Putin knows it's just not a risk worth taking right now. I, you, you know, he is trying to build a coalition in Africa and in the Middle East. He's trying to build this coalition of the sanctioned, the, the, the people who will flock to Russia rather than to you know, the United States and uh, you know, the rule-based order. So uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's not because he loves rules, it's because he has more to lose if he crosses that particular boundary. Um, and I want to remind our viewers that you have a possibility to ask questions and I want to address one of them right now. Mikoli, if you can still hear me, um, there's a question about the manufacturing of ammunition in Ukraine um, and whether Ukraine can um, produce enough sufficient amount of those ammunition to um, decrease its dependency of, on Western supplies. Um, can you describe what's um, happening at the moment with the Ukrainian um, ammunition production and whether Ukraine can say goodbye to all of those political difficulties in Europe and the US and um, arm itself? Well, I'd like to have a situation when Ukraine has this kind of autonomy. Unfortunately, no country in NATO except US is capable of uh, confronting Russia alone. So it's uh, an issue of continuous cooperation. For sure, we can uh, find some niches, some directions where can, we can be more self-sufficient like uh, UAV production. Right here, right now, for the last two months, uh, I mean, uh, January, February, our military industrial complex was able to produce more than 200,000 uh, FPV drones. But uh, self-sufficiency, it's, it's an illusion for a number of reasons. First, we, we doesn't possess all technologies, all expertise. Uh, and second, it's about being able to finance everything. Because with... Uh, Decreased GDP uh, and all the losses we can't on ourselves finance everything. That's why the most viable option is to have uh, bilateral agreements uh, between Ukraine and different countries implemented in the field of military industrial cooperation. Uh, so entities, Western military entities, they are bringing 
technologies uh, they're bringing uh, production ukraine uh, bring labor and then uh, we combine it and partially it's financed by western governments and that's how we meet ukrainian requirements because that's an illusion that ukraine on its own can uh, meet all all the requirements but we are doing a great job especially in field of different kind of uavs uh, Ukraine just recently um, signed a number of um, security agreements with um, G7 countries. Um, can those security agreements work as a base for expanding on them and then creating them, turning them into the defense industrial agreements between Ukraine and its Western partners? As far as I understand, after uh, conclusion of these agreements, uh, there was already a, a huge interest uh, out of uh, specific countries. They want to understand how our military industrial complex writ large is functioning. That's why, as for me, it's a good sign that uh, specific countries and their enterprises mean business. That's why, yeah, that's one of the field I'd like to see uh, radical changes because in 1992-2021 Ukrainian military industrial complex as is existed as an autarky as a like a part of uh, USSR military industrial complex with no connections or very loose uh, connections with western military industrial complex so I'd like uh, for Ukraine to to see a model um, to take a model of Poland so Poland quite uh, successfully integrated with uh, Western entities in terms of military industrial cooperation and that that's the future for, for us uh, otherwise uh, we should be open that uh, Western governments uh, won't be ready to finance uh, like uh, purely Ukrainian enterprises so they have their own interests they want uh, some part of the profit retained in their countries and that's natural so we need to find models that is most suitable and it uh, bringing enterprises bringing know-how into Ukraine and uh, that's that's the most viable option and that's one of the pillars of uh, the security model for for Ukraine more military industrial cooperation with western countries western entities Thank you very much, Mikola. Um, thank you for joining us um, today. I know that you have to run um, so I'm gonna um, give, <laughs> let you free um, and I'm, uh, once I'm again, really sorry and thank you for organizing and again i'm uh, we are glad that uh, despite all the difficulties we are facing there are a lot of people who support ukraine and mean european resilience initiative and all people you have in parallel so thank you so much thank you for your kind words uh, mr kizaveta um we heard now that Ukraine cannot be self-sufficient in arming itself. So there is a dependency on um, the West, there's a dependency on the EU, and in particular, um, Germany. Um, and I'm going to introduce the T-word, Taurus. Um, yet another discussion in the Parliament, yet another no. Um, can you describe how these discussions are going uh, for people who did not uh, witness them? Um, those three sets of arguments, the three sets of discussion, did they differ in any way? Mm -hmm. Excellent question, thank you. Um, we started the discussion on this in late April last year. I brought it in and then in the coalition the Greens and the Liberals uh, demanded it from the Chancery. And for several months the Chancery didn't answer. They were very reluctant and they gave very different answers. We need them for ourselves. They are not available. We don't have the capability to refurbish them. And, and about 600 pieces and 150 of them were available in April. Now a, a much larger number is available. The challenge was that the Chancellor never gave a clear explanation. So we brought in in November a request in the Parliament and the coalition denied to handle it. So it was then uh, transported to the Committee of Foreign Affairs and in the Committee of Foreign Affairs the Chancellor's party demanded always to bring it out of the agenda and therefore the others in their loyalty to the coalition voted with them. So we were in a minority. And then if this has been achieved ten times then it has to go back to the normal panel and we brought it back to the plenary session two weeks ago. And then the government brought in an own request mentioning far-reaching weapons, the EU perspectives and the NATO perspective. And the coalition believed that these far-reaching weapons would encompass Taurus. And three days after this debate, the Chancellor said no. So they were disappointed. But due to the discipline inside the coalition, they 
explained that they would support our request to Santoros, but the coalition would fail and would break into pieces if they voted with our opposition request. And therefore, there is a majority in the parliament, but there is also the discipline not to endanger the government. And the chancellor now said that he does not trust Ukraine to use this weapon in an agreement, in a treaty, in a bipartisan uh, arrangement like France and UK and United States did with attackums, with cluster ammunition, with scalp and storm shadow. Um, the challenge is that Germany could do that. We could have geofencing and anything. But the key issue of the Chancellor is he does not trust Ukraine because he wants a final German military control on it. This is not necessary. Normally the enterprise which is producing that would install everything. We know that the Ukrainian soldiers are, and engineers are so smart that they could um, include this weapon system within a few days and train within a few weeks. So there is no political will on the side of the Chancellor and his key argument is no trust. And why? No trust means this weapon has a reach of 500 kilometers, so you could reach Moscow. And, but with geofencing, you could avoid this. And all other countries who are supporting with very deliberate ammunition and deliberate weapons say you can only use it on the occupied territories, but not on the Russian soil. This is a smart idea because then Ukraine could use its own weapons and drones to carry the war on the Russian soil, which is really necessary. To also show the Russian people that they are in a war and to destroy lines of communication, supply chains and military installations. Due to the international law, by the way. And also to, in, to employ Taurus in Russia would be according to the international law. But the Chancellor believes by the Russian deterrence that then Germany would be threatened nuclear or Kiev would be threatened nuclear. So this is the self-deterrence and this is the consequence of always talking about red lines and Putin has abused this, has utilized it, better to say, so that the Chancellor is now in an, in an impasse where he cannot come out face-saving. And so he is like a small child, we call it trotz, I don't know the right expectations if you have two years old, three years old child. It, it cannot deviate from its course because it would lose its face. And this is now the key question of this coalition. And probably Taurus will not be delivered. And even the Brits have made an excellent proposal to take over the Taurus and then to send their uh, storm shadows. And also to send Taurus to uh, UK and then UK could send it is denied by the Chancellor. So we see now, also combined with the statement of his caucus leader, the Chancellor is working and the SPD on a frozen conflict. And a frozen conflict, look to Minsk 1 and Minsk 2, means a Minsk 3, and this is disappointment, and this is mistrust, and this would lead to, to a Russia which could refurbish itself and then restart the war and fulfill all its war, war goals. This is the reason. And so we are in the parliament really in a, in a very bad situation. There is a majority, but due to the discipline of the coalition, there was no majority. And I would like to encourage the Ukrainian people to really, and also our neighbor states, to increase the pressure, not on the government, on the chancellor, the Greens and the Liberals, and also my caucus, Christian Democratic Party, is really in very high favor to send this weapon to cut off the Russian supply chains to Crimea because 80% of the attacks on Ukraine are conducted via Crimea. But you basically just stole my question because if we cannot convince the Chancellor and it's one person, is it possible to convince people around him? We all see those videos of Annalena Baerbock, the Foreign Minister of Germany, and her, and her um, body language when she heard arguments against the, the deliveries of Taurus to Ukraine. What would it take to convince other coalition partners to stand up against the Chancellor? This would damage the coalition and we would have pre-election and, and Putin would, sh would clap his hands. The, the main issue is that the United States start with this pressure. So we have to overcome Kirby, Sullivan and others. 
as they did the Americans in the tanker question, where Austin and Blinken convinced uh, Biden and they overruled Sullivan in December and January 22-23. I'm going to talk briefly about the political aspect of the question and then go back to the Taurus technicalities, Gustav, if you allow me. Um, William, what will it take to convince the US to overcome Sullivan yet, yet again? Oh, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, and if you have answers, uh, please send them to me on a postcard and I'll, I'll, I'll employ them right away. Uh, yeah, this, this timidity within the US system as well has been an issue all along. And, you know, I really think it's the, it, it is folks like Austin who are able to make this case the most strongly to Biden. I think Biden's instincts are exactly in the right place. Um, uh, and quite frankly, I think there's just so much going on right now, it's hard to get through to Washington that this is a critical pathway. The U.S. has its own issues, uh, especially in terms of Congress and getting funding through for further, uh, uh, further tranches of support to Ukraine. I think that's dominating the conversation so much. So I do think it's, it's his colleagues uh, in ministries of defense. If other ministers of defense reach out to Austin and reach out to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and reach out to Commander Ucom, um, who's also secure, uh, and tell them to call Biden, I think this will bypass the, any resistance. It sounds like a great algorithm. Why, why wasn't it done? I think people have a tough time understanding exactly where the levers of power within the U.S. system are. I think Biden has a massive trust for his uh, military colleagues uh, throughout the government. And, and again, it's because everyone is so watching this battle that's happening in Congress. Everyone's so worried about the election. Everybody's so focused on the, these, these 20 meter targets and 30 meter targets, they forget that this is the target that's right in the room. And again, direct contact with, with the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Commander of U.S. European Command slash SACUR uh, can break this free. We have um, defense ministerials uh, at NATO, which are fantastic opportunities to concentrate these messages and to get them back to Washington. We have the NATO summit coming up. This is another great opportunity to put this squarely on Biden's radar because this is the summit's going to happen before the elections. Um, there's a lot that can happen. And if the U.S. can break Taurus free, I think that would be a, such a huge contribution to the defense of Ukraine. It, it, it's a target, but again, it's not something that everyone's focused on. So perhaps an event like this can remind people that this is a way to go and to give hope to our uh, European and NATO colleagues who want to see Taurus that they do have uh, an avenue of pressure to use that has been underutilized so far. As promised, um, nerdy technical questions on Taurus in particular. Um, I had a discussion recently uh, with um, people um, unrelated to security, and there is um, there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding how Taurus works, and how this geo tagging works, and whether people can just go on Google Maps, um, look up coordinates of Moscow, and then shoot at, um, Taurus right on the Kremlin. Um, can you elaborate on that? What is the cruise missile? Um, the thing is, in theory, yes, you can uh, uh, Google uh, the coordinates of the Kremlin and enter to the missile and it will fly there. Uh, but it's not going to fly there very well um, because the, there, are, there are three guidance systems within the towers. Um, the first is GPS. Um, then there's an internal navigation system, and then there is a georeference system. So that's basically an artificial intelligence pilot. So it has an infrared camera, and the, the infrared camera looks uh, through the nose of the missile, and it, the camera sees the terrain, and it has a map of the terrain in its memory, um, and it compares that. And like a pilot who's flying his glider or a sports plane and saying, yeah, okay, here's this church and that's that village. And here and behind there is my aircraft. Basically, the missile flies around and, oh, okay, here's this, here's that, here's that, and there's my target. Um, and depending on how sophisticated you want the attack to happen, how deep the missile shall fly. Um, should it do retargeting? Um, uh, should it be able to avoid air defense, etc.? this endeavor becomes more and more complex. Uh, how small is the target? How mobile is the target? Or what's the time difference the target relocates? Um, that all plays into, into the amount of how much computing you need to do that, because this is it's, it's sort of on the highest level of sophistication of an attack. It's very complex to program it. For very simple attacks, 
it's easier done. So the thing is, what when you sort of deliver towers to Ukraine, and the same applies to storm shed. A storm shed is a bit simpler because uh, only the terminal guidance. So when the, the missiles really strikes on the target, that is done with an artificial intelligence uh, pilot. Uh, but uh, and Taurus navigates it all the way. Uh, uh, but the principle is the same. Uh, and if you see, for example, the, pre the, the Storm Shadow Scalp attacks, the first attacks Ukrainian did some were very stationary, easy to recognize tar targets, because that was sort of the easiest thing to program, and they needed to get used on how to program the attack runs, etc. And, and they did extensive preparations for that with other reconnaissance, special forces mission, drone attacks, diversionary attacks, to kind of make, make these few cruise missiles succeed. Ukrainian missile attacks with, with uh, the French-British cruise missiles became more and more sophisticated the longer these operators were familiar with the, with the programming um, uh, of, of the attack runs. And finally, they hit a, a ship in harbor, which is it's a moving target. Um, you need to have, you need to be good and really promise your attack run will happen in that and that time reference because the ship will unload for a few hours and you need to strike it there. Otherwise, the missile, it's artificial intelligence, but it's still 2000s technology of artificial intelligence. The missile kind of sees the, uh, oh, there's the hover, but where is my ship? And and sort of gets confused because that's that's then a too complex situation, etc. So, so yes, of course, it's complex. Yes, of course, you need to train Ukrainian pilots. Yes, of course, you need to feed them with, uh, uh, with uh, satellite imagery. Actually, Ukraine already gets German satellite imagery. Uh, it's just the resolution is would only allow strikes on, on stationary and, and non-complex targets like Crimean Bridge because it's easy to identify. Even if you get a low resolution picture from the Crimean Bridge, the, Kind of the missile can tell that, that that that's a bridge. If you hunt a certain specific weapon system that is hiding behind camouflage, like a command post of a of a missile battery, etc., then it would get more tricky because you know the, you you need to get the dumb computer to recognize that ah that's that's the command post. There we are, um, and that would that would need more experience in in encoding and understanding and how the code thinks, how the computer thinks, etc. That will come by time. So there's no, there's no this kind of technical wonderland that can't be done. Uh, it's all a matter of how much money do you want to take into your hand to facilitate that, because depending on which model of, of, of all the computer calculation center Ukrainians get, how long uh, do you want to produce that, how long do you want to train them, etc. You can, you can have different models, one where they can relatively quickly strike simple targets, and sort of later on get more sophisticated or you train them to the highest sophistication, but they can only use the missile then next year or somewhere. So that, but that's all in theory, politics to decide and how do you want to proceed. Um, and, and, and frankly, I would have had even sympathy for Scholz if he said, well, the process for towers is all too complicated. We'll lease that to the British so that they can, because there's no time pressure. I mean, the British are not at war. They can do their, their conventional deterrence work in the northern part of NATO with the Taurus and, and give, give them the storm shadows because they're trained, they know the operation system, they hit, and it's roughly the same missile. I mean, it's not the same as a similar missile. The Taurus is wider and it's a bit heavier, so it has more countermeasures and a bit longer range and a bit heavier payload, but that's on the margins, yeah. I mean, here in Germany, we discuss it as the Wunderwaffe. Uh, like, if this, you know, if you give that to Ukrainians, then the war will end and they will march into Moscow. That's nonsense. It's a cruise missile. It's a fairly similar cruise missile to what the British and French have. And yes, improvements are there on the margins. The only real difference between the two is the British and the French already work on the successor. It's going to be flight tested in a couple of years. It's going to be introduced before the 2030s. Hence, also for the British and the French, it's easier to give that away, what they have, because they know replacement will come soon. That's a trickier discussion for the Germans. But then still, I, I, whether deliver it or not, I don't understand why this is not mass-produced 24-7 in Germany already, because we see how important deep strike is in the war. We see how important cruise missiles are as a conventional deterrent. We see how scary the Russians are. Uh, we should produce a ton of that anyway, whether we'll give it to Ukraine or not. And it's not done, uh, which also speaks to the lacking Zeitenwende mindset.
But yet another argument from Scholz mm. is that um, Ukraine will need German boots on the ground. Yeah, that's for nonsense. Uh, and this was debunked. I mean, this, the, I mean, here comes domestic politics into play. Scholz wanted to be the guy who, who saved um, Germany from becoming a party of war. And he thought that, or some of his advisors who understands nothing of the military and even less from technological issues, tell him, look, uh, here, it's going to be your word against the defense experts whom he called now, uh, the, the, the TV marshals, yeah? uh, and, and you can say, yeah, this will need German boots, and everybody who, who contradicts you, uh, you can say, well, I'm the chancellor of access to classified information, so I know, and I can the Bundeswehr. The Bundeswehr is ordered not to say anything about it. Um, and then you have this narrative, and you can point at, at the leader of your party and say, yeah, you're a risk taker, warmonger, this is dangerous, and, and hoping to, to regain voices from the AfD or Sarah Wagenknecht, etc. Well, then the Bundeswehr leak came up with Chauras, where the, the chief of the Luftwaffe with uh, three other generals were exactly discussing all these options and how long they would take and um, a, a sort of what would be a simple option, what would be a complicated option, what, what would the training requirements be, uh, which are the private enterprises that if the Bundeswehr can't help are able to code this missile, are able to train Ukrainians, are able to provide assistance and all of that, because of course the South Koreans didn't ask the Bundeswehr for their missiles, of course they get industry support for that. It's just complete nonsense that this can be only be done by the Bundeswehr. Um, uh, and of course, that, by that, this kind of line of argumentation collapsed overnight, and he was proven a liar. Uh, and that's, of course, why the, the, the debate on Taurus missiles probably won't stop until general elections, because, I mean, this is just too perfect for anybody uh, uh, who is in the opposition, because the Chancellor has proven himself on record, basically on record, in lying. Um, uh, but this is, this is the kind of the rabbit hole he dug for himself. If I, again, if he would have declined it on, on the means that, look, we don't get the replacement too quickly, it's easier to give them the, the British missiles, if he, he would have reacted to uh, the numerous offers by, by Sundak and Cameron for swap deals, he could have moved around that. If it's for his party problematic to deliver the missiles, there would have been smart options to do that. He refused to do that because he thought that this is a domestic policy victory for grabs. And, and it was, was a self-goal. Uh, yeah, but now, I mean, the toss is on and, and, and it's his fault. Uh, and yeah, I won't save him from that. Uh, so yeah, uh, here we are. Uh, well, while um, the German Chancellor is considering uh, or hesitating to send Taurus, um, the European Resilience Initiative Center is not, and it's collecting um, donations to support the Ukrainian army with whatever needs um, um, are there and whatever um, the um, non-governmental organizations can do. You can see a QR code um, uh, for the link with the donations um, on your screen now, or just go um, to the description of this live marathon and you can see the link there as well. Um, I also encourage you to post questions that I can forward to my guests. And one of them came with a little bit of critique um, that we discuss um, individual weapons too much uh, while um, Western countries continue to do business with Russia and do not try to cut business ties with Russia as much as we would prefer um, it to be. Um, Mr. Kizoveta, the question to you, um, is there a discussion about further sanctioning Russia, further cutting ties uh, with Russia, or either in Germany or on the European level? And if yes, um, what are its focuses? What does it focus on? Well, there are a lot of sanction packages uh, ongoing in the European Union. I believe today we have the 12th or 13th one stop to count. Uh, however, there are some countries who are only sanctioning war important goods and not dual use goods. Is Germany one of them? Yes, and Hungary. And the question is why? And it is really a, a pity for us because uh, in the parliament there is a majority to improve the sanctions and to exclude war important uh, goods there's also machines for a CNC production and so on, but this is not yet done. Also nitrocellulose, which is a kind of cotton, is also exported from Germany to Russia. Because- well, I just recently complained that we cannot yeah. produce ammunitions because we yeah. lack- And also the question of ship-to-ship -ship transfer, 
those ships have to be stopped in other harbors and uh, there are several other smaller items. Um, the challenge is that there are also some enterprises specialized on procuring, for example, chips in Turkey or in Armenia or even in China, and they are private enterprises who are purchasing washing machines and exploiting their technical devices, which we then find in Russian uh, missiles, for example. So there is a coalition of Turkey, oh, sorry, Turkey, of Russia, Iran, North Korea, and China, and China is the country which is trying to cooperate, for example, with Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, who have increased their import numbers for washing machines by 15 times in, Azab in uh, Kazakhstan and by more than 1,000 times in Kyrgyzstan, probably from five a year to 5,000 a year. And this, is, this could be sanctioned with the enterprises, but they say, well, we, we sell them to private enterprises and these are intermediators. So we have to look who are the intermediators and have to stop them. There is an a uh, special investigation in the German media. So I see that these um, holes are going to be stopped. But we have to be very honest, it's not only Hungary, it's also Germany in this context. And this is not a question to the parliament, it's also not really to the government, it's the free economy we have and the lack of a self-understanding of these enterprises that they are responsible. In France, there are more state-owned enterprises, so it's easier to control them. We have a very small number of state-owned enterprises, but not in this context. And so it's much diff more difficult to control it. But therefore, we should be a little bit more um, decent and a little bit more uh, smart, smarter in this context uh, to stop and to contain this. Well, is it going after individual companies now, or can we adopt the French model? Can we reduce? Can we increase the um, regulation of the free market, which at the end of the day should be regulated by the government? Well, uh, the, it's very simple to be resolved uh, to contain dual-use goods, and washing machines are dual-use goods, and this is part of the thirteenth package. And Germany was against it. But then we have to talk to Bosch Siemens Hausgeräte and others and have to tell them, well, show us where you want to export to and we will give you restrictions or better regulations, but don't sell them where, to anybody who is requesting them. So this is possible, but this needs more political will and also a self, uh, a kind of, 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 of self-conscience and a question of, of own strategic um, mindset to stop the, the export. And one example is, for, is, is Infineon, um, where Infineon chips are exported since 2014 and now they are ready to stop it. The other is, uh, are, are banks, so to, to, to freeze bank accounts uh, like Commerzbank and others who have to do a little bit more and to help Ukraine and not to foster their relationship with Russia. Well, I guess um, that's your, now your turn because uh, we're talking about international regulations and how it can be implemented and how we can differentiate when we're talking about exclusively defense, um, defense issues and when we talk about free economy. Um, from your experience, um, is it possible to introduce such a, an effective sanction regime that it would not be 100% bulletproof, but at least um, would prevent such uh, mass scale sanction evasion schemes? It's a big challenge, um, especially in the United States. The idea of export controls as being part of your national security uh, was divorced for a long time. Uh, even at NATO, they used to have an export control committee at NATO. Uh, but after the end of the Cold War, so many of the non-military instruments of power were, were, were let go from NATO and either given back to the nations themselves or reconcentrated in the European Union. And while I think the EU has done a great job, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the sanctions and for everything like that, the idea that NATO itself, which has so many non-EU members, Norway, Turkey, the United States, Canada, I mean, the, the idea that they outsource a lot of this to the EU, and even within the EU, you have Cyprus and Malta and Hungary who, and Austria, you know, who, who may be against these things. 
it strikes me as a little bit odd. I think NATO needs to claw back some of these non-military instruments of power. Uh, again, in the Cold War, it was not the case that they would outsource these things. Um, and, and there's no reason why they can't use the European Union and other organizations where NATO members also have membership to increase their reach, to increase their span of control. But I think these things should be decided at NATO headquarters among allies, should then be used in these other organizations. But export control itself, I mean, this is literally arms control. This is literally controlling arms. And unfortunately for too many countries, especially in the West, it's seen as individual national profitability and boostering of, your, uh, of commerce, uh, the individual companies themselves lobbying against the government for restrictions. Um, but I think this is a, a case where it's actually inhibition or a lack of political will or a lack of focus from the West to really say, let's close all of the loopholes humanly possible. We know where they're taking advantage of resellers. We know where these chains are going. Um, but the political will to work with industry, to shut down all these avenues is very difficult. We've lost the muscle memory, as we say, uh, in the United States. Uh, and it's time for a much more muscular export control policy. Um, there was a colleague of mine actually in the Trump administration, Chris Ford, who put this very, very well. He said, we have to work together to make sure our friends can run fast and our enemies run slower. And that means things like export control. That means things like uh, coordinating on trade. That means working with not just allies, but with partners as well. Um, but it's just, it's, it's something that we have fallen out of the habit and we have to rebuild that habit and really shut all these things down and show politicians that the cost of them not doing it is actually higher than the cost of them doing it. And that we're costing lives here. When we open up an Iranian drone and it still has American chips in it, that is a huge failure of American export control system. And the people in uh, Expos at the State Department and the Commerce Department need to work together to shut those loopholes down. It's on them that, that Americans uh, you know, in the Middle East, that Ukrainians uh, on the battlefield are being struck by these weapons, uh, that our partners and friends in the Middle East are dealing with these kinds of drones all the time with American ships in it. It's, it's an embarrassment. And we all need to work together to close these loopholes and shut down Russia, and North Korea and uh, Iran from having access to these things, this coalition that is working together on missiles and on drones, it's, it's, it, it's just a true embarrassment. Um, would the appointment of a new um, General Secretary of NATO be such, a, such an occasion to start introducing um, tighter expert control measures? Or would the person appointed to this position have enough of their plate already to be able to deal with expert controls in addition to it while having a institution with no institutional memory of how controlling those those matters. I mean, let me just say right up front, uh, I think Secretary Jens Stoltenberg has been one of the greatest SecGens in NATO's history. The number of tasks he's taken on, the fact that he's survived and thrived and helped the Allies increase security at a time when I think the wrong person in that job would have not supported Ukraine as much, would not have transformed NATO's uh, defense and deterrence policy as much, would not have maintained support of 30 and now 32 allies. I, I mean, absolutely extraordinary. Finland and Sweden, uh, uh, Montenegro, uh, North Macedonia. The, the, the way Stoltenberg has done things has been truly extraordinary. I know that at SHAPE, uh, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, uh, two of his predecessors, and Steve Covington, uh, who's the advisor to the SecGen, have been working really hard to claw back some of these non-military instruments of power and to reintegrate military and non-military instruments of power at NATO to remind the ambassadors that they have this capability. But there's still within NATO, I think, uh, some allies, and, and in some ways it's France, in some ways it's Germany, who want to use the EU as sort of a counterbalance to uh, U.S. and U.K. leadership uh, within European security and want to maintain that sort of independence. And that's usually been the historic block it, within NATO has been France, has been France wanting to preserve the right for it to be the, the bigger player in the EU. And of course, autonomy is another buzz. absolutely. But also the Franco-German engine has normally been what really runs the EU and has you know, necessarily um, uh, advanced. Now that that engine has broken down and Macron is actually leading 
uh, in terms of trying to support Ukraine, maybe he could be convinced that you know standing up more powers within NATO is not actually a, di a diminution of France's autonomy or power within Europe, but actually a way to enhance its leadership within NATO and within the EU. Not to take prerogatives away from the EU, but just to remember that if you're a NATO member state and you're not an EU member, that you still have the right to work with NATO allies to wield these non-military instruments of power to deter Russia, to support our allies and partners and friends, to help defend Ukraine. Can, can I add a two thing in here? The, the, one of the biggest problems in, in the whole sanctions quagmire is uh, implementation. And the EU is great in working on regulations, but it has no muscle to implement them. And also the, sort of the, 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 the special envoy for sanctions, they, they're looking into implementation. They're looking like, is Austria, is Hungary, uh, that needs to translate the EU regulation into domestic exports laws, drafting these laws correctly. But nobody's controlling them, are they actually implementing it? And that's, that's the huge problem, because first of all, some countries don't have the muscle themselves, especially smaller ones. They don't have a really capable foreign intelligence uh, service. Uh, they don't have diplomatic or, or, or trade attaches that can actually double check or do due diligence. Uh, either companies buy that because they're afraid of uh, extraordinary US sanctions or they just don't. And, and in, in these days, they just don't. And the second thing is then you have states like Austria and Hungary that are basically doing the minimum they can. They, they don't object the legislation because they know that that will, will have a cost in Brussels. You know, you would pay for that if you are a sanction spoiler, but you just don't implement them. Um, and it's much harder for, for other countries to, um, to basically see, oh, our stuff is going out via Hungary or via Austria. And, you know, it's much, much easier to hide. The next thing is uh, it, fines, uh, court terms, um, time. And, and here I'm looking at Germany. Uh, uh, and, and time, it actually needs to really conf sort of get get managers into jail. Uh, the German legal system, the courts are so overworked. Prosecutory service, they're clocked. There is, it's a capacity issue. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the bad guys, they say, well, we can export, you know, nobody's going to bust us. And if, and if the fines are so ineligible, you know, I mean, it's, you can run on high profit selling to Russia. And if you're caught, you know, you're paying, uh, you, you're paying a nominal fee. Um, that needs to change as well. There, need, there needs to be punishment for, for misdeeds. There needs to be also a clear consciousness in legislations that these are not kind of um, cavalier affairs. You know, it's, it's really these people help Russia kill people. And you're basically committing second degree murder if you, if you uh, export this stuff to Iran, to Iran or to Russia. Uh, that, that mindset isn't there yet. Uh, and, and this harshness of our penal system isn't there yet, but it, it needs to come there. Otherwise, uh, you will always find a crook who for a decent margin will resell this stuff. And then if that problems that you have has at home, then it's difficult to go out there uh, to Turkey, for instance, and say, hey, Turkey, uh, you need to align with our sanctions because you cannot align them within your own union. Yes. Second that, and of course, businessmen there will even find less risk because uh, Turkey, I mean, they have 80% of their foreign trade is with the European Union. So it's not that they're completely invulnerable to that. But of course, if they don't feel pressure, if also private enterprises there don't feel pressure, if business representatives don't have to think that, oh, I can't go to Germany for others, for a sales fair or for whatever other business I do because I'm on an arrest warrant, um, then of course, they'll be happy to, you know, cut the margins and do what they're doing. Mr. Kizavita, um citing Gustav Gressel, looking at Germany, um, we had this speech two years ago about Zeitenwende, another buzzword in, that, in this debate, um, which happened to be not that large as everyone expected, not that miraculous, it didn't solve all the problems um, that um, Oh, the hesitations that Germany had when it comes to understanding its own security powers and understanding its role within the EU. Um, do you think that Site Invented 2.0 might be coming? Do you think that um, finally, after those two years of um, hopes and uh, drawbacks on the uh, government side, do you think that that's the time when um, 
actual changes when it comes to sanctions, when it comes to f funding um, the Bundeswehr, do you think that's coming or do we still need this, again, m mindset shift? I'm full of hope and expectations, but when I listen to the speech of the Chancellor this week and in the Parliament and to his caucus leader, I see that Zeitenwende is already history because it's only linked with more money for our defense budget and this means 100 billion euros, which lost about already more than 20 billion euros to inflation and interest rates. Uh, Zeitenwende is a question of cultural awareness, of strategic culture as well, and the willingness to see that this Zeitenwende has to take place in the civil society, in the universities, that we need an integrated approach to security, that in Germany, we need to redefine security. In Germany, security is defined by social security and welfare. But there is also domestic security and foreign security and economic competitiveness. And these four or five facets of Zeitenwende, they are not yet completely in the public mind or in the public debate. In the parliament, yes, we reiterate from my party, from the Greens, more or less every week of session. But in the government, Zeitenwende is now only focused on to mitigate the war against Ukraine, to explain to the people that there will be no change in their social welfare. Whereas we see, for example, Finland or Lithuania who explain to their own people that the crisis is so strong and there, there are multiple crises, poly crises, which are challenging the security system and that the people have to understand that their security is dependent from a mindset of deterrence and enablers and that if this is not the case, their own social welfare is endangered. And this is not yet the case in Germany. There are some promises. And we in, in our um, Liberal Conservative Party, Christian Democratic Union, Christian Social Union, we are a little bit in fear of the voters because we have not only the European parliamentary election, we have three elections in Saxonia, Saxonia, Anhalt and Thuringia, where very right-wing parties, which are close to Putin, they are their spokespersons, if you so wish, uh, might gain the majority or at least will be, become part of a government. So we are too careful. And I believe we can only convince the public if we are steadfast, if we are strong, if we say, no, this is wrong, like Helmut Schmidt was, like Helmut Kohl was, like Adenauer was, very clear. But in Germany, people believe in disarmament and in a kind of romanticism. But Willy Brandt, who is the witness for that, had a defense budget of 4% of the GDP. So he could, he was able to invest in trust building measures because the other side, so yes, we need to take them serious because they have three military corps, they have uh, 12 divisions, uh, 36 brigades and 80 reserve battalions. This is not the case today, so the credibility is not there. So even the, even the brigade in central Lithuania by Germany is not convincing you that this, this shift is a, the strongest signal of the current government to our partners that we are not receivers of security any longer, but we also are willing to promulgate security. This was the best decision the defense minister did and the best decision in security politics of Germany in the last 20 years. However, it must be financed. And this brigade is part of the division which should be, should be fully fledged next year, but the brigade will be available in 27. So there is a lot to do also from the Lithuanian side, but it is a game changer in our willingness to support our neighbors because we received 11 countries in Germany until 1989, even from Canada, a brigade was there, but only because we invested credibly in our own defense, and Lithuania does. William, I think you want to add something on that no, topic? That, he, but you're 100% you're correct. It, it, deterrence is the primary entering argument for any kind of dialogue that you have to have. Why would your adversary engage with you if you can't defend yourself? 
and for Germany not only to be able to defend itself, but I mean, there is a debt here. It's, it's remarkable living in Germany now for three years, how many people forget that West Germany was one of the largest and most capable militaries. And at the end of the World War II, there was a real question as to whether Germany, West Germany would, would rebuild its military. And it only joined the NATO alliance in 1955 and then really rearmed. And once it rearmed, it made sure, as you pointed out, 4% of uh, its GDP. And the allies that were stationed here, uh, the British Army on the Rhine, the Dutch, the Belgians, the Canadians, all here, the French, US, UK, um, and, you, you know, we have to recall that the U.S., the U.K. and French forces that were in West Berlin, their job wasn't to win. Their job was to die for the cause so that the Soviets would be confronted. And I would assume that they did not believe in disarmament. They believed that with deterrence, that again, this gets back to at NATO, the Harmel Report, which is a 1967 report um, uh, embarked upon uh, at the behest of the Belgian foreign minister, Pierre Harmel to understand the core purposes of the alliance and the two core purposes was to deter your adversary, to make sure that no ally felt under threat of attack. And on that basis, you could have talks to see if you could resolve whatever the underlying conflict was. But unfortunately for Germany, since the end of the Cold War, it's been, no, 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 let's just jump right to the talks. And again, Russia does not see that as a serious position. And so for me, when I heard Seitenwende, when I heard that speech, I thought maybe this is the moment where Germany really transforms itself, where it can defend not only its own borders, but then it has an in-theater capability to project that defense all the way forward. And when I found out that when Germany first sent the EFP, the battalion, forward, that it didn't have rules of engagement. It couldn't actually defend Lithuania. It could only defend itself if it was fired upon. It wasn't really capable of being reinforced. So now the promise to send a brigade, great. If that means that Germany is going to have a in-theater expeditionary capability to defend allies credibly and to defend itself and to look at its partners, its new allies, Sweden and Finland, and be able to look at them square in the eye and say that we're doing all that we can do. When Finland is clearly doing everything that it can do, Sweden is literally transforming its military. You go back 10 years ago and they had no land forces. They had disbanded their land army, only an out of area expeditionary force. But they made the decision after Crimea to re-stand up heavy, uh, three heavy land brigades and to buy uh, more, um, uh, more capable uh, cruise missiles to start to defend themselves. And then 2022, uh, they and Finland to, to join the NATO alliance. These are countries that have transformed their defense relationship and doing exercises where Jotland gets invaded, uh, the exercise Aurora, and realizing they couldn't defend themselves without allied support, without standing up its own credible military force. I would love to see Germany turn itself into a real provider of security in the region and to be able to stand up military forces commensurate with its wealth. Because exactly as you said before, the balance of power in the alliance is shifting to the east. And if Germany does not fulfill its sight having raised expectations so high, and its military is seen as being less than adequate even after Zeit and Venda, then its political power within the alliance will fall further. And Sweden, Finland, Poland, and the Baltics, they're more than happy to lead. But if Germany, you know, for instance, transforms Rostock into a real logistics, uh, sea logistics center to be able to flow forces through, heavy forces through to the Baltics, if Germany is providing larger and more capable forces, really credible, credibly able to defend, uh, if the, the Sky Shield Initiative really supp supplies the alliance with integrated air and missile defense to be able to challenge Russia's ability to penetrate our air defenses or to fire missiles, then this will all have seemed like an amazing step forward and Germany fulfilling its destiny within the alliance as a security provider. But if it doesn't, that credibility will wane and other people will pick up the mantle and lead the alliance from now on. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your words. I'm really agree more. I have a, a, a question from our public, um, just quick, um, and I encourage uh, people to post questions to the European Resilience Initiative Center YouTube channel. Um, William, you briefly mentioned the rules of engagement. So what's going to happen if the German base in Lithuania is attacked? Are they going to fight back? Are they going to negotiate? Are they going to propose to go to Minsk? <laughs> <laughs> well, they have to. I mean, the, the, so the commitment now, so now NATO has transformed uh, since uh, 2019, well, you go back even further, since 2017, the Supreme Allied Commander realized that the Alliance wasn't ready to defend itself. And we were, were operating off a strategic concept that was written in 2010, which already should have acknowledged that Russia was a threat because Georgia had already been invaded, but didn't. Still looked at Russia as a future uh, friend, lover, member, who knows. 
And so Secur decided to try to change and through the military processes came up with a new concept for the defense of the alliance, the, Euro, the de defense and deterrence of the Euro-Atlantic area, what we call DDA, and it has gone even further now with a single op, um, op, uh, integrated operational concept for the defense of the Euro-Atlantic area. This is the first time, so this was just agreed uh, two years ago, this is the first time that NATO has a standing defense plan since 1989. We didn't have a standing defense plan. We had different scenario plans, sure. The, the, the graduated response plans were a good step forward, uh, brought about by Phil Breedlove, but now we have a standing defense plan. So previously we used to generate capabilities based on scenarios, which meant it wasn't really serious. Now we have a standing defense plan. So our capability requirements are much higher and they're real, and now we have to look to allies. And this is an opportunity for Germany not just to be a framework nation, not just to provide you know, uh, some kind of concept for defense, but to actually provide forces that are being tasked to actually defend and resupply and ammunition and rules of engagement that are gonna be flexible to defend Lithuania because all of these plans are now predicated not on defense in depth, not based on a tripwire that dies and then hopefully you know, we, we are able to reinforce and defend, but to defend the NATO alliance so that every inch at every moment is defendable. This was the pledge at the Madrid summit. This was reinforced at Vilnius. This is an utter transformation. In the Cold War, we had to rely on things like um, atomic demolition, demolition munitions to stop the Soviet army on the line. It's not the case anymore. With the conventional forces we have, with the artillery, with high Mars, with high precision, with cruise missiles, we should be able to defend every inch of the alliance all the time. And I think with Finland and Sweden in the alliance, and if Germany can really play up a, a role making sure that, th that this Nordic Baltic region is secure, then Russia will not be able to invade the Baltics. They certainly won't be able to invade Finland. They've never been able to invade Finland. They're not gonna be able to invade the Baltics if everyone works together. And Russia doesn't wanna hit us where we're strong. They wanna hit us where we're weak. So the more Germany can do here, the more they can deter, and the more Russia will start moving its high readiness forces out of the Baltic Nordic region and move it to regions where they can actually do some damage. Um, so again, Germany can safeguard the future of the alliance by becoming a more credible partner within this region. Are they willing to do it? And you know, anything that uh, we can do to help you know, uh, this system, it's one of the reasons why IISS Europe was stood up was to try to transform the defense debate here. And we haven't had the effect that we've wanted to have so far, but I hope we can continue to work with our friends in parliament to transform the dialogue here and to make sure that Germany is a huge provider of actual, real, credible, deployable, dependable, credible defense and deterrence capabilities within the theater. Gustav, if I listen to William, it sounds like Germany needs to become basically France, minus its own nuclear weapons. How long will it take? Do you think it is, it's possible? Well, it has to be possible. And the thing is, I mean, we, are, we, have, we, haven't, we haven't talked about the orange elephant in the room and the things have to go much faster uh, anyway. But, but coming back to Mützenich's dreadful speech yesterday, he thought that we, uh, he said we should think about freezing uh, the conflict. Um, well, Mr. Mützenich, if you want to freeze a war uh, where Ukraine had a, in a Minsk format over 200 rounds of negotiations and more than 20 different ceasefires and n none was kept. Uh, if you uh, if you laugh uh, Sam Cherub for his talk about the Korean solution and blah blah blah. Well, then you have to talk about German allied forces on the demarcation line, because that is what freezes the war. If you, you can then choose whether you want the Kupiansk sector or the Avdivka sector, or the Bakhmut sector or the Robotino, or whatever, but you will have then, and not a brigade, but then you need to, at least to put a division on the ground there. And is the Bundeswehr ready to provide a division for Mr. Mützenich to freeze the war? <laughs> and what would it cost? And, and, and this is the thing, you know, that, that there's so many things floating around, nobody ever thinking through the consequences of the words, what they announce, what they imply, even for themselves. But it's interesting how discussion, when, it go, when the discussion goes to um, delivering Taurus, Germany doesn't want to be a party of war. Yeah. But when it comes to freezing of the conflict, Germany suddenly sees itself as the... It doesn't see itself, they don't think of it. But the problem is freezing a conflict would need international deployment there. Uh, I mean, this, it's just ridiculous to say, you know, Ukraine should freeze that 
and just live with the promise that nothing ever happens. When you know you have a track record, what Russia does, uh, and you have a falling attention after the ceasefire, you have a falling international attention because okay, it's ceasefire, it's over, done. Uh, let's go back to our business. I mean, what what do you expect to happen there? So if you if you really, as the leader of the leading parliamentary fraction, start to talk about the freezing war. And you should also spell out the consequences for you, for your defense sector, what it needs to imply, how to implement it. Otherwise, it's just nonsense talk for domestic purposes. Uh, and and that's, that's a huge problem. Uh, it, it, defense policy is super serious and super real. And in West Germany in the Cold War, whether you were Social Democrats or Conservatives or whatever you were, you did not use defense matters for nonsense talks and smear your party as uh, sort of the, the other other line of the aisle. That was the serious stuff. And this is this is the problem with Zeitenwende. We're not yet and Mützenich was was the proof to the case. We are by far not there. There was also another counter argument is that uh, when um, Emmanuel Macron said that he would consider sending troops to Ukraine, there was a huge opposition from Germany saying that no, Germany will not send any troops as if Germany could send any other troops. But the Bundeswehr. He said NATO will not send any troops. You, you're, not, you're not the sec gen here. Uh, so you, you can say Germany will not, this is his prerogative, he's the chancellor, he can say Germany will not send, but he can't say NATO will not send troops because he's not the sec gen. And that, that particularly infuriated other countries who were also part of uh, NATO and uh, who, who, who think a German chancellor should not uh, talk on their behalf. Mr. Kizuweta, um, is the Bundeswehr ready? If we wake up tomorrow in a Zeitenwende Germany in which uh, the Chancellor is considering sending troops to Ukraine. Is the Bundeswehr ready to um, assist Ukraine in, a, in an actual um, efficient manner? We are ready to send a frigate within two months to the Red Sea. We are able to support with airdrops in Palestine, on the, on the Palestine the region, Gaza. In the Red sea shooting and American we troops. are able to uh, send troops to Lithuania already, a combat ready troop, very well trained and equipped. The challenge is that we need, well, three divisions and to support NATO with at least 10% of any weapons and any equipment uh, of, of all NATO by 2030. If now troops should be sent, which is a very theoretical question for Germany up to now, perhaps after the trilateral summit today there might be some changes, but it's a very theoretical question. If there is need, there's always be the, the possibility to send. But the question is, how long are they endurable? How long are they equipable? And is the mindset ready that they are knowing what they are, have to do to defend Europe at its outer borders and to send a signal to Moscow, to Putin? I believe that our armed forces are ready to do this. There is the right mindset but not the right equipment and the right ammunition so far. So we're going back to the question of the defense industrial competition. And of Zeitenwende. And that Zeitenwende is not only a better armed force, it's also a question of mindset, but also a question of industry. And our industry is not allowed to have a two, three, four shift system. They have a 39 hours week. And with a 39 hours week, you cannot produce the necessary ammunition in time. So there must also be some leeway in our overregulated country that uh, the armaments industry is, gets the right guarantees and the right, uh, yeah, the right guarantees from the political side, from the Ministry of Finance, and that they have the leeway to produce whatever they want in legal terms in an, in an acceptable time. So I guess um, ammunition manufacturers and weapon system manufacturers now to get on a tank and ride to Berlin and demand the changes mm. in, Look, we, uh, we have in, in shifts similar to um, We have delivered farmers. 18 tanks, Leopard, uh, Leopard 2 tanks to um, Ukraine and the production which was ordered after this was only 18. So instead of 200, 300, because they are needed. And the other issue is we have delivered four MLRS, 14 howitzers, with not the necessary spare parts, with the necessary ammunition. So we give signals, but we do not give the signal to our industry and to our population that we start production. 
because we need it in the next years. Only if for deterrence, but perhaps for more, if we are not deterrent enough. Talking about signals, Gustav, um, the European Union recently presented its um, European Defence Industrial Strategy, the first one that uh, was supposed to encompass all stages of the defence production and uh, related things. Um, how do you assess whether this signal is efficient enough and effective enough for the industry to understand that the EU and its member states are now serious about defence? Well, it was a good signal. Um, uh, it's also sort of to understand the role the EU plays, the EU is a regulator. The EU is uh, a body that takes down uh, kind of market turfs and, and, and de sort of uh, creates a common market. The EU is an industrial policy actor that can subsidize certain industries that struggle. Uh, and it was always outside of the defense sector. Uh, all EU policies did not apply to the defense sector. All industrial subsidies, this, this was always the national prerogative. And now the Commission, uh, with, with their instruments, are getting into the defense sector and they have laid out uh, sort of their wish and where they want to go. The problem is, of course, it's still not their turf. Um, you have lots of things that are to be decided in national capitals that are national prerogatives only with the EU cannot do anything on their own. Um, the EU can't procure directly. The EU can only in incentivize, subsidize national procurements, even the ammunition incentives. The EU has negotiated in bulk large contracts, but nation states have to sign their contingent of the contract to legally procure something to send it to Ukraine. Um, so it depends on member states playing along. Uh, and there's unfortunately a very uneven readiness of member states to play along and, and to, uh, uh, to go down that road. Uh, I think it's a first step, um, uh, but a lot of cans need to be kicked down the road as well. So, yeah, it's a start. It's my final round of questions, Mr. Kizubert. I will start with you. Um, first, a comment, brief comment on um, the EU defense industrial strategy. Is Germany ready to go along? And also, how would you see uh, Germany's policy changed in the, let's say, let's be less ambitious in the next year um, to right. demonstrate its actual support for Ukraine? We have a very strong and very sophisticated armaments industry, despite of all the regulations. We have very smart engineers and technicians. And this is already known. However, we need to keep these people inside the armament sector. And we should not lose them to other areas or, to, or abroad. And this is, I believe, a key political task for the next years. Second next year, there will be federal elections. So from probably February or March, we will be in the election mood, in the campaign mood. And this will stop uh, clear-cut political decisions and the time frame is known by Putin. So if we want to have significant and considerable moves in Germany, we have to urge our country by autumn this year. And therefore I'm not skeptical, but what we need is a population which is not in fear, but is convinced that their freedom is also the freedom of the Ukrainian people. And if the Ukrainian people gain their freedom, I believe that Germany will be a little bit more decent, a little bit more humble and stronger on the side of those who are under pressure. Gustav, your, your comment on the next year? I also fear for a very nasty election campaign. Um, I can only recommend to the Social Democrats to not go down the road of peace pacifism. If you look on the uh, polls, social democratic voters, the core voters that still vote for them, uh, these people demand stronger support for Ukraine, quite consistently. Those, the social democracy lost to the AfD and Sarah Wagenknecht, they're lost. It's the same with the Conservative Party. If you cross the boundary line to vote for the AfD, despite the fact, uh, and we are talking about a different AfD now than the AfD of 2013, where this was an anti-Euro party and you could, you know, uh, fiscal conservatism kind of it, it, it was an odd choice but something you could rationalize with with all the scandals with all the knowledge of whom the party 
is with, relates to, conveys, etc. If you made that decision, you lost to the democratic center. Uh, and, and, and peace pacifism will not bring anybody who basically has sentiments for the GDR and wants an alliance with Russia back, back to the Social Democrats. He will only scare off the reasonable people that still support the party. Um, the second thing is all Big Ten parties, and this is not a question with the SPD, are there going to be a Big Ten party or are there going to be an issue party for social justice? If you are a Big Ten party, you need defense experts. You need also Bundeswehr officers. You can't treat uh, the, the Michael Roths and, and, and Fritz Felgentreus the ways you treated them over the past years. You need to have this competence in your party. They don't have to be the party stars and determine the party line, but they have to be in there. Otherwise, you're not a big, big tent party. And I think that's, that's really on the line. Uh, I hope the SPD party base exerts pressure on the cadres because I don't think this is a... A, a problem with the party base and them not checking what, what, what's going on, but a cadre problem of people who have been grown up in the peace movement and uh, have made a political career in the immediate 90s uh, uh, where everything was smooth and nice and shiny and we were all at peace and are just reluctant to change their mindsets and recognize the fact that it's not the time anymore. Um, yeah, and that will depend a lot. Uh, that will not only depend whether we will have a nasty or not so nasty election campaign, uh, it will also determine the kind of future of the center-left uh, democratic party, whether we still have one or whether this, this, this stuff is atomized. And, and yeah, even if you're not a social democrat, Germany needs a center-left party. A country without a healthy centre-left party has usually uh, problems. Look at France, where Mélenchon is the only left-wing person. Uh, it's, it's, it's a disaster for France uh, and the French parliamentary system to, to only have this alternative. William, you have a luxury of choice to comment, either on Germany or on the US. Well, I, I think I have to comment on the US. I mean, I, I, it is remarkable that I know that if President Biden wins a second term, that support for Ukraine will increase and that if the Democrats can also take the, the House and hold the Senate, then support for Ukraine will be locked in. The idea for me as an American that a Republican candidate, if he wins, you know, this is the party of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, would abandon Ukraine, would abandon NATO, would abandon South Korea and Japan is truly astonishing. I think Donald Trump himself is relatively sensitive to um, his own party's sentiment. And so I think if Republicans stand up and say, no, we are against Russia, we are against totalitarianism, we're against China, we're against North Korea, we need our allies, going it alone is not a viable path for the United States, that the more friends and allies we have around the world, it doesn't make us weaker, it makes us stronger. If the Republicans stand up and say that, then I'll be much more sanguine about this election. But now, I mean, if you are a national security uh, involved person in the United States, uh, it, it looks like you have to support Biden. And that, that to me is just horrifying that the Republican Party appears to have given up on the rest of the world and true American security, it's a nightmare. Um, so I hope the Republican Party can stand up and that when faced with the electoral choice, it really does come down to who you want to support rather than whether you want to support Ukraine or not. And I hope, regardless of what party affiliation Americans have, that they will stand up for Ukraine regardless. That's amazing words and I hope that some people will get encouraged. Um, if you want to support Ukraine, you can also go into the description of this live stream and see the link to um, help fund um, the needs of the Ukrainian army. Um, I want to once again introduce um, the stellar panel of my guest, Willem Alberg, the Director of Strategy, Technology and Arms Control at IISS, Rodrik Kiseveta, the member of the German Parliament, and Gustav Kessel, Senior Policy Fellow at the Europe European Council on Foreign Relations. My name is Sasha Steiner. I'm an EU security and uh, foreign policy fellow at the Jacques Delors Center. Uh, stay tuned. Our next panel will be in 15 minutes. So one of the key lessons of the war is how air defenses are still an extremely lethal and therefore important 
asset for uh, any countries, both whether they are in the offense or whether they are in the defense, doesn't make a difference. Uh, they are still absolutely critical. In the case of Russia, we saw it uh, because lack of co air coverage in the early phase of the war exposed uh, its columns of tanks to detection and in some cases like uh, damage or destruction by uh, airborne assets, like famously the Turkish TB2 drones. Uh, and in the case of Ukraine, this has been pretty obvious from the day one of the war, air defenses allowed uh, Ukraine to uh, reduce the effectiveness at first and then to, I would say, impede uh, Russian uh, air forces to uh, essentially operate with impunity, that is to penetrate uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, airspace and carry out strikes or provide uh, intelligence about potential targets and so forth. And then when the war started kind of slowing down, like the Russian intensity, like a Russian uh, invasion kind of retrenched towards the Donbass and Crimea and the kind of number, the frequency and intensity of missile attacks increased dramatically. Air defense is exactly the same technology of missile defense. And so it's, it played a key role in avoiding civil, civilian casualties and destructions. Electronic warfare, uh, as I would say, it has been the case since the, over the past 50 years and probably since World War II, uh, has played a, an extremely important role. Now, to those who are not familiar, what is electronic warfare? Is the use of the electromagnetic spectrum. That might sound very kind of niche or something uh, inaccessible to the most. In fact, we are, all of us are very familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum, even though we don't know. So visible light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. X-rays are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Radio waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is all those frequencies that travel in a straight line, like visible light, and that can be used for both uh, long range detection, communications, uh, identification of targets, and much more. And of course, radar, uh, laser, uh, and as I was saying, radio waves as well, so for communications, these use the electromagnetic spectrum at different frequencies for multiple purposes. Of course, uh, the key advantage of uh, all these systems I just mentioned, communications and radar, is that they have uh, very long range. So we know radio, for example, radar is the same, ground-based radars have a range that goes up to 400 kilometers. So these allow air defenses to uh, increase to have significant time for interception. So having being able to detect the target at 400 kilometers away allows the defender to plan and decide how to best intercept an incoming missile or aircraft so as to maximize the probability of interception. Because of that, denying your enemy the capacity of using the electromagnetic spectrum is very, very important because you reduce the time it has available, uh, like at its disposal to intercept a missile or an aircraft, um, or you impede real-time communication. So all these communication, as I said, uh, so they are part of the electromagnetic spectrum, therefore they travel at the speed of light. So this is a 300,000 kilometers per second, like super fast. Of course, this is why warfare is so lethal because you can provide in real time information about the moving target to a platform that is very far away for uh, precision targeting. But of course, if you impede your enemy to acquire this information, you slow down the process, or if you interfere, things get more complicated. And in a war, like we are in the age of real-time communications, and this is why electromagnetic warfare is very important, because of course it plays a role not only with interference, but also with the counter-interference. That is, you develop your radars and communication systems so as that they are resistant to jamming, spoofing, and any type of obtained by your enemy uh, to intercept. We do know that both countries have uh, 
invested and employed extensively electronic warfare systems. Uh, for example, Russia has been uh, using jammers of GPS, sort of satellite uh, kind of signals on which some munitions rely for accurate targeting. And so by interfering with these jammers, these systems, that essentially they send a, a radio frequency a radio signal in the same frequency of the satellite signals that is used by these munitions for uh, identifying, for following, uh, for targeting precisely the, the objective. Uh, so by doing that, they significantly degrade the accuracy of these munitions. And uh, similar we know both for like, uh, like high-end drones as well as for low-end drones, both countries have been using different types of electronic warfare systems, both sometimes uh, radars or systems that detect the source of the, of the radio signal, so as to identify where the drone pilot is and therefore then strike uh, the piloting positions, as well as systems for inter just basic interference. So again, you send back a signal uh, that is modulated on the same frequency of the radio command, and in this way, the radio operator loses control of the drones, and the drones may fall or may not be able, or you may gain control of the drones. It's very difficult to say which country is uh, more advanced. Uh, like Ukraine, since the start of the war, has been using mostly Soviet uh, legacy uh, air defense systems and therefore communication systems. Uh, so that probably gave an advantage to Russia in the sense that it knew how these systems work. And the, knowing how they work is very, very important then to be able to jam them or to interfere with them. But we also know that Ukraine has a really advanced um, industrial base, especially in uh, radar and communications. There will, before the war, I assume now it has been relocated, there was a very important institute um, in uh, Kharkiv, apologies for the mispronunciation, um, that was working with radar. So there is reason to believe people working there have been playing a very important role in updating, um, modifying these systems. Um, so probably both countries have had an advantage at different times. Uh, limiting limited access to some components might at some point uh, kind of limit further the capacity of Russia. That's what uh, we can conjecture. The more radars and air defenses, the better, because it's always uh, important to keep in mind that all these systems have uh, range limitations. 400 km kilometers for a radar is very long. Uh, but generally aircraft fly a very low altitude. Therefore, you can detect it with ground based radars much like only much later. And therefore, if you consider a circle around you that is a circle in which you can detect a system, then you understand there are many gaps, there can be many gaps in coverage. Uh, and this is true for radars, but it's also true for munitions, whether it's missiles or artillery. Artillery has a way, way shorter range than missiles. So the more you have, the more overlapping coverage you can provide and in this way, you really minimize the probability that missiles or aircraft can break through. So that's definitively, I would say, for a country at war, there's never enough of them. Uh, and also, like, provide also because uh, any batteries has limited stock, like, and re kind of recharging them, re like putting back missiles is not something that you can do in a couple of minutes. Is that it takes some time. Uh, as long as the same line systems for electronic, work, work, uh, electronic warfare interference, uh, electronic warfare, uh, and along the same lines for communi uh, reliable communications, these are all systems that the more you have, it's always the better. Of course, you need to have personnel then that use it. Uh, Ukraine has shown that it can gain proficiency in fairly short time. So as of now, a suspect this should not be a problem. I don't have hard data about it. Um, and then uh, it's difficult to say, like, but uh, paradoxically protecting also, uh, so providing munitions for artillery is, even though we are no longer in the realm of uh, air defense, but this is central because we do know in some areas Ukraine was, uh, is a kind of limiting the amount of uh, artillery shells it uses and 
you know, if the positions can hold, or if they are way less effective, uh, the role of air power becomes much less important. That is, if Russia manages to make advances, all the, the kind of uh, victories in the sky become much less important. So it's really, really important to make sure that on the land uh, kind of domain, uh, Russia doesn't make any advance. And I forgot to mention, absolutely, long-range missiles are really, really important for logistics. We know it with HIMARS, uh, how Ukraine managed to strike a long-range, uh, very important uh, targets, sometimes killing command and control, so very high-ranking uh, military personnel of Russia were killed in a kind of, together with many others in single strikes as well as fuel depots, arms depots. Uh, Long-range missiles do allow essentially Ukraine to uh, change, instead of fighting in the trenches or instead of fighting in cities like Bakhmut, you kind of bring the war like much, much farther from the front as easing the pressure on, uh, on the front because munition does arrive or, it, or to arrive, it takes much uh, longer. It's much more difficult, uh, same with personnel. Uh, you, you, if you strike a specific uh, um, buildings, you limit the number of troops that might arrive at some given front. Of course, we should not make no illusions. Uh, as we happen with HIMARS, uh, Russia can always make countermeasures. So it's not that these missiles arrive and magically things go well. They are like war, he's fought on multiple fronts. And there are the, the enemy always has a has a vote, as an American general at one point said about Iraq. Uh, but of course, the more you make it difficult for your adversary, the better it is for you. So definitively, long-range missiles of any type, I would say these, uh, especially in, in scale, because it's very different if Ukraine can strike occasionally high-value targets even within Russia. But this is something that is not systematic. The capacity of doing it at scale is completely, completely different. F-16 uh, by themselves would not change kind of the advance like, because we do know the advances uh, by Ukraine has been made very difficult by uh, fortification of defenses by Russia. So we have all these kind of very detailed pictures of multi-mine fields with both anti-personnel, anti-tank mines, uh, ditches to impede tanks to proceed at sustained speed, uh, as well as there's these dragon's teeth, this kind of chain block of uh, kind of cement or heavy metal cement uh, further slowing down. Plus, the availability of uh, sensors that detect any minor movement so allow artillery to strike uh, in precision. So I would say there are the F-16 would not be able to kind of overcome this key barrier uh, that uh, Ukrainian forces have in, in, encountered. But they would definitely help. Uh, first of all, with air defense, so incoming missiles and aircraft, they would be one more asset that Ukraine can use to intercept incoming missiles and aircraft. And so this would kind of lower a bit the pressure on air defenses, both um, fixed air defense systems, mobile defenses. And we know we have these stories of Ukrainian armed forces uh, kind of on trucks and kind of speeding up and down on a given area to really intercept with short range, uh, low altitude um, guns or missiles, uh, incoming missiles. So having jet fighters would essentially give more opportunity. As I said earlier, you detect an incoming missile or aircraft at long range, and then you can decide what is the best way to intercept it. And if you have also an option that so far Ukraine is a very, very small quantity, we know Ukraine had already a very, like in comparison to Russia, very uh, small uh, air force. And of course it has lost many aircraft. We don't know precisely how many, but uh, increasing the number of available jet fighters would be a, a big advantage. And then if, but of course, if an advance happens having uh, aircraft that can provide short, uh, closer support to the troops, that would definitively help. 
Uh, so that is something that is very important to keep in mind. Welcome back to our live stream from a Berlin studio. We are in the middle of an eight hours TV marathon in support for Ukraine. I'm Sergei Semleni from the European Resilience Initiative Center. This stream has been prepared for you and been run for you by the European Resilience Initiative Center and the Silicon Curtain podcast by Jonathan Smith, oh, by Jonathan Fink, I'm very sorry, Jonathan Fink, and you will have Jonathan soon, you have got that question, where is Jonathan, like on that last uh, session we had uh, Roderick Kizerwetter, Gustav Grassel, we had Sasha Stanina, we had William Albert, but where is Jonathan? Jonathan will join us in the next panel, he has already run one panel, now he will join us in the next panel, stay with us, and now we will talk on this special panel on the topic of how do the Western countries and NATO train Ukrainian army? And who is a trainer and who is a trainee in this uh, constellation? We are talking here in studio with Sasha Ostanina. She is a, a policy fellow at uh, Jacques Delors Center in Berlin, a think tank close to the Heritage School. And we will have online um, joining us uh, Jahara Frankie Matizek, he's a lieutenant colonel of the U.S. Air Force uh, and he is a military professor at U.S. Naval College, am I right? And uh, he and also we have Will Renault, who is a um, professor at the Northwestern University. And what I need to stress, they both are uh, non-visiting fellows at the European uh, Resilience Initiative Center in our organization, and that is actually the first time we see uh, us both at one at one broadcasting together after we have started that fellowship. Thank you that we have that uh, stellar constellation of the Eric fellows. Uh, great to see you now. And I would like to ask this question like to the whole round and uh, check who could uh, answer it first. The basic question is, who is the trainee? Who is the trainer? Can the Western Army, NATO Army? teach Ukrainians how to fight. We have had recently an interview with a Ukrainian uh, legionnaire with Malcolm Nance and he said the US Army hasn't seen such fights since the uh, Battle of Ardennes and it was like some 80 years ago. So can we teach Ukrainians? Yeah, thanks. Um, I do have to obviously do my usual DOD disclaimer that, you know, the views that me and Professor Reno espouse are our own, do not reflect US government policy. Uh, U.S. Air Force or Department of Defense. Um, that being said, so when it comes to uh, the trainers and the trainees, uh, like the perspective of the trainers, you know, whether it's U.S. forces or the Canadians or other militaries of Europe that are currently training the Ukrainians, uh, one of the bigger disconnects that we're seeing, and this is just sort of the, uh, like the cost-risk balance, like for the Ukrainians versus, you know, like the West when it comes to to doing the training is that the Ukrainians need people. They need bodies and they need people on the front. And within that inherent tension, uh, you know, there's expectations to just get the Ukrainians to be good enough. And yet, obviously, when we talk to a lot of the Western trainers, they're also conflicted, you know, basically wishing that they maybe had double or triple the time with the Ukrainian trainees to make them as effective as possible. And obviously from a, a, a Ukrainian perspective, again, they just need people and they need them uh, to at least have some of the training. And so, you know, th that creates a very odd tension, not to mention the fact that a lot of the Ukrainians we would talk to uh, as they're getting trained, like the ones that had actual combat experience, uh, didn't appreciate the way they were being trained because they felt like they were being taught to fight a war that they, they do not actually fight in Ukraine. And so this is creating lots of frustrations among the trainers and the trainees. Um, Will Reno, do you have anything else to, to add on to this, please? Maybe the 
training in Europe is the wrong model uh, because the <laughs> idea is that, you know, that you, you train these soldiers in, um, you know, basic battlefield tactics. And in terms of the fight that Ukrainians are in now, I think most Ukrainians, at least if they have experience in the front and then come for training, they find it sort of remedial, but then they're mixed with people who um, might not have been in battle before. So, uh, you know, that's not a very efficient classroom <laughs> because you have to decide, do you want to uh, go at the speed of people who have more expertise and, you know, try to supplement their skills or do you need to um, have some sort of specialized training uh, for the group that might be further behind? But we find that they get mixed together that um, European trainers, that NATO trainers don't necessarily have a lot of information about who they're training before they actually arrive. So yeah, that's another point of friction, something else that, that slows it up. Um, you know, ask me, I'm, I'm not a professional trainer or anything like that. I think I would design the curriculum a, a, a little bit differently. Um, you know, that said, training is also a political signal. So, you know, even if you have um, inefficiencies in training, and that's not um, a criticism necessarily of the skill of the trainers themselves, you know, who I think are highly professional, but rather, um, you know, it's a question of how it's put together on the whole. But the fact that <clears throat> Ukrainian soldiers travel to Germany or to UK or wherever uh, for training, um, that, that there's a utility in that that political signal. So, you know, I, I, I think that uh, talking about training, there are several different dimensions to discuss. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Frankie. It was very inspiring. Now we'll come back to you after I ask Sasha the next question. And I know that you have uh, authored um, at the Jacques Delors Center uh, in Berlin, um, a paper analyzing results of the training mission for Ukraine. You have interviewed a lot of Ukrainian soldiers from the very low level, like uh, private or sergeants, up to pretty high level of officers who were accompanying their unit. Uh, what was the overall result? Was this training mission a success, partly success, a flop? It is still difficult to say if it's a success or a flaw because the mission is still running. So it um, has been start it has started in December 2020, oh, November um, 2022, and it was supposed to run for two years, but then got extended for a couple of more months. Um, I've um, I wrote one paper and then I did one field research on that topic. So I um, had a privilege to consider how the mission is functioning in a, this protracted time frame. So I did see how the mission. Um, has developed and how both um, the Ukrainian side that organizes who's coming to Germany to which courses and the Bundeswehr themselves um, trying to adjust to each other. Um, and I think those, um, those relationships are mutually beneficial from my side, but um, mutually disadvantages for, from the other side. And I explain why. Mutually beneficial is because there are different skill sets that both German soldiers and other soldiers from other um, European countries that participate in this mission possess and that they could share with the Ukrainians. For instance, nighttime fighting. This is one of the um, biggest difficulties at the moment uh, for the Ukrainian army, not exclusively because the Ukrainian um, soldiers um, are not that professionalized in nighttime fighting. It's also a question of um, the lack of equipment um, but still, those skills need to be trained, and this is one of the area where uh, the, mm, the EU mission and Ukrainian soldiers managed to establish this be beneficial cooperation. On the um, other side, um, the Ukrainians possess an enormous um, knowledge about um, mine clearance and um, mining activities of the Russians, and this is where the EU side of the, the trainers that benefit from this Ukrainian knowledge and trying to take as much lessons as possible. But on the other side, there are many difficulties that um, could have been, as Frank and Renault said, Will Renault said, uh, could have been fixed already by this time. Um, and both sides are still running into these difficulties. The, one of them being um, trainees having a very different skill sets and um, need to somehow adjust to each other within um, a very short period of time. It's 
four to six weeks. Um, there is also a difficulty with uh, um, drone employment into the training. Um, so there was still, as German said, Luft nach oben, there is still room for development for um, this mission to become even better. Well, um, it is absolutely what uh, like some, uh, some uh, people from the audience write in the comments, um, pointing out the uh, ambiguity of uh, this training mission. For example, one of the, uh, one of the viewers writes, uh, Ukraine needs high-level training for common stuff and large formations. This takes years to develop, but is essential for successful large-scale operation. As far as I understand, there was no training mission for high-rank officers, only for uh, like troops who, who can, uh, like who, who fight uh, directly with the enemy, like the platoon battalion level. And another one is writing uh, his question, all saying, uh, "NATO doesn't really train independent countries' militaries. It tries mainly to get them all work together as one." So it's once again, it's about. Uh, like a combined, no, it's not even combined armed, it uh, about like cooperating between military forces. What I um, experienced when I was talking to the Ukrainian soldiers uh, in Ukraine and uh, on this stage, I uh, ask you to pay attention to the donation link, uh, which you can find in the um, description of this live stream, but also you can see now uh, uh, in the lower part of the screen, a donation link and a QR code. We support uh, the Ukrainian army with equipment which we may send to them as a German uh, organization. And we are constantly in contact with them and bring them equipment they need. So when I talked to them, they said that, especially in the beginning, they had very special needs which they had, like how to pass a minefield, how to cross a minefield, or how to efficiently use commercial scale drones, which they have a lot of them. Oh, how they co uh, coordinate the usage of drones with artillery and other things. How can they uh, do all these things which are vital for them and which are their daily life? And for all the questions, they had a very simple answer from the NATO instructors or EU instructors. Oh, we don't know, we never did it. There are two views on that problem. First of all, um, um, yeah, it is true that um, the German army or any other European or NATO member state army um, doesn't have the understanding how the Ukrainians fight. And to solve this problem, there needs to be boots on the ground. It's not necessarily needs to be military boots per se, but it should be people who understand how military training works, what um, skill sets um, soldiers require um, in order to achieve specific aims. Um, and unfortunately, that has not been yet the case. Unfortunately, um, EU or NATO member states are hesitant in sending observers to Ukraine to take those lessons. On the other hand, there is a different argument made by the EU um, side of the training that the general level of expertise and preparedness to fight in a war is relatively low, especially when it comes to people of older age. It's very difficult for them to get back in shape or to be able to combine um, just as simple war fighting techniques with something else such as drone um, employment. And so in order to introduce more difficult tasks, they need to polish to a certain extent to, to the better stage, the more basic skill set. Um, and it takes time. And if this basic skill set is polished, only then can they introduce something more, diff uh, more difficult or more complex, such as nighttime training or drone employment. Um, so yes, there is this discontent, but it has uh, multiple root problems. And it's unfortunately is not solvable by just simply introducing more and more and more um, tasks to um, to the uh, training itself. Yeah, we have one of comments which writes, oh, training is useless if there is no ammo. I can only uh, roger on that. But Frankie, you have a comment on, on that statement. Yeah, well, you know, this is the tough thing is, yes, like we need uh, observers on the front, but the other difficulty is the fact that there is no standardization among all the different uh, Ukrainian Brigade, so a lot of it's all personality driven uh, and education driven, and, and and I think that's the other tough part, is that when you you know you hear the complaints of Ukrainian troops being trained by the Americans or Europeans or what have you, you know it's the fact that there isn't a coherent way in which Ukraine sends these people to these courses 
outside of Ukraine. And it's because they just get told at the last minute, we need to fill these courses with people and they just do a random grab bag. And so that, again, that also creates extra frustrations. The fact that people are being sent to courses that they didn't volunteer for. Uh, I think one person that we met that, uh, Reno and Sasha and I met, the person was actually a drone operator for a year and a half and he was on leave and randomly got sent to uh, an advanced assault sapper course. And he's like, this isn't what I'm going to do, but apparently they needed bodies to, to do this course in Germany for five weeks. And so, yeah, I mean, and, and it is really difficult to, you know, adapt and tailor these courses, you know, when you don't know which unit this person's going to because each unit on the front has a different command and control structure. Will Reno, you have anything else to I'm add? sorry for interrupting you. Is it because oh. uh, there are a lot of uh, stakeholders in organizing these courses? Uh, where does this uh, miscommunication come from to send a drone operator to, to, to do uh, assault uh, training is not a quite clever uh, allocation of resources? I'll defer to Will Reno if you if I think he has a pretty good answer to this. <laughs> I, I think that the problem is that an officer uh, receives a command, which is that, okay, we got to send a bunch of guys uh, for training in Germany. And then the guy goes to his subordinate and says, okay, uh, we got one week, get, you know, start, start picking people, get them together. And, you know, this is a problem, um, of command inside Ukraine. I'm not sure about the details of how this gets organized sort of at the initiation, but the execution seems to be somewhat haphazard. You know, you look at that process alongside, for example, how specialized units in Ukraine recruit people, you know, through social media, for example. And, you know, so your skilled people, people who want to, um, you know, be proficient and survive at the front. What what they're looking for is they're looking for other people who are experienced, who are going to be able to protect them, you know, while they fight and help them get skilled up. So I think that, you know, one of the mismatches is that you have a training system um, that includes sending soldiers outside of Ukraine, uh, you know, through this bureaucratic process, but then you have Ukrainians themselves within their own military you know, who, like any other military, are, are, you know, trying to figure out in the fight how to identify people who have skills or have potential uh, to have skills and then, you know, try to attract them uh, to, to places where they think that, that they're going to be useful. If there was some way <laughs> to try to integrate that type of selection process, for the soldiers who are sent outside of uh, Ukraine for training and then be able to integrate that with the expertise that uh, German or, or British or whoever uh, Polish trainers are able to offer. I think that that would be a, a better model, but that takes a fair bit of coordination, which uh, we uh, don't see at present. <laughs> Thank you for this for this comment. I would like to elaborate, but I know that Frankie needs to run away to the next meeting. That's why I want to grab the opportunity and ask you, Frankie, when you meet all the Ukrainian soldiers, I know you have been to uh, Germany uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago and to visit and training area. Uh, what is the most uh, acute need or uh, what is the most acute needed skill the Ukrainians tell you we want to learn that? And what do you think the NATO troops can learn from the Ukrainians? It's honestly, it's the integration of drones and drones and drones. <clears throat> and the tough thing is, uh, if you're a, a, a military a trainer from, a, from any Western military country, our doctrine and tactics just have not caught up or adapted to the war in Ukraine. And so uh, that's probably one of the biggest friction points. Uh, and, you know, like the way the Germans told us that they were handling that is they're just like, we get it. You guys, you know, keep telling us and giving us feedback. That's not how we do it. That's not how we do it because we would use drones. And the Germans basically just say, well, we're just going to make you as good as we possibly can make you in, you know, uh, doing a trench assault. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's, I guess you could say, like, you know, when all else fails, we'll just make you really good at the basics of doing uh, 
trench assault. But again, even then, you know, we met a lot of German officers who are like, we don't have any doctrine or manuals like for a modern day trench assault. So they were basically having to wing it by, you know, a lot of these guys were telling us like, yeah, we had to like dust off all these old German manuals from World War One and World War Two on how to do trench assault. And we just sort of used our common sense at, at looking at, you know, videos on Twitter to try and, you know, maximize a more realistic training environment. And we got to watch a couple of trench assaults. And I could tell you there were no drones involved because they just like we don't have, have the training or authorities or capabilities to do that. So, again, it's it, it's it's a really tough situation right now, I think, for, for all the training programs. Will? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's it's. I, I, German trainers have a lot to offer in terms of, you know, training and basic tactics. And, you know, that's, that's actually important. Um, but the most efficient way to use a soldier's time, I think, is to try to figure out what, what Ukrainian soldiers are actually proficient at. And there's an opportunity for mutual learning. I mean, if you have the right selection process and you get Ukrainian soldiers who might be more advanced in things like the integration of drones in, in you know, small unit tactics, that that's something that, that uh, German trainers can offer opportunities you know, to improve skills, but they can learn at the same time. And I think if they're learning at the same time, what that does is that gives Ukrainian soldiers an opportunity to think about their own situation, you know, the, their own context on the battlefield. And, and be able to develop ideas and, and integrate that maybe, you know, more systematically in, in their own doctrine and, and um, to improve skills. I, I mean, there, there are different ways to organize a curriculum. And one of the things that impressed, I think, both Frankie and me interacting with German trainers is that there is a, a, a fair bit of openness there's some frustration among them, but you know it's a it's a positive frustration, I think, in a way, because of of all the European training that we've seen, I think that the the German curriculum is is the most well developed and the one that, at least in principle, is is uh, most open to to flexibility. We can contrast that maybe with uh, some of the others that w that we've seen. Wanted to think. I'm not sure if Jahara Frankie Matetic is with us still. If he's left or not, I want to thank him a lot for his expertise and for his <laughs> insights. Uh, he's a Lieutenant Colonel of uh, the U.S. Air Force and a military professor at the U.S. Naval College, and he is a, a non-visiting uh, fellow at the European Resilience Initiative Center. And thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, will Reno for uh, what your insight offer us and one more question which I would love to ask you before I, I let you go and uh, do your uh, research business now when you look at the results of what we have achieved now like we have like several brigades being completely trained in Germany and they come back they fight they get restructured and I know that some battalions which have been trained in Germany, they don't have any person anymore who has been trained in Germany. Not because they are killed in action or missed in action or wounded in action, but because they have been transferred to another unit or someone like, uh, um, like got like some another assessment, they don't do what they were trained to do, etc. Uh, is this process too slow and too low scale? The process of, of Western trading? I... <laughs> I mean, at the risk of <laughs> maybe being too critical, I think it's also it, it it it's a question of the organization of Ukraine's military. Uh, I mean, you know, why do people get moved around? You know, what are the reasons for this? You know, why is an expertise concentrated in in certain kinds of units? And um, you know, I think that this is this is part of the problem on both sides is that you have different organizational cultures and in order to make this third party training work better um, those organizational cultures and those interests have to be better aligned and and you know i think that this is this is a lot of what what we've been seeing there's a lot of opportunity i think for nato militaries to learn from ukraine because there's a process of organizational learning that's organic 
at uh, frontline areas. And, you know, un unlike Frankie, I'm able to travel in, in Ukraine. And you do see people that innovate. <laughs> Boots on the ground to get first-hand experience and knowledge is the key part for the NATO trainees to know what they train. But the NATO soldiers may not go to Ukraine. We know that no U.S. soldier may enter Ukraine, active soldier, I mean, to get that experience, even not for a fight, just for collecting information, for making interviews, for talking to people. Is that a problem? I, I think it's a big problem. And, you know, politically, I'm not going to be able to solve that problem. I could offer a different model of training, which is what I would do is I would bring, uh, or I would ask Ukraine authorities, send people that you can afford to send who already have skills, who you think are really good at what you do in the type of war that you're fighting. Um, bring them to NATO countries. And, and you know, there's a process of mutual learning that can go on because if, if the Ukrainian has to train the NATO soldier, in that process of training the NATO soldier, at least explaining what their uh, battlefield conditions are and what kind of needs that they have, which is important information, you know, for um, governments and militaries that want to give further assistance to Ukraine. But in that process of explaining what they do, they also learn. And I think that rather than this kind of, you know, primary school top down, you know, guy who hasn't had the experience of these Ukrainian soldiers training these Ukrainian soldiers, you know, as best he can, that, you know, some other kind of model would work a lot better. You know, maybe it would result in fewer Ukrainian soldiers being trained. But I think that um, it would be a um, mutually more beneficial type of, of arrangement. And some of the German trainers that we talked to, I mean, in some ways, you know, they think about models like this. You know, how do you turn um, the student into an instructor in a way that uh, benefits the student and um, aligns the instructor with what the student's actual conditions are and what the student's actual needs are? And, and you know, that's something that uh, there, there are all kinds of experiments in military training. Assistance, for example, struggle against colonial rule. You know, that um, Scandinavians had a lot of experience with this, uh, you know, decades ago. How do you um, actually understand what it is that, um, you know, the person who's being trained needs? Uh, and you have to get your head into their experience in order to, to provide that kind of beneficial curriculum. And, you know, unfortunately, NATO soldiers can't go to those places and see that directly and then take that knowledge. But 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 there are other ways to do that that, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to the politicians to figure out the other stuff. But absolutely, but absolutely. The... <laughs> military personnel should do military staff and military professors study their their field on the politicians should yeah. do their job. They cannot hide behind the backs of the uh, experts. Uh, thank you so much. It was uh, Dr. Will Reno, who is a professor at the Northwestern University and the chair there. And he's also a non-visiting fellow at the European Resilience Initiative Center. Thank you so much for your insight, uh, Dr. Reno. And I'm coming back to Sasha Stalina, who is a policy fellow at the Jacques Delors Center in Berlin. We have one of questions from our uh, audience uh, saying that the uh, amount of the number of types of weapons which Ukraine has been provided and Ukraine has to use is one of the key reasons for the problems in the Ukrainian army. And that is also what I read in your paper, which you published uh, on the types of um, ammunition and arms. You have even used the uh, term uh, weapons zoo, pointing out that uh, it is actually it is more a collection of different types. How, how large is that problem? I need to emphasize that that's not my term that was um, used by the former Ukrainian Defense Minister um, Brezhnikov, who said that I need to operate a military zoo. And that's the best description you can imagine when it comes to um, describing um, the number um, of uh, different weapons systems that um, the Ukrainian army uses. It um, partially originates from the problem that Ukraine needed to go and ask for help for different countries and then 
took whatever was available um, to Ukraine at the moment. Partially the problem is that um, NATO itself and the EU itself um, didn't manage to solve this problem for what many decades because um, First of all, the number of platforms employed in, in the EU, in the EU member states, is six times as high as uh, the US, for instance, um, using. Um, and so you need to produce not only a weapon system per se, but also ammunition and spare part, and that all complicates the logistics, not only in the EU, because that's one of the problems, because you need to get a special military permission to cross an internal border between the EU member states, and then it takes, well, the EU had its objective to reach a five-day permission issuing term several years ago, and this objective has not been yet achieved. So it's the logistic problem on the EU side, and then you can imagine um, the logistical difficulties that Ukraine um, faces when it has to organize the delivery of different weapons um, platforms and systems to the um, front line, and then also ensure that there is enough spare parts and ammunition um, and et cetera, et cetera, available um, for the soldiers. Um, and so that's the problems that did not originate in Ukraine per se, but was, so to say, um, imported to Ukraine with Western aid. Um, a similar problem of, of different root causes um, exists in the EU training for Ukraine here in Germany, because after an accident um, last year at one of the training um, um, sites, uh, the Bundeswehr decided not to use um, Kalashnikov rifles for training anymore. Um, and they had to switch for um, German rifles, which are absolutely different. And out of six weeks of a training program, the Bundeswehr now has to spend a week just to get those soldiers um, adjust to a new weapon or to a new rifle that they will never use when they're back in Ukraine. Um, so this, this military zoo is a real problem when it comes to training, when it comes to fighting and solving it. Um, and I'm going to throw the buzzword interoperability, interchangeability. The objectives that NATO has been trying to achieve for many decades is what also going to improve um, the successes of the Ukrainian army um, on the front line, the successes in training programs, and also the successes and the level of interoperability um, and ability to work together in Europe, even in peacetime. And exactly as uh, correctly our uh, viewers mentioned, Ukraine needs ammunition and Ukraine needs more than weapons. It cannot be uh, counted as a success when Ukraine gets uh, 30 years old weapons in low quality, low quantities without ammunition to say no, you fight. Also because the problem is that um, the amount of ammunition available in stock is limited. And so if you use those Soviet type, Soviet time weapon system, the only countries that you can go to and ask for more munitions are Russia friendly. And so you get a system and you're happy that you got something, but there is no ammunition, no spare parts to use it. What are you going to do about it? Well, it is a, a one million dollar question and we definitely would be happy to discuss it further and try to find a solution. But our time for this panel uh, is coming to its end. Don't forget to uh, share this uh, program. Don't forget to subscribe to both channel European Resilience Initiative Center and Silicon Curtain. You will have next panel, Jonathan Fink, who uh, you missed, and as I saw in the, in the comments, and uh, you will have it for sure. Uh, don't forget to use the donation link and to open the donation link in the commentary sec uh, in the description section of this video we are providing the ukrainian army with needed equipment which we may bring as a german organization uh, for their needs and this equipment is highly needed we are talking to the soldiers in the field and asking them directly what they need and how we can help them you're in the middle of eight hours tv marathon in support for ukraine we are going now for a short break with a pre-recorded interview, especially for this TV marathon. And after that, we will switch back to life. Don't switch off. we are witnessing really is uh, the result of decades of, uh, uh, of a campaign run by Russian intelligence really, um, so that it's really easy for them to detect the vulnerabilities and conduct um, measures of demoralization.
So, um, yes, what we're witnessing right now is a campaign of demoralization, like we've seen them before. Uh, we've seen them uh, um, also um, instrumentalizing the peace movement uh, for that purpose, but also um, we have seen campaigns um, smearing uh, politicians who are supporting the deliveries of, of, of uh, weapons at the same time, uh, by the way. Um, so it's a classic toolbox of demoralization, and it's no surprise to people who deal with such questions. We can definitely say that some German uh, politicians um, owe their careers to um, measures of infiltration. Um, this is the case of uh, several members of the current Bundestag on the side of the AfD. Uh, we also see some very worrying ties among uh, Die Linke, formerly known Die Linke, now um, people who have defected to uh, Sarah Wagenknecht's uh, new political party, uh, people who have uh, visited the Donbass region, met with uh, uh, Russian intelligence there. Um, this, is, this is really worrying, yes. So yes, we can definitely see, say that. There has been a very interesting um, investigation conducted by the insider, um, um, by uh, Spiegel as well. Um, those were joint efforts. Um, and they have actually uncovered the classic textbook case of, of an infiltration uh, with a member of the uh, current uh, Bundestag, who had an aide who, who himself could classify not as an asset, but actually as an agent. Um, so yes, there is a difference. An asset um, is somebody who is uh, strategically placed in a certain context, um, who is a helpful for the agenda of an hostile entity that can be activated uh, for that purpose. Some are assets wittingly and or unwittingly. Um, uh, we have also the category of, uh, of fellow travelers, people who are happily volunteer to conduct such operations. And then we have agents. Agents are actually people working for intelligence agencies. Um, and that's their job. They are trained. They are trained to steal um, information, uh, they are trained to uh, conduct uh, measures of um, intimidation, destabilization, you name it. Uh, and in the case of, of Russia, they are even trained to conduct wet, wet jobs, as we have witnessed in, in Germany. So um, it's very far from, um, from what we, uh, we could suspect if we just watch James Bond movies. There is a there is a part of the agent work that is uh, really an office job, uh, analytic job. There are certain uh, vulnerabilities that are known that have been detected because they've been studied. We know, for instance, from former defectors such as Ladislav Pittman, who used to serve uh, uh, in the uh, Czech, uh, in the, the Czechoslovak um, intelligence services and defected uh, later, that um, most of the first uh, part of, he, of, of his job was really um, observation and detection and um, uh, conceive or, or the, the conceptualization of um, of, a, of psychograms. Uh, and when they had extracted a, a certain profile from the data that they had been um, gathering, uh, they actually knew which button to push. Uh, and um, the target person was then uh, used as such. Um, means that, um, of course, they know which button to, pu to push. Uh, that's actually what makes... Uh, the interesting part of their job, it's the very detection of those vulnerabilities. These um, 
sides of, of, of weaknesses can, uh, can be cultivated along the line of aspiration or frustration. Uh, this is a work of, that takes many years and um, it, it's, uh, it, it's a very tricky part of the trade of espionage. Um, and a handler um, has a very important role in that, uh, in that context. It's the person that is going to bring the target person to either carry out a mission or deliver an information by using these weaknesses and using these vulnerabilities. Now, there is what we call the German angst. Um, so the German angst, uh, to give you an example, uh, played a role in, um, in one of the, the operations of, the, uh, of Russian intelligence, uh, the famous uh, case of the nuclear winter. Now, how do we know about the nuclear winter, disinformation related to the nuclear winter? Because we had a defector called Sergei Tretyakov, who defected, he was a, a, an SVR uh, officer, and he defected uh, to the United States. And as every defector, he had um, enough, um, he had assembled enough files, which he was able, he, which he was able to hand, um, hand over to the uh, to the FBI and um, was debriefed as well by the CIA. And um, we learned that the nuclear winter campaign that reached Germany in the 80s was actually uh, the, the product of, uh, of, a, of a campaign of Russian intelligence um, in which um, Mr. Tretyakov had uh, participated um, to scare off uh, the Germans about an imminent um, atomic uh, war and the consequences for, uh, well, for humanity. Uh, and the button is still working, by the way. We see it now. Uh, Putin is um, aptly um, using this uh, type of um, technique to scare uh, the Germans. Uh, so basically the answer is very easy. Every human being um, has um, vulnerabilities and fears. Some because uh, they come from trauma, others uh, other because of education. And when the other side has a psychogram, and they are aware of the traumas and they are aware of the weaknesses, it is where they will push in terms of disinformation, of course, to um, destabilize or to subvert or to scare. That's the way Russian intelligence works. And German angst is one particular sign uh, of our, if I may say so, German character. And the, uh, the other side knows how to use it. So yes, we are scared of, a, of, nuclear, uh, of the nuclear threats. And this is why Vladimir Putin is repeatedly using this type of rhetorics, because we, as a target group, are very vulnerable when it comes to these types of, uh, of threats. He doesn't try these other these type of threats, let's say, with uh, with the British target group or British politicians. Well, first of all, uh, Great Britain uh, is a nuclear power, and second of all, um, the the British political class is very well aware of those techniques. And they react accordingly. Same thing in France, where Macron has, in my sense, uh, replied um, in, a, in a very uh, capable way to the threats from Moscow, in that, that he uh, kept a strategic ambiguity as to what France could do or could not do. Uh, it's exactly the way to deal with such threats. 
And then we have uh, Olaf Scholz, who obviously didn't get the memo. And welcome back. And this is our final panel of the day. And today I'm joined by Nikolai Klimenyuk. I think I've pronounced that correctly, hopefully. <laughs> and we've got Operator Starsky, who needs no introduction. I think you'll all be familiar with his incredible materials. This large, this last panel is going to be about how Russia weaponizes everything, including information, memory, and politics. Now, that's a huge subject. We will uh, see if we can exhaust the topic. That means we'll be here for the next 24 hours. Now, seriously, this is going to last about an hour or so. We'll see how far we go. And um, it's going to be more of a discussion because I think this is a topic that, uh, that we go into a lot of depth. But we have someone here who, of course, has been on the front line of Russian disinformation and is now dedicating his time to fighting it, which is our Operator Starsky. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But let's, talk, let's start about some of the origins of Russian disinformation and the paranoia that sits behind it. And of course, it's not just about narratives, it's also about technology. So when the Xerox came into being, that was seen as an incredible threat to the Soviet regime. You needed a permit to actually access this because information is power, information is a threat. And we now see that same paranoia being projected onto the new technology of the internet. And rather than being seen as a benign uh, instrument for human progress, uh, in the paranoia of the Kremlin, it's seen as a CIA and Western plot. So I'd like to throw that out first, uh, this idea about narrative requiring technology and technology being a threat to totalitarian regimes. Nikolai, let's chuck that one over to you for starters. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I've heard the question, but yeah, I'm, um, let's say, I. I think disinformation is just one part of the problem and I don't think it's even the the biggest and the uh, most dangerous one because well it's uh, it's about uh, manipulation it's about spreading confusion and uh, honestly speaking uh, disinformation and all those manipulative techniques they don't work very well in in a sound and healthy environment. So they mostly relate to, uh, um, to pre-existent um, problems. And yeah, we see, we see it in Germany. Germany, um, German parts of the German population, parts, parts of the German society are highly susceptible to, uh, to manipulations. But not all of those manipulations are really disinformation. Um, you've been already discussing things like um, the narrative of Ukraine being a highly corrupt country, for example. Well, there is corruption in Ukraine. This, the, the, the question is not, uh, um, is not if you are lying about it. The, the question is how you frame it. And... Um, yeah, the main spreaders of uh, you know pro-Russian narratives or uh, narratives that are helping uh, Russia are not necessarily Russian uh, internet trolls or Russian propaganda uh, outlets. These are German politicians, for example, or these are German pundits um, on the telly or. Uh, you know, editors at uh, uh, public broadcasters who invite people like that and let them uh, uh, let them spread the bullshit. <laughs> That's an interesting point. There, I'll, I'll send that over to you, uh, Mr. Sarsky. So, the suggestion here is that this kind of propaganda will always exist 
as long as there are malign actors, but actually the onus needs to shift on those who are supposedly responsible owners of the media and those who are receiving the information to perhaps become more adept at questioning and de you know, deconstructing what they're receiving uh, to be perhaps a little more cynical. Uh, well, I think first option is uh, will be more uh, effective because uh, we always talk about uh, the need to educate people, to uh, teach them how to uh, do fact check, and etc., etc. But it's something that people should know by by default, right? Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, add something to um, uh, to the uh, opinion. Uh, uh, said by, by uh, Nikolai. Um, so uh, it's not like uh, there is uh, some part of uh, audience that is uh, more susceptible to the uh, Russian propaganda, some of them are less. Um, everything starts at basic PR. According to the basic PR, uh, every uh, sort of your um, informational operation must be uh, aimed at some specific uh, target audience. And uh, this is what Russians do perfectly. They know how to work with the target audiences that uh, may benefit uh, their interests, that may be more susceptible to their agenda. Uh, that's why they're targeting uh, specific groups of people, men, women, uh, different age categories, uh, different, uh, let's say, faith categories, religions, uh, etc., etc. And uh, this works because Russians basically invented propaganda. People who say that uh, there's propag propaganda on the West, you know, they don't realize that uh, Russians invented the, 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 the mechanism of propaganda back in the times of the Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, it was so much effective, so Stalin, um, in the end, had to eliminate the professional revolutionaries because uh, they are um, not their ideas, but their skills uh, were dangerous for the Communist Party. They were dangerous for the uh, existence of the Soviet uh, Union, so uh, he had to have them eliminated. Um, and. Um, Speaking of the danger that uh, the modern technologies pose to uh, to the existing regime in Russia, well, we basically can see from the news that Russians are uh, blocking different uh, resources. Uh, two years ago, they blocked um, Facebook, Instagram for being extremist. Uh, recently, there are news that uh, they were gonna block. Um, Steam, which is a gaming platform for, for millions of Russians who like, who like to play games, again, because Steam does not correspond to the standards uh, made by the Roscom Nadzor. Uh, so we can see that uh, they're um, cutting all the channels that can, can be potentially used uh, against the Russian regime, but at the same time, it, so, some of those decisions are completely ridiculous like Instagram, like uh, Steam, uh, I, think, I think it's kind of funny. But uh, on the other hand, of course, they, they might have uh, true reasons to, to do that because they're thinking like, uh, basically like, like partisans because Russians are uh, par partisans in the in internet warfare and they're using boat I'm farms. I'm really glad you used this word because I was thinking of partisans in a, in a, in a different context. Yeah, and, and, uh, and they realize that uh, commentaries, even in the discussion under some game releases on Steam, they may be dangerous because uh, people can freely post their ideas there and uh, it can be used against the regime. There is one thing, if I may, uh, which I would like to add to what you've just said. And this is, um, yeah, about, you know, old Bolsheviks. It was not only that they were masters of propaganda, they were um, organizing themselves in exile. And they're very efficient at that. And so the Russian, the Soviet, in, in this case it was the Soviet uh, repressive machine and the Soviet uh, propaganda machine was firing from all, you know, weapons against um, uh, against emigres. So they did everything to discredit the very idea of a successful political fight from 
uh, abroad, from mostly from Europe. And we see how it works uh, uh, until now. So the uh, uh, Russian political immigrants are actually uh, absolutely disoriented and they don't really know what, can, what they can do from abroad. So they just, you know, okay, we don't have a moral, uh, you know, right to, to tell the people what to do. Hmm. Yeah, okay, we can't organize them uh, in the West because, well, uh, we are in safety and they are not, and we can't do that uh, in Russia because, uh, uh, because it's too dangerous and so on and so forth. So this is, this is actually also an element of Russian propaganda. So it, uh, this, this great narrative uh, prevents successful political uh, opposition operating um, from the West. And I don't want to twist the conversation and, and, and focus on Navalny because that's a, an insult to, to, to uh, a Ukrainian guest here to bring the, you know, take the oxygen up with that. But this seems to have influenced his thinking to go back. This very thing that you've mentioned there, I can't be an effective political operator in the West. I have to go back and be there. There may be other things going on as well, but this seems to have, have played into that mm. decision making, not strategically, the best decision, probably. Mm. Uh, I, I, I don't think this is the uh, this was the worst uh, decision, <laughs> decision ever is made. Uh, the problem, the basic problem uh, with all major position uh, figures in Russia, that the war and the uh, militarism, the uh, uh, aggressive character of Russia never played a role. When we are speaking about Navalny in his uh, uh, 2017 presidential program, there were two men one mentioning of Ukraine that we should normalize uh, the relationships and the uh, uh, one mentioning of Crimea, uh, uh, um, this uh, should be th this question should be decided by the Crimean uh, inhabitants. That's it, uh, uh, and and this is also one of the bigger uh, bigger differences between you know the um, the old school Bolsheviks and the more current Russian positions. The Bolsheviks they had ideas and they uh, saturated uh, Russia, the Russian Empire, uh, with those ideas. Uh, Russian current Russian opposition doesn't have any ideas. They, you know, imagine uh, uh, some kind of better Russia without Putin, without uh, corruption. But this is the same, uh, the same old Russia, which is a uh, an existential threat to to Ukraine, to any neighboring country, to the world, to whatever. This is a an evil uh, um, colonial empire. Um, so this is the problem and the decision to go back to Russia, which was tactically not very wise and fatal uh, in this case, was part of this uh, of the thinking, was not surprising at all. And so fighting essentially a psychopathic killer and his enablers with information is potentially not going to work here. I use this as an example of you know, coming to a knife fight with a spoon. You're, you're not going to come off too well in that instance. Um, does Ukraine give us a template for how this kind of uh, m regime with murderous intent need to be tackled? We have the Orange Revolution and then we have Maidan, where people are prepared to use violence, to resist violence and to survive. I mean, is, is that perhaps more of a template for how to resist rather than this sort of you know, informational uh, warfare? Uh, so the events in Ukraine during the Revolution of Dignity uh, demonstrated that it's really hard to fight uh, using democratic measures, democratic tools, in a country that is ruled by a regime that despises democracy, where democracy simply doesn't work. And this is when you definitely have to use force uh, in order to uh, reach your goals. And uh, the goal in Ukraine, uh, the, the, the whole goal of the uh, Revolution of Dignity was uh, removing the dictator, removing the uh, pro-Russian influence in Ukraine and uh, conducting democratic elections, which was done. 
uh, a lot of people uh, who say that uh, it, it was a coup and everything else, they don't understand that the result of this uh, revolution was uh, democratic elections of government and president. And since that time we had several elections. And uh, basically Ukrainian revolution uh, apparently it was uh, the only revolution in the Eastern Europe that actually was successful uh, comparing to what happened in Belarus, what uh, happened several times in uh, Russia. Uh, Georgia. The, uh, Georgia, Georgia is still yeah. sort of holding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, this is why even when we talk about the Russian oppositionists who say that uh, Ukrainian uh, way is not our way, like like Max Katz, for example. We should not listen to Ukrainians because this is not our way. Uh, well, I think that they really should do that because uh, our revolution was successful uh, and uh, we managed to remove the dictator that was uh, killing our citizens. And uh, basically, even though he was also democrat like democratically elected because he falsified, uh, the, he forged uh, elections several times, uh, but uh, still, uh, he uh, um, basically betrayed the idea of being a president who guaranteed uh, things like Ukrainian language, who guaranteed the integrity of the Ukrainian state, who uh, uh, in invented the not invented but uh, implemented this uh, informational campaign that split Ukraine in three categories, uh, different sorts of people, which was insane. Um, and uh, it was, it, Ukrainian revolution was a success in the end. And this is an interesting one because uh, this, this mythology that Russia is unique, Russia is distinct, Russia has to have its own way, it cannot learn from other political processes in other countries, you might think that that is something that, that, that has been spread under Putinism, but I heard this same idea in the 90s and it set off some alarm bells. I thought this is, and everyone is saying this to me, and it's as if everyone's watched an advert, as everyone's watched the same strap line, as if it's been coded into their heads. I wonder whether that idea dates back maybe into the, the Bolshevik period. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that mm -hmm. because, well, uh, you know, as well, uh, speaking about, you know, Russian uh, talking heads <laughs> and, and, and public figures, um, uh, one of the strongest uh, non-Kremlin narrative, narratives is uh, normalizing narrative. And the, uh, you know, the gallant figure of this, uh, of this normalization is Ekaterina Schulman, uh, who, uh, she's an extremely successful political pundit. So she's uh, calling herself a political scientist. She actually hardly publishes anything. She's all the time on, uh, you know, on, on YouTube. And what she's been doing for very many years, uh, long before the full-scale invasion started and long before she ended up uh, in exile, She's been normalizing everything. We are we are just a country like any other country. We are just a, we are a society just like any other society. So this uh, uh, there are two narratives uh, of you know Russia being uh, very unique and Russia being uh, uh, totally normal. Uh, they par paradoxically coexist. And um, uh, speaking about you know uh, mal uh, malign. Uh, um, manipu well, information manipulations uh, uh, coming from Russia. They are not necessarily, you, you know, intentional, uh, but some narratives that originate from uh, uh, in the opposition circles or in um, circles opposing uh, the Kremlin, not sympathetic with the Kremlin. Uh, Kremlin may be similarly dangerous. So this fixation, for example, uh, of uh, people like Navalny and uh, of the Russian opposition in general on corruption suggested that uh, this regime is driven uh, by financial interests, by material gain. This is their uh, objective. And it influenced the view of the regime uh, in the outside world 
uh, to, 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 to an enormous extent. So uh, this misconception of, of Putin as a pure kleptocrat uh, who would never risk losing his ex assets uh, uh, was one of the reasons, you know, why all, uh, this crisis uh, uh, happened. And uh, we, we shouldn't underestimate the role of the uh, regime opponents in Russia. So they were endorsing this narrative uh, that they are thieves, 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 uh, 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 and only thieves. And uh, corruption and uh, is the say is a different kind of economic interest. So you can uh, 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 you can govern in favor of your uh, economy, of your corporations, of your whatever, or you can govern in favor of your cronies. Uh, but this is the same type of government. And if you have your, uh, you know, if you are driven by ideas of domination, uh, if you are driven by imperial ideas, uh, if you are driven by stuff like that, it's totally different motivator. It's a totally different uh, uh, challenge, and you have to oppose it in a, in a totally different way. And this is one of the reasons why it was so difficult, you know, to break the big Russian narrative about, you know, there is a, a different Russia, we just have to uh, uh, um, uh, tread carefully uh, and uh, not to break, you know, our future uh, relationships and, uh, and business ties or whatever. Uh, and um, so you, if, th th there is certainly such thing as, you know, uh, disinformation coming from uh, government controlled or government inspired sources but the whole russian you know manipulative bubble has to be uh, has to be considered as a whole and unfortunately the uh, opposition uh, groups and opposition media are a part of this they provide also very important and correct insights in you know, investigative journalism and so on and so forth, but they also uh, endorse uh, you know, some narratives that are extremely dangerous and that are, uh, align themselves with, uh, with Kremlin narratives. Uh, because uh, there is the reason why uh, you know, the idea of the Ruski Mir, the, the, the Russian world, the uh, supremacist Russian idea, uh, there's a reason why it's based on, uh, you know, uh, skrepy, what, what Russians say, skrepy. Fixtures. Uh, Fixtures, yeah. yeah, yeah, basically. So uh, there's... So by the way. Yeah, um, there's several of them. There's uh, Russian church, Russian exceptionalism, Russian Ruska uh, Dusha, uh, Russian, Russian militarism, Russian sportsman. Uh, great Russian history, and those are foundations. And space exploration, uh, uh, ignoring the, the great. Kind of, kind of. Yeah. Kinda. Uh, so uh, there is a reason why this uh, this idea is strategic in Russia, because uh, it doesn't matter uh, if, if you uh, follow the Russian agenda or you're oppositionist, but over time, when generations of people are raised on those ideas, uh, they became basis for everyone. Uh, people who support the, the Russian exceptionalism and supremacy and people who believe they are oppositionists. Uh, that's why they have to re-educate. But again, it's a big problem because, you know, uh, Russian regime in, in its different shapes and forms uh, over the years spent tremendous uh, resources on raising those generations of brainwashed people and uh, it uh, will be really hard to reverse this process unless we spend uh, approximately the same amount of resources and time. And this is an interesting point here because I think the commonality between the 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st century in Russia is that whoever you are, whether you're intelligentsia, uh, working class, whatever, you don't necessarily have any agency over your fate or if it's political agency you're talking about you have none at all have never had any and that that leads to all sorts of fantasies and divergence from reality and, and myth making now this isn't to say that people in the east of ukraine because they spoke russian were 
Russian. But this idea that organic politics wasn't real, this idea that democracy isn't a real thing, that wasn't totally absent in Ukraine either in 1991. There were a lot of people who didn't necessarily feel it, understand it, live it, or have experience of exercising political agency. How did that evolve from the point of independence? Now, you could say that the culture of freedom and volia was there, but to translate that into a belief in the power of democracy, that, that must have come over several years. How did that evolve and percolate out through the country? Um, I think that uh, it started around uh, 2004, uh, around 2004 when Ukrainian people showed their incredible uh, skills in terms of self-organization. Uh, when the Orange Revolution began, uh, again it began with uh, uh, dictator Yanukovych forging the elections and those massive cases of, uh, you know, uh, falsified, you know, those, uh, those uh, uh, election bulletins just dropped into the boxes uh, in packs. Uh, which doesn't happen in like in, in the real life when they're dropped there one by one, but there are like packs of them inside of the boxes. And uh, uh, the regime uh, expected that people would just swallow that, you know, like uh, apparently they uh, still thought that, you know, uh, Ukrainians are basically like Russians, they don't uh, protest much, uh, which was not the case. Because uh, Ukraine, uh, I don't know, is it fortunately or, or unfortunately, but uh, Ukraine was uh, basically the, the cradle of, you know, protests since uh, early 20th century um, and, and centuries before. And uh, that's when Ukrainians uh, went on the streets and said, no, we, we, we're not buying that. Uh, we we have to you know cancel those uh, elections because this is what we see. It's not supposed to be like that. It's not the democracy, and that's uh, that's in my memory for the first time when Ukrainians showed their self organization uh, and uh, they showed that uh, they want to be a democratic society like the rest of the Europe. Um, so. I think, uh, it, it's again, it's my personal opinion, but uh, early 2000s is when we saw this, um, uh, uh, the evolution towards democracy in Ukraine. And later, of course, it was uh, confirmed by the Revolution of Dignity. Um, and uh, again, the Revolution of Dignity showed this incredible self-organization uh, self of Ukrainians because uh, Again, those people who say that, you know, it was a coup, they don't realize that a coup is by, according to all kinds of vocabularies, right? Um, it's when uh, some power takes control over the country, uh, be it uh, religious organization or political organization, military, whatever. But uh, in the Revolution of Dignity, which is very important, hundreds and hundreds of non-government organizations and just common people took part uh, because uh, they could not, uh, you know, uh, stand the idea that uh, you know some uh, pro-Russian dictator uh, will be turning our country into like fifth world country. You know, we wanted to be a democratic country, and uh, I think uh, all Ukrainian people demonstrated th their will 100% uh, during their revolution. Nikolai. Yeah, well, um, I mean, um, it, it, it would go probably too far if we would start discussing, you know, fundamental differences between the Russian society and the Ukrainian society, but there are some fundamental differences indeed, and they've always been there. Uh, like, um, a Russian society is extremely hierarchical, and it's organized around hierarchies and people are trained to, you know, to understand finest nuances of who relates to whom, how on this uh, uh, 3D hierarchical, you know, thing. And the Ukrainian society is in tendency uh, very egalitarian. Um, uh, 
um, which is one of the basic differences. Uh, it was it has never been totally suppressed under the Soviet rule, and. Um, if I may give you an example, an opposite example from Germany. If you look at the election maps, uh, you will realize that the uh, right-wing populist strongholds are the same, basically the same places that were uh, um, Nazi strongholds in the past, where they uh, gained their greatest successes before uh, the coup. <laughs> and uh, the population has completely changed and there is a, a huge proportion of migrants and uh, uh, internal migration and so far, uh, uh, so forth. But uh, there is this kind of, you know, institutional, institutional memory. What makes a city a city? What makes a country a country? And, 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 and this is what we are looking at here. Uh, I mean, it can manifest itself in different forms and in, in different circumstances, uh, but this is what, uh, uh, what actually happened here. And egalitarian does not necessarily mean uh, democratic, but this is easier you, you know, to come from egalitarian to democratic than from strongly hierarchical to, uh, uh, to democratic. Like you've got the right elements yeah, in the yeah. right place, and, so and, it can and, 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 and this mm -hmm. is why this uh, this is why it is probably very problematic, you know, to just adopt uh, uh, adopt some um, methods uh, from Ukraine and try to implement them. Uh, in other places, <laughs> let's put it like that. Uh, I, I agree with Nikolai because uh, comparing to Russians who have this strict hierarchy, um, Ukrainians, uh, which is a like it's our feature, which is both good and bad, but uh, Ukrainians generally don't really like authorities. You know that's why we would rather live in some kind of uh, uh, anarchy. Okay. Uh, where uh, a bunch of small communities can cooperate between each other and collaborate and have trade and stuff, but uh, we will never, uh, you know, uh, uh, be commanded by some single person, which, uh, of course, we try to change over time, but it's, you know, some, some uh, kind of Ukrainian feature that uh, dates back centuries probably. And, uh, of course, uh, a lot of people may say, but, uh, b but this is chaos, you know. But on the other hand, this is democracy. This is exactly the processes every uh, democratic nation went through uh, back in the days, you know. So uh, I think Ukraine has a great potential as a democratic country, 100%. We'll take some comments in a minute, but this is an interesting point which has been made over and over. I spoke to Peter Pomerantsev just a couple of days ago, he made the same point, is that propaganda cannot invent a problem. It yeah. cannot start from scratch. So if you try to convince Ukrainians that statism is best, that sort of chaos is far more detrimental than some kind of oppressive order, you're not going to get very far because it just it's not an idea that, that that has deep roots really it's going to be almost rejected like a like an organ that's out of your body whereas and this is very very broadly speaking the idea of there being a sort of stateless chaos um, isn't just something that the russian regime imposes on the people against their will it's an idea that has a ready audience that is potentially keen to say, okay, well, no, chaos is terrible. I mean, I can see that Ukraine has developed some benefits here, but yeah, that kind of chaos wouldn't work here in Russia. I've heard many people say, yeah, it might work for them, but we'd all start killing each other if it happened here. Now, whether that's real or not, or whether that's kind of a historical mythology or propaganda, there, seem, there, there needs to be some kind of synthesis between the propagandist and the audience, otherwise it's not gonna work. Uh, I think Russians are uh, really deeply uh, afraid of chaos um, because it's a fundamental break of hierarchies um, and nothing works. And we also have the, uh, here a very um, different understanding on, of what freedom is. Yeah, freedom is just a word that can be filled with very uh, different meanings. And in case of Ukraine, it's most certainly uh, 
related uh, to dignity. And, and, and this is not coincidence that the revolution of dignity is called that and not something else. And in, 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 in Russia, in this hierarchical uh, uh, society, which is actually accepted by everyone, it's, it, it, it's very difficult to understand, even for advanced intellectuals, uh, which we can see very often. Uh, so the idea of freedom uh, is generally, for very, very many people, for the vast majority of people, is uh, related to the absence of limits and limitations and restrictions. And it might sound like a paradox, uh, but uh, Putin is actually seen by very many people as a liberator because, well, the hierarchy, it's, it's a natural uh, kind of state of, uh, of things. You can't liberate people from, you know, seasons or from rain or from things like that. But you can l liberate them from the necessity, you know, to stay at home. And you give them umbrellas or you give them cars and they can move around. And here uh, they can do whatever the fuck they want. They can go and murder if they want. Uh, uh, I mean, not murder. to trivialise it, it sounds like the attempt to liberate the house elves in Harry Potter. They, they don't want to be liberated because even though you might live as a slave, you might live in, in some kind of fairly terrible conditions, you've got your orders, you've got, you know, who you know who's above you, you know who's below you, you're not given any responsibility. Now, what role does this play? That freedom isn't just about unlimited uh, chaos, but it's about taking some kind of responsibility, making decisions for yourself, having agency. And it seems to me that the Ukrainian interpretation of freedom means taking action, doing something within society or politically or whatever. Freedom isn't just something abstract or passive. It has no meaning in that sense. Is this what terrifies Russians? The idea that freedom would put some kind of burden of responsibility on you as an individual? Um, Ukrainian idea of freedom was described by uh, Les Podravyansky uh, like very, very specifically fuck off from Ukraine, okay? Just, just let us be. Just do not interfere, okay? Uh, and which I think is a, is a beautiful idea and uh, uh, there's all, all kinds of, you know, um, uh, there, there's all kinds of uh, alliances and forces and yada yada, but Ukrainians always wanted to be like uh, masters of their own land, which we have in our anthem, right? Um, I, idea of freedom is when you leave the uh, when you leave the way you want, and uh, generally people want to live prosperously, right? They they, they want uh, to have good well-being, they have, want to have wealth and things like that. It's normal. Uh, for Russians, it's different because Russians are taught, uh, again, uh, according to Dugin and Prilepin and uh, the, the general uh, Kremlin's agenda, they're taught that uh, you will never live prosperously like people on the West, but it's not your path, it's, it's, it's not your way. Your way is to live in poverty and suffer, but uh, you're suffering not just like some slaves or whatever, but you're suffering as good Christians, uh, Orthodox Christians that will definitely go to heaven uh, after you die. Uh, and uh, this is the idea. They, they see that, uh, for example, people in Ukraine, when Russian invaders uh, came to Bucha, they were shocked that uh, Ukrainians that were always described in the Russian media as, you know, the, the, like untermenschen, you know, uh, under, under like low-level people, they live much better than people in Russia because they have like good apartments, cars, uh, clean streets, uh, no dog poop lying, you know, scattered uh, on the children playgrounds and stuff like that, uh, which, which is very typical for like every Russian children playground. But they were shocked that uh, Ukrainians have right to, to live better than Russians. And that's why they were so much furious. That's why we saw all those uh, washing machines and conditioners uh, snatched from Ukrainian apartments. apartments. I mean, when you speak to individuals uh, whose 
actual possessions have been defiled, you will find that the destruction isn't just from soldiers living in their apartments, it's wanton destruction, defecation on their possessions, absolute obscenities. It's, it's much deeper than just it's theft been, or whatever. It's been described as a widespread phenomenon during the Russian so-called revolution, the Bolshevik uh, whatever, uh, revolt, and the civil war. Um, there is also a tradition that, you know, uh, house break-ins uh, in Russia, especially in the countryside. Uh, countryside, it happens very often. That, they, 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 I mean, that was a real problem. People just having their houses burnt down in the countryside for no good reason, just... Yeah, but the, the, this is what happens when, uh, when there are break-ins in Russia. So they don't even uh, only go into, into your house to steal your, you know, things. Um, they vandalize it and um, not to cover the tracks, but for the sake of it. And um, uh, there is an anecdote that I like very much. Um, it's from the early 2000s. There was a, a Russian, big Russian agricultural holding that bought a huge chunk of land in the, one of the black soil regions. Uh, where there was unemployment and all sorts of, you know, depression, post-Soviet depression. And they thought, oh, okay, we come uh, uh, to, to, to this region, we provide, we, we give jobs, we, we, we give uh, people good conditions, actually, uh, uh, and, and nothing worked. There was a lot of sabotage on, uh, on machinery, they could not recruit, um, uh, uh, recruit uh, local workers, they imported, brought uh, workers from other regions, they were attacked by the locals, and they were, uh, they were totally, uh, uh, totally confused, and then they commissioned a sociological service, a really big ones, uh, and the objective was to find the motivators. Uh, what can we do to, uh, 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 to make this thing work? And the results were, uh, were actually stunning. So people didn't, were not really interested in uh, a high standard of life. They were not interested in uh, having, you know, running water, water closets, uh, washing machines, whatever. Well, they didn't object that, but they were not really motivated by that. The only motivator uh, uh, and th this, uh, uh, this survey is available online, <laughs> this is very interesting. Uh, the only motivator um, was uh, that uh, the neighbor does not live better than me. And there were some recommendations and um, 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 how to uh, to make this thing work, and it was a kind of you, you, you know semi uh, colhos with a, uh, a strong uh, authority. Uh, oh, and, and they tried all kind of uh, of financial motivators, you, you know, bone and and things like that. Nothing worked, and then there was you know strong mutual control and uh, uh, firm leadership, and the, the holding is thriving. So this is, uh, this is hard sociology, uh, and hard sociology kind of uh, checked uh, by, uh, by economy. And, and it's a pure form of, of almost jealousy. It's like you, you get told what to do, but your, your fellow people need to be on the same level as you, not given any privilege. So this isn't about rights. This isn't about freedom, it's about privilege. It seems to be the, the, the pure interpretation, where you are in the system and what privilege you attain. Yeah, but this, is, this, this has to do with hierarchies. Because, uh, you know, if you are on the same level, you have to, uh, 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 you, you, you have to live you know, in a similar way. What do you think? You are better? Yeah, this is, this is a typical reaction. So when people start, you know, it, it's especially uh, uh, bad in the countryside when where people are, you, you know, closely uh, connected to each other, who know each other well, and, uh, that, that where there is no anonymity of big cities. So that, why is he doing this? Does he think or do they think they are better than us? 
pick up on you said, uh, um, OS, this idea that, yes, you've got the Orthodox Church, etc., etc., but isn't there more to it than that? It's not that you've got the Orthodox Church and it's good. You've got the Orthodox Church and it's better than somebody else's church. You might live in poverty, but that doesn't matter because you're part of a great country. Isn't this an essential part of keeping people quiet is to say, you know, this imaginary thing, we're going to tell you, you're, you're great because you're part of this. You might not feel it, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, absolutely. And it works, unfortunately. I remember uh, several years ago, there was this uh, Russian uh, comedian, uh, Zadornov, uh, who became uh, famous in Russia because, uh, so first of all, he was like uh, genuine Russian Nazi, okay, like Russian supremacist, and uh, every stand-up he would start uh, with the words, Americans are stupid, okay. Uh, first time he was banned from entering America after that, uh, and then he started like saying that, uh, like generally, uh, uh, like as if he was talking about people of the West, Both right? Are stupid. That's okay. Yeah, that and and uh, he was uh, he had like a lot of stand-ups that would would portray Russians in different uh, funny and stupid situations. All those situ situations were extremely stupid. Okay, but uh, at the same time he would uh, make people proud. Like, look, yes, we are stupid, we are ridiculous, but this is what makes us great nation, the strongest in the world. And uh, you know, whenever I see. Uh, uh, you know, like Russian comedian bloggers, for example, on a YouTube wearing shapka ushankas mm -hmm. and like drinking vodka and thinking that in 2024, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it looks funny. I feel uh, like really, really uh, sorry for those people that they still live like in, in the previous world. Uh, it, it, like it, it's a really hard topic, but uh, yeah. Uh, Things like uh, church, things like sportsmen, things like uh, army, uh, all this is used as uh, foundations of this uh, ideology of Ruski Mir that makes people think that they are chosen and they have this deep connection with cosmos and nature and yada yada and, and the God, of course. Um, and uh, the problem is, like comparing to other nations, yeah, it's normal to be a patriot of your country. But at the same time, you you should not hate other countries. Russians uh, percept all like all the NATO is Nazi. Okay, it's like as if uh, Russia is the only anti-fascist uh, country in the world, and then there's NATO, which consists of multiple Nazi nations that combined. Uh, a dream of destroying this uh, beautiful uh, Russian na uh, nation, which is like it raises several questions, right? Uh, is it so? Mm -hmm. And then you see, uh, I don't know if you've watched the 1420 channel where interviews are done on the street and something that comes up over and over again. It's a certain generation, typically, it's the older generation, and they just say, Nas they're, they're envious of us, which of course sounds ridiculous, but actually putting yourselves in their position, they don't have any frame of reference. Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned Zadornov because there was an, uh, a, a very remarkable evolution of this stand-up. Because originally it was a parody of, uh, uh, you know, of backward Russians. So it was some Russian idiot uh, who did stupid things and uh, kept saying Americans are, uh, are idiots. Uh, very, very soon it became sincere. Uh, so it didn't last. But yeah, uh, this is also very interesting that you mentioned this, um, you know, connection to to cosmos or uh, to something for uh, for the for the Russians. It, 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 it is a big question: what a person means uh, when the person says, "I'm Russian." What does it actually mean being a Russian? It's not, we know, it's not the language. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's not a territory, uh, because as we know, Russia is borderless, and this uh, uh, feeling of borderlessness is an essential part of this 
self-identification or I don't know, I don't even know how to, to put it correctly. And then um, there is this uh, intrinsic, uh, very deep uh, uh, connection uh, of this self-esteem uh, with natural resources. So as if the power of the earth, power of the nature, uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, oil or uh, animals in the forests, they go directly into you. Um, so you are not a part of, uh, uh, of a people, you are part of a natural force. And this makes you so unique and so superior. And other people, those idiots, they have to work for their prosperity. We are prosperous and uh, well off by nature. This is what makes us unique and this is uh, how this territory is uh, connected and, and, and expansion and the necessity to expand is connected to, to, understand, to, to, to the identity uh, if we put it in you know, modern uh, uh, terms. And for, for Ukraine it's obviously completely different. This is uh, a people on its earth, in its land. And this is how, uh, by the way, I'm, 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 I'm Crimean and it's, uh, it's always been, uh, well, always, it's been a long and painful, um, you know, history of uh, uh, mutual uh, uh, misunderstanding and uh, Crimea had a lot of difficulties to, you know, embrace Ukraine and Ukraine had a lot of difficulties to embrace Crimea and then with Crimean Tatars actually this uh, this happened because well for, for the uh, collective you know for, for the Ukrainian civic nation uh, and, and and this type of identity it's 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 perfectly understandable this is the people on its uh, in its land in in, in their land uh, the Crimean Tatars don't have any other uh, a homeland and they don't need any other uh, a homeland and this makes Crimea kind of understandable and every you know uh, pro you this is a stupid term I guess if you are a Ukrainian how can you be pro Ukrainian but you know every Crimean who has this sense of civic U Ukrainian civic identity I would think is extremely sympathetic uh, with the Crimean Tatar cause. Uh, this is what makes us Crimeans in this modern, you know, Ukrainian uh, uh, sense and not in the Russian imperial, uh, imperial sense. And that takes us back to propaganda because unfortunately propaganda is effective uh, in some levels. It's multi-layered and you hear many people saying, ah, well, Russian propaganda is, is simplistic and stupid. I don't fall for it. All that means is you've spotted something you identify as Russian propaganda, but there's a whole load of other stuff which you haven't identified as propaganda, which may be still influencing your thoughts and your behaviors. And Crimea is a, is a classic example of that because clearly it wasn't always Russian. Uh, clearly over history uh, there's been a process of colonization and displacement of the, the native population and yet the narrative that Crimea is not part of Ukraine and the majority uh, Russian speak and therefore you know by default are part of the Russian uh, Empire that unfortunately does percolate through and you still see that narrative amplified and repeated in the media. Yeah. And I'm picking up on one of the questions we've got uh, from the audience here is why is the media so inept at calling out some Russian propaganda narratives. Someone gave a, a classic example here, which is that every time Medvedev has one of his brain farts, um, it is reported almost verbatim in the Italian newspapers, is the example here. But let's not just pick on Italy, because you get the BBC, you get Western press, even in a country like Britain, which is fully squarely behind uh, Ukraine, you still get absolutely inept uh, headlines, and sometimes you get 
actual sort of repetition or echoing of Russian propaganda narratives. Why are we still so bad at this? Uh, uh, the problem is, uh, which is not really a problem uh, if we're talking about the democratic society, but people on the West, they were uh, raised with the understanding that uh, they must accept the like different points of view. Whenever you have a discussion, which is like basis of uh, democracy, there are people with different opinions, but they can find some uh, some uh, common solution, right? Some common idea. And uh, people on the West realize that uh, when you hear some kind of narrative, you, you, you try to like understand the, like the second party, right? You're trying to uh, walk their boots, okay? Uh, and uh, Russia uses this to basically destroy democracy uh, uh, in, the, in the Western democracies. Uh, because they go buy a labs in Ukraine, okay, or, uh, or genetically modified locust. Uh, I'm not, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm not, it's like, a uh, genetically yeah, modified locust that was brought by Americans to Donbass to destroy the Donbass, Donbassian um, crops. And uh, of course, people, they think like, yeah, majority of people go, well, it's a bullshit. Are you kidding? And they show some kind of, you know, some kind of basement where, uh, like, uh, those deathly viruses were uh, created by American uh, military uh, scientists. And they go, well, in this basement, they created, like, viruses that were spread by birds and mosquitoes. And uh, you go, this is bullshit. When you take a look at uh, facilities where... Yeah, where, where real scientists produce uh, combat, uh, you know, biological weapons, it's like they, they look absolutely different. They have like multiple layers of defense. They're like big structures with filters, with filtration stations and guards and everything. Not, nothing like that. Uh, but there are people who think, what if it's true? And, and this is why Russian propaganda is, is so dangerous, because when you think, but why, why if it's, what if it's true, then you start finding logical explanation why it can be true, you know, like uh, when you go and check Russian uh, um, resources dedicated to flat earth, okay, they're the most convincing ones, trust me. I saw a lot of them, but, <laughs> but uh, wh when you watch the Russian channels, you, you go, oh my God, We've been lied all this time, you know, uh, because, uh, because they know how to do it and uh, they know how to influence Western minds because Western people, they are open to hear the, the thoughts of, of, the, uh, you know, of the opponents. And uh, one thing people must understand that uh, Russia created propaganda. Russia is efficient with propaganda. Russia has no freedom of speech. Russia has no freedom of press. That's why, uh, what is even the point in uh, listening to Russian propaganda if their media are so much biased? They give you 10% of information, like Ukraine, uh, there, there's a corruption in Ukraine. Yeah, there's a cor corruption in Ukraine, but the rest 90% of information will be like uh, Zelensky bought two yachts, uh, Zelensky bought uh, like three castles, uh, which were like debunked like 100 times. Um, and people, they, uh, they get lost, they get confused. Uh, so one of the things is to accept the fact that Russia is lying. And for those people who think that, but everybody is like, no, you, you have not been to Russia where you have absolutely no freedom of speech and thought. If you stand uh, for 10 minutes outside somewhere with an empty banner, you're done. Yeah. Uh, it, Russia's not trying to target people like me and you who are going to say, hang on a second, I smell BS here. They're not going to waste their money on those people. So this is almost like a, it's like a marketing campaign. You're going to say, okay, which of our target audience is more susceptible? What are they susceptible to? Let's try that out. But also, I mean, this could be an interesting scientific study. If you want to actually convince someone to believe in something, that's at the top end of your cost scale. That's really difficult. But if you can convince them to say, well, it might be true or it might not, that's a lot cheaper and a lot less effort to get them to that point, and that might achieve your ends. The other one is, 
you know, from it might be true, it might not. The flip side of that, and I still hear this, I've heard this from a lot of um, refugees actually that I've spoken to because we, we, we've helped out. If you can even get them to say, we'll never know. The world is more complex. We'll never know. It's not my place yeah. in life. You've already won. Propaganda's won with relatively minimal effort, actually. Yeah, absolutely. They're using this um, idea of, you know, implanting and growing cynicism in people. So people start questioning facts and they go, uh, we will never know the truth. The truth is too complicated. Uh, we must, uh, you know, listen to both sides. Ukraine, uh, which might be wrong and might be right, and Russia, which might be wrong and might be right. And uh, basically, when when you show them the results of Russian atrocities and them destroying cities and killing people and raping women and children in, in Bucha, in European, uh, they go, but everybody does that, you know. People are growing with this san uh, sense of cynicism, which is, again, it's, it's very, very uh, dangerous. This is the Tucker Carlson line, isn't it? Which, Basically, to me, yeah. pegs him as a propagandist, oh. not a journalist. That's a classic line right there. Yeah, but this is this, yeah uh, well, w w a great part of the problem is that our Western, uh, and I'm speaking now as a, as a, as a German citizen and, and resident, uh, that our... Uh, political elites and our media elites have lost the sense of truth. And our society was virtually corrupted by that. Uh, so there is this, you know, general idea now that we, pro what, 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 that, uh, you know, wrong politics uh, towards Putin have encouraged them. We've been sending uh, wrong signals to Moscow or to Peking for that sake. But we were also sending the same signals uh, into our own society. And what we see is that people who are responsible for the worst political decisions and who are dangerously close to big scale corruption, we don't know if they were involved or not because there were no uh, parliamentary hearings, for example. Um, uh, those people that no responsibility, like people like our federal president, uh, who was not invited uh, um, uh, to, to hearings, he was elected to represent to be the um, uh, the figure of uh, of respect, the the ultimate figure of respect for this country, and this is uh, what we are doing to us. Uh, uh, one of the first, uh, uh, well, uh, when, when, when the annexation of Crimea happened, there was a lot of debate in Germany and there were uh, obviously a lot of people who said, oh yeah, Crimea was always Russian, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, our former chancellor, uh, Helmut Schmidt, came. And he was already 90-something, an elder statesman, uh, but a very respected uh, uh, figure and not, uh, you know, noticed in being uh, 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 not uh, on the top of his. And he said in an interview, oh, you know, Ukraine is even not a nation. Uh, to hear something like that from a former Wehrmacht officer is a, is a really big thing. But it was not Russian propaganda. Russian propaganda fills gaps. And this is not the, the responsibility, you know, of a civil society or of whoever to, uh, to debunk it, to, uh, to confront it. We do what we can. We do it uh, in the media. We do it as, uh, you know, independent actors. We do it as parts of, uh, you know, research programs and civil society organizations. But what we actually need is a combined effort of uh, states, of governments, governmental, uh, uh, um, governmental actions in Germany uh, or in other Western countries against, well, let, let's call it bullshit, against bullshit. But we also need massive uh, Ukrainian information campaigns because, uh, you know, nobody else can do this.
We'll uh, come to that in a minute, because this is a very interesting idea, how Ukraine, which is on the front line, I almost think of it like, uh, you know, if, if you're talking about a, um, almost a biological sense, an immune system against disinformation, Ukraine is like the, the bats in the cave, you know, you need a fearsome uh, immune system because the, uh, it's so much more of a toxic atmosphere in terms of the virology of it. We'll come to that one in a minute, because I think that's interesting. But to touch on the idea of lies, there are gradations of lies, aren't there? I mean, propaganda will often deal with the sort of the small, sometimes seemingly insignificant lie, but sometimes it'll tell the big lie in almost, you know, I, I dare not almost mention the name here, but Goebbels, the bigger the lie, the more convincingly you tell it, the more passion you put into it, that lie is going to succeed. And you mentioned the one there, that Ukraine is not a nation. I mean, that is a lie so monstrous and so big and so clearly challenged by reality. And yet we see these big monstrous lies go unchallenged. Hmm. So I've stunned the audience into yeah, silence uh, with that I, one. I, I, I don't know if the word lie is, uh, is, is correct here. It's, it's, it's framing. You can... Uh, tell lots of lies about Ukraine, sure, and big lies, they actually don't last. But the framing stays, and this is way more di uh, difficult to, you know, resist the framing and break the framing than to debunk, uh, debunk certain lies. Uh, Let's turn to Ukrainian media, because that's a question that's been asked uh, by a member of the audience. What should we be learning from the Ukrainian media uh, in the process of tackling disinformation. And of course, Ukraine is, and the Ukrainian population is subject to a huge barrage of, of this disinformation and propaganda that has been for a considerable period of time. So what have they learned? What do they do well? What do they not do so well? Uh, so I would say that uh, one of the most unifying factors, uh, I mean, in terms of unification of our people, uh, and uh, making them less susceptible to the, to the Russian propaganda was the Russian invasion, unfortunately. Because uh, before it happened, uh, even though uh, we had war since 2014, but uh, we had plenty of pro-Russian movements, we had plenty of different uh, parties and political movements opposing each other, uh, and uh, we could never have uh, any sort of unity, you know. Uh, which on one hand it's, it's a normal thing, but on the other hand, uh, personally, I was afraid that uh, eventually, you know, Ukraine will completely lost any, uh, will, will completely lose any uh, sort of uh, like same direction and uh, we would just end up having a civil war. Uh, but uh, after the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, uh, people united and uh, Apparently, some kind of shocking event like this, uh, the threat of physical death uh, of you or your kids, uh, I think it played a huge role. Um, but, uh, of course, we, we nowadays we have huge uh, experience in uh, fighting Russian propaganda. We are fighting it on the state level using the center of uh, countering the uh, misinformation, right? Uh, it's a department within the, the Council for Security and Defense of Ukraine. Uh, we have also a lot of, uh, again, because people in Ukraine uh, so much like to self-organize, uh, we have plenty of uh, voluntary organizations and NGOs that uh, do fact-checking, that do um, f f myth debunking and things like that. And those people are partisans in this information war, but we need armies, we need state actors. Absolutely. Like, I, I completely agree with Nikolai because uh, we have to have some kind of legal solution of fighting the Russian, uh, not only Russian, also Chinese, Iranian propaganda, on the state level, uh, on the level of governments and all, on the level of international governments like the EU, because uh, we have to develop uh, a mechanism of uh, countering propaganda aimed at destroying democracies be before it's too late. 
because it's basically already uh, late. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, uh, as far as, uh, as the military is concerned, everybody understands that uh, you know the resources have to be comparable. You can't you know fight uh, uh, with handguns uh, against uh, cruise missiles, and you have to. Sp and a comparable amount of resources and a comparable amount of money. Uh, on the other hand, and everybody agrees that we have uh, uh, um, to do with the information warfare, but we don't uh, spend almost any resources on that. This is, well, Russia spends billions uh, on propaganda, disinformation and whatever, and this uh, this is built into, you know, entertainment products. Uh, you, you don't recognize it uh, uh, as propaganda uh, um, on the first sight. You, 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 you get infected through, you know, popular uh, songs and uh, uh, TV entertainment and whatever. And... Um, uh, and on, on the European side, we have like millions, hmm. seriously, and um, and when, and we don't. I, 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 in in my humble opinion, we don't have to think uh, in terms of propaganda. We uh, we have to uh, we have to do information campaigns. We have to promote and endorse our uh, uh, vision of things of the world, uh, our framing uh, of certain um, things, uh, political events of history or whatever. And this requires money. We have to, uh, uh, you know, we need more uh, Ukrainian literature being translated and promoted. Uh, uh, and we need, you know, grants for this. Let's turn to, to uh, uh, something which is a difficult and possibly unpopular topic as well. Um, Ukraine wasn't necessarily brilliant at tackling Russian disinformation for the first eight years of the war. In fact, in the East, mm -hmm. uh, quite slow to respond and realize that the challenge and threat from it. Um, but when the full scale war came, they made a concerted effort to um, exclude oligarchs from media ownership and involvement. Whereas if you compare that to the West, you've got one of the world's largest communication platforms, um, Twitter, or X as it's been disastrously branded, owned by an oligarch with commercial interests, with relationships with so-called powers which are part of the autocratic um, alliance of evil or whatever, clear you know, connections with China, etc., and requirement and resources from that country uh, for his industries and wealth. Um, who is openly amplifying and spouting Kremlin narratives. So one of the problems must be that we have no appetite to tackle that elephant in the room, which is oligarch involvement in means of mass communication. Sorry, big challenging topic there. Uh, Independent media is something that we all need, of course. Uh, maybe uh, we should uh, again, develop some kind of legal mechanism to make people owning channels, uh, owning media responsible for spreading misinformation. Because currently, as far as I remember, uh, Twitter is a leading platform in terms of uh, amount of fake accounts uh, that are used to spread all kinds of narratives, uh, including Russian narratives. So probably we have to have some kind of uh, the solution on Twitter. There is this thing when, uh, for example, when you make a publication, there's uh, community notes that can say, "Dude, you're wrong because you know th this is not true." And uh, people who find it useful, they can agree and, and promote those community notes. It, they work, and maybe uh, we can find uh, we, we can have something like that uh, in other media as well. Uh, so people would understand that uh, they are they're legit, okay? But how it's gonna work, this is what we should think about because uh, fighting misinformation is not just fighting lies. It's uh, fighting, it, it's participating in the hybrid warfare and people must realize that, yeah, yeah. Th that uh, 
inform that propaganda and misinformation is a combat weapon because uh, hybrid warfare has uh, a clear combat goals, ge geopolitical, strategical goals that, uh, for example, Putin wants to reach. And uh, that's why they must understand that uh, propaganda coming from Russia is a combat weapon that kills. Uh, and uh, apparently, uh, you know, we will come to this understanding somehow that uh, we need to have governments involved into this because Russian propaganda is uh, promoted and pushed by the state, right? It's, it's a state apparatus. So maybe we should also uh, define some kind of uh, measures by other states and governments to counter this. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, in the Cold War, they have, we, uh, well, the West started institutions like you know, Voice of America, Radio Liberty, and they were adequate to, to the situation because... BBC World Service again, I know a lot of yeah, people BBC listen World to that Service, the Iron Exactly. Yeah. Now they are uh, dinosaurs. Uh, they may be good media, maybe less good media, but they are dinosaurs. We can't combat uh, this confusion just with some resource telling uh, telling the truth. It doesn't work like this. Uh, it, uh, going back to the Russian opposition, they had this great delusion, you know, that uh, you tell the people the truth and the uh, regime falls. Nothing like that happened. So um, we need resources and they, they, they have to be state resources. And we're back to fighting a regime which is murderous, but which also relies on uh, an informational ecosystem. So I think the, the example of NAFO is a good one. A lot of NAFO people who, uh, and for those who don't know that, that's a sort of digital collective, a chaotic digital collective online that seeks to find Russian bullshit and, and basically dump on it with humor and memes and so on. Um, and it's easy to get disheartened thinking that, that, you know, we're not having much of an effect. But one of the recommendations of what, what my guests have recommended is that even one guy who's in Moscow doing this, taking, taking a risk, he said that the, when he gets depressed, the, the only thing that helps is to take action, not to sit there and pick at your scabs and get depressed. Taking some form of action is the, the best uh, salve for that and the best thing you can do to fight disinformation. So this is kind of an interesting thing because you may be sitting on your sofa, screaming at, the, at your computer screen, typing in, you know, MAGA, blah, 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 or libtards or whatever. You may be sort of screaming at the opposition, thinking you're doing something to counter propaganda. All you're doing is adding to propaganda's intent, which is to get you all to scream at each other and not find common ground and unite. So I'd love to hear your, your views on that one. Uh I would say this, 100% uh, uh, if you're actively involved into something, it, it helps you big time against depression and, and uh, demotivation. But, uh, you know, we started talking about uh, losing informational warfare. Uh, I would also like uh, to say uh, an opposite thing. People in the West, which were the reason I created my channel on YouTube, uh, they impressed me so much uh, with their decency and their support to Ukraine. Because, you know, globally people have to train to become good people, right? We're, we're all born selfish and evil. It's a truth. Right. When you look at the kids playing in, in, in the, you know, uh, the kids playground and they beat each other like they want to steal the toys and, and you know, yeah, this is what we are from the beginning. But we have to learn how to be better people and uh, people on the West, uh, they they surprised me with this, uh, th that they're friendly, they're open, they uh, have sympathy towards Ukrainians, they feel our pain, that's why they want to help. Uh, and uh, Russian propaganda is uh, directed uh, 
the, it is directed on those people, but to the less uh, smaller extent. Uh, but uh, still, its task is to make the number of people that are basically they didn't learn anything bigger and and more influential than them. But uh, the positive note of uh, you know today's program would be this: uh, people we were wrong about people on the West. They are fantastic and decent and open. And uh, the reason why they will win and why we will win against the Russian terrorism is because uh, they are more active. They can fight for their ideas, while uh, people who support Russian terrorism, they are driven by feelings like hate, laziness and greed. And despair. Well, yeah, despair works too. Nikolai, yeah, uh, this is all very optimistic. Yeah, I uh, um, I have my you know statistic ideas, um, and I think um, yeah, all this is very uh, very important as a volunteer movement is very important, and what is makes up what makes up a society, what makes Ukraine Ukraine is this uh, great amount of solidarity and the involvement of you know uh, very many people from very different walks of life into uh, a direct war effort in in very many different ways but this is the army that fights the war uh, and one without the charter that doesn't make uh, very much sense and this is what we need uh, on the information uh, battlefield, uh, we need uh, state powers, uh, democracies, uh, to take action. And this is where the volunteers and partisans uh, would play a crucial role. The state doesn't have to do everything, but it has to create the framework. We uh, you can't block Russian resources, uh, the government can. You can't arrest, uh, you know, uh, bank accounts, the government can. You can't uh, go after people who spread malicious uh, uh, narratives, the government can. But you can detect these people, you can uh, debunk uh, lies, you can uh, you, you can do what you what you do in a brilliant fashion, but <laughs> you you can't you, you can't do the government's job. Yeah. Uh, oh. and, and, and and one of our uh, tasks as a you know as citizens as a civil society as uh, academia as whoever as independent. Uh, actors is to uh, uh, to direct demands. We have to formulate them. We, just, we, we can't just sit and expect some uh, clever guy at the top to figure out what what is best. We, but we have to communicate this. Right? Yeah, please do this and that. Well, this is going to be the last question because I think we're almost out of time. And I'll, I'll start with you, Nikolai, and then we'll have um, operators to ask you sort of close with the final comment on this. And. Let's get to the point where Ukraine is victorious. How important is it for us to learn these lessons on information warfare as it currently exists, but also carry on innovating? Because even when Ukraine is victorious, the informational attack is definitely not going to end. It's not going to stop evolving. The intensity is not going to reduce. It may even increase. So how important is it for us to carry on innovating, learning, sharing, and as you say, perhaps working with government more closely to tackle. Yeah, we have identified actually the threat, and we have to uh, we have to act accordingly. And as we know, the uh, well, what what does it really mean uh, uh, when or if Ukra Ukraine is victorious? When the, all the territories are liberated, uh, it's not necessarily the end. Uh, yeah, they can shell uh, liberated territories or do any uh, uh, any other uh, bad stuff. So we have to uh, confront all the threats, uh, um, including information threats. Th th that's it. And we, we have to invest like really a lot of resources because it's not only the threat that's uh, coming from Russia. This is the uh, internal threats and this is what actually and 
fundamentally endangers uh, liberal democracy, the good old <laughs> liberal democracy. I completely agree and uh, I can only say that uh, I believe that this uh, mechanism should be implemented uh, not only on the level of governments but above the level of governments, uh, on the level of, for example, United Nations, because uh, there will always be cases of propaganda coming from uh, different uh, parties, governments themselves, so we have to have control over our governments as, you know, as democratic and free people. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, rivalry is not bad, generally but uh, rivalry should exist in the form of friendly competition anywhere in, in business in life in political uh, you know uh, clashes it must exist as friendly competition it should not uh, be threat to your uh, life to your freedoms uh, which exactly what russia wants and uh, we should always remember that well, this has been a fantastic panel. I'm very grateful to my two guests here and to everybody that's taken part in this marathon session. Please do, before you check out, uh, make sure you scan the QR code, copy the link for donations. We don't want to just make this a day about information. We want people to take action and support Ukrainian victory by donating to help the armed forces. As Nikolai says, there's no point in fighting information unless you also fight the military battle and ensure the army is equipped and can fight back against Russian aggression that is happening every hour of every day in Ukraine. But thank you for staying with Ukraine. Thank you for staying with these issues. And we hope you carry on following all the channels of the people who have participated today.